Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on uh, where in the world you are joining us from. Um, I have uh, a room in front of me um, filled with people, which is an oddity in this, uh, this day and age. Um, so this conference, the fourth uh, iteration of uh, the Norms Conference, is uh, a hybrid conference. We have people here, we have speakers here, we have people online, uh, speakers online as well. Um, my name is Dennis Pruders. I am a professor of global security and technology at Leiden University here at the Institute of uh, Security and Global Affairs. Um, and we'll have our fourth uh, uh, conference, annual conference, governing uh, through crisis, um, conflict, crisis, and the politics of cyberspace. We're going to kick off with um, um, uh, a, a keynote by uh, Frédéric Douzet, who is here with us uh, today. But first, I will uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the Hague program. Um, so, for those who you are not here, this is what you're missing out on. This is a bird's eye view, um, not November weather, I'm afraid, but of, uh, of the Hague. Um, you can see our office in the, in the right-hand corner. Um, a little bit about the program. So the Hague program for uh, cyber norms was set up um, in uh, 2017 in cooperation and funded by uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs after um, the conference, uh, uh, the Global Conference for Cyberspace in 2015. That's the London process. Um, it's hosted by Leiden University at the campus here at, uh, uh, in The Hague. And the program runs till the end of uh, 2021. So if you're uh, paying attention, that means this is the last norms conference in its current form and iteration. Um, so why The Hague? Why did we land here? Um, well, one reason, this is the seat uh, of government for the Dutch government. Um, uh, another reason is that for Leiden University, they have one faculty here, the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs, which sort of amasses most of their uh, work, not all of it, but most of their work that deals with government processes, international organizations, and things like that. Um, also, The Hague is, is a UN town, huh? so the International Court of Justice is here, International Criminal Court, the former Yugoslavian courts were here, um, Europol is here, Eurojust is here, so we have a lot of uh, international organizations right here in our midst. Um, and if you go a little further back, then you come to The Hague Conventions of 1899, 1907, which were some of the first uh, conventions that try to, um, you know, sort of formal statements on the laws of war, on how states should behave in conflict, even uh, uh, thinking of banning certain uh, weapons and in that sort of regulating state behavior. Um, maybe also a little bit about the building we're in, because, and this is mostly them for the people here in, in the room, but it's an interesting story nonetheless. So we are uh, hosted by Bild en Geluid, which translates into sound and vision. Um, and it's a museum uh, about communication, basically, uh, uh, connected to a larger museum in Hilversum, which is the, con uh, the, the city in the Netherlands where public broadcasting is coming from. So that's where the host organization is. But it's mostly a museum about communication. And it was interesting because when Corian and I uh, went here to talk about whether we could have a conference here, um, um, we took a while for us to realize how appropriate this venue was. Because we're so organizing things about cyber conflict and about diplomacy, about and the governance and all these things that we almost sort of failed to realize that communication is actually at the heart of what the internet is. And it took us a while to realize this. Um, and if you go a little deeper into the palimpsest of this building, it becomes uh, also more interesting, because this is the building we're in. And in 1843, it was founded as the Grote Koninklijke Bazaar, so the, 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 the Bazaar Royale. And it was an interesting place, because it was a commercial place. It was a place where you could find and buy things, um, mostly about uh, exotic places, mostly about Asia. So this is where it came from. It was very much in fashion. Uh, the, the, the Dutch king was a, was a, was a loyal customer uh, of this place. Um, and over the years, this place sort of developed into a place where you could find exotic things, where you could find oddities, where you could find rarities, um, a place to meet, a place to hang out. Um, and in a sense, this place was a window on the world, right? It was a place where you could see things, you could find things, learn about lifestyles, uh, about places that you were not actually that likely to visit yourself. 
Um, and that sounds a lot like the internet to me as well, right? The internet is a window on the world. It's a way of seeing the world, uh, maybe knowing something about places that you uh, uh, wouldn't normally know or see about. Um, it has a lot of information, it has oddities, it has rarities, and it has commerce. So all of that was also in this building. Um, I'm also sure that the bazaar in the 1800s probably contained a lot of misinformation about the world. Um, I'm pretty sure the Beaumont, the hangout here, so there were lots of diplomats around, so we got them covered too. And the 19th century wasn't exactly devoid of conflict, so I think that brings us neatly back to uh, our uh, conference here. So this was the Salon Japonais, and everything was for sale. Um, a little bit about the program. So the program, the Hague Program for Cyber Norms, um, two main branches, so academic research and what I would call sort of more uh, think tank uh, kind of activities, reaching out to different communities than just the academic community, and also a visiting fellowships program, which obviously has been um, hit pretty hard uh, during COVID, but a little bit more about that. Um, so academic research. So this conference that we do, so the fourth uh, version of it, is what we call our academic flagship, right? So this is the conference where we bring people from the academic community together, um, exchange ideas. Um, we're very proud that in, in mostly every year that we do this, we get more abstracts. The quality of the abstracts goes up. Um, it's a joy and a privilege uh, to read through it and select uh, the best uh, for, this, uh, for this conference. So we're very pleased with the quality. We're very pleased with the program. We think it looks great. Um, we're also very proud that we managed to have a conference that mixes established scholars and more junior scholars. Um, and we keep, as we like to say, a lot of air in the program, so there's actually uh, enough time in between uh, the panel sessions to meet, uh, mingle, and uh, uh, question each other. Um, obviously, we also have our own research team, and what does an academic research team do? Well, they write papers. They write papers, they write books, they edit books, so a few examples here. This, this is what we do, this is our, our contribution. Uh, to, uh, to the field. Um, we also do um, yeah, what I call the think tank function. So we want to be a program that doesn't just talk to the academic community. We also want to reach out to broader communities, the policy community. Uh, we want to connect with the technical community. We want to connect with the NGOs. We want to connect with the think tank world. Um, so that means uh, a lot of to and fro It means bringing people over here to talk to us going over there uh, to talk to them, uh, do keynotes and talk. Um, this is what we do, and a lot of us have been doing it, and I think this is what it looked like um, in the last year and a half for most people, right? So we have been looking at each other through tiny boxes on tiny screens, um, trying to find uh, 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 the value in, in this online environment that we were now sort of condoned to, that we had to, uh, and we figured it out to a certain extent. But also, this is my third or fourth live event. You can see the change in people when they are in a room together and able to exchange views uh, in a different way. So I think for us and for most people, um, the challenge is to take from this experience what is good. Uh, so, for example, this conference is open to the world. Um, that is a nice thing. So people who would not be able to travel here can uh, listen in and, 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 and do this. On the other hand, the in-person contact is uh, quite vital, as we have seen. Um, well, you can't run a team. Uh, so you can't run a program without a team. So this is, uh, this is our team, our A-team. Um, um, a lot of these people you will see uh, in the coming days uh, chairing panels, um, uh, helping out, uh, asking uh, difficult questions uh, and the like. Um, so we're very, uh, we're very proud of, of this team. Uh, I think we have achieved quite a bit in the, in the last years and we're hoping uh, to do a lot more in the future. Um, like I said, we have a visiting fellowship program. Um, well, we have a visiting fellowship program in name at the moment. So uh, uh, some of these people you see on this slide, um, they're fellows, but they haven't actually been visiting uh, in the sense that they've been in the building, which is the idea, right? So the idea is to get people over for a shorter or longer period, so somewhere between uh, one week to, uh, to a month, engage with the team, um, uh, do research together, um, uh, talk through what they're working on, and usually uh, they reward us with uh, organizing something like a seminar or a public lecture so we can sort of spread uh, what they're doing. 
Um, that hasn't happened, obviously, in the last year and a half. I mean, um, we may have been able to fly some people over, but an empty building is not really where you want to be if you're a visiting fellow. Um, so we're hoping to restart this, but given COVID situation and the way it's developing, um, we were hoping for January 2022. If that's going to happen, it's, it's up to anyone's guess, I guess. Um, Thankfully, uh, like everyone else, uh, we moved online in, in full force. So if you want to know more about what it is we're doing, who's involved and what kind of things we do, um, what we publish, um, you can visit us on, on the website. If you think that's too much of a bother, you can also follow us on Twitter and then you'll get it all uh, in your timeline or you can subscribe to the newsletter and then you'll get everything uh, you want uh, um, uh, in one go. Um, like I said, we've, like everyone else, we've been experimenting uh, in the last year and a half with sort of moving online, doing things online. Some of them were very good um, and, and we couldn't have done live, I think. Uh, certain people will convene for an online uh, meeting but not for uh, an in-life meeting. Um, that's the other side. Um, a lot of that work uh, is still uh, visible on, uh, on YouTube. You can look at there. And we also have some podcasts uh, on the normal channels. So like I said, um, the Hague program for cyber norms, we had a run of, uh, of five years, and it now ends in 2021. So this is the last uh, cyber norms conference in this uh, version. Um, but there is always tomorrow, right? So. Um, we're revamping, so we've been talking uh, with uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, and uh, we've been talking and saying, okay, listen, um, uh, we think there is more work to be done. Um, we also think we need a slightly different uh, umbrella term for it. So um, starting January 2022, uh, we'll be continuing our work as the Hague Program on International Cybersecurity, a slightly wider uh, uh, umbrella uh, for, uh, for, uh, for our activities, and we're obviously very pleased uh, with that. Um, the new program will focus uh, more on sort of cyber conflict below the threshold, uh, so in the zone uh, below uh, actual war, um, and have a focus also on, uh, on emerging technologies. That's uh, something uh, we're interested in, in uh, taking it more. And the approach will be not unlike what we do now. We'll be looking at governance structures around these kind of issues, right? So what does it mean in terms for international law, in terms for norms, uh, international governance, but also what will it mean in terms of actual state behavior? Because if we can't figure it out in words, then uh, uh, the actions of states and other actors will in the end become the established norms of what it is we're doing. Um, we have a number of themes that we're uh, going to be uh, focusing on, sort of sub-themes below this. We're going to look more at uh, hybrid conflicts. So what is the relationship between state actors and non-state actors? Um, what is the relationship between military and cyber operations? How does that uh, uh, fall about? Um, we're going to be talking about uh, emerging technologies and how they impact on uh, cyber conflict. So new technology like machine learning, like uh, quantum computing, uh, automation in, in, uh, in attacks or detection or other systems. What does that do with the way we look at conflict? Um, and also the interaction between the development of technology and technology as a, as a risk factor for, uh, for states. Yeah? So most states are quite keen to develop capacity for themselves but are much less enthusiastic when they see capacity evolving in, uh, in states uh, neighboring them or a little further away. So what does that do? And the last point is sort of the global competition, the geopolitics part of it, and techno-nationalism. And so that's another uh, area that we're looking into, and that's already a nice segue to, uh, to Frédéric Douzet's uh, uh, lecture in, uh, in a bit. Um, so I think we have our work cut out for us. Um, uh, watch this space. Uh, there will be more to come on this. Um, tonight also um, uh, at dinner at 9.30, so we're having drinks from 7 onwards. Um, at 7.30, sorry, I said 9.30. At 7.30, um, uh, Natalie Jaarsma, the Dutch ambassador at large uh, for cyber and technology, uh, cyber and security, um, will be uh, uh, coming, joining us for, uh, for a bit and uh, have an informal talk about uh, what it is they're doing um, at this moment. So that will be a good opportunity to uh, sort of mix and mingle with the foreign policy community here as well. Um, so back to the conference itself. So this is the theme, so governing uh, through crisis. 
Um, as we do every year, we take a broad theme, we make a really broad umbrella to make sure that we can fit different things under it. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously we were also touched by, by the COVID-19 crisis, but also in the sense of what many people have seen and what many people have wondered is, so in response to this crisis, we moved a lot of things online. Um, that by and large was quite successful, but it also revealed new vulnerabilities. It revealed new, uh, a new attack surface for um, a malicious actors, basically. We saw how vulnerable healthcare sector is, for example. Patents uh, were interesting. Misinformation was, was a thing that played a large role and still is playing a large role in many, many societies in trying to battle this crisis. Uh, so the WHO even talks about uh, a pandemic and an infodemic um, in terms of how do we deal with a crisis like this. Um, the basic idea that we have behind this is that um, the crisis sort of kicks governments and other actors into gear because they have to deal with the crisis, they have to build resilience, they have to make sure that they can uh, move forward uh, in light of what's going on. But there's also another side to it, right? And the other side is that for some actors, crisis is actually a governance mechanism in its own. Uh, misinformation is a problem for us that we need to solve. For others, it's actually a policy tool. So that's a double thing. Uh, so you, you all know uh, the expression, uh, never waste a good crisis. Uh, there is a malicious angle to that and there is a benign angle to that. So that's, that's the broad umbrella that we want to take for, uh, for, this, uh, for this opening. Um, we have three keynotes in the coming three days. Um, we're very happy to have uh, two of them here. So Frederik is here, John is here, and Herb Lynn will be joining us on uh, Thursday uh, uh, online. So he'll be joining us um, early in the morning because he is uh, uh, all the way on the, um, uh, on the East Coast. Um, West Coast, East Coast. Well, anyway, um, West, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, Frederik will be uh, speaking uh, after I finally stop talking. Um, is joining us from uh, Geode uh, at uh, Paris 8. Uh, John is joining us from uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, he's just recently moved from Toronto to Georgia Tech. And Herb will be joining us from, um, uh, from uh, Stanford University. Um, and interesting because John is our closing session, but he has uh, put it even in the title that he aims to be provocative. So we'll be uh, provoked and then we'll go into drinks. So I think drinks on uh, Thursday afternoon is going to be an interesting affair because Herb unfortunately won't be here to um, defend his uh, provocations. Um, we're really proud to have these speakers. Um, we're really happy um, to, to kick off this way. Um, um, and it is really the combination of keynotes and the panel sessions that make this conference into what it is. Um, uh, I, for the life of me, would not like to choose between them. Uh, they're both integral uh, to, to what we do, and uh, they both make for uh, uh, usually a very entertaining three days. Um, so this is the program for today. Uh, Frederik will be speaking. Uh, we'll have two panels today, one on uh, international law and cyberspace and the other one on great power perspectives. So we'll have uh, 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 power and uh, the efforts to constrain power. And we'll start with constraining. So I don't know what that says about us, but. Um, Q&A, important. So um, obviously, uh, well, some people may have uh, forgotten by now, but if you're in the room, you can raise your hand. You don't have to push a button to do that. You can just raise your hand and then we'll acknowledge you and um, um, send someone in with a microphone uh, for you to uh, ask your question. Um, um, for the people online, if you have a question, um, um, there is a, a Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. You can submit them there. Um, they will be taken off there and uh, be sent to me uh, uh, through, uh, 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 through a Google Word doc so I can see them and I can read them out here for you. Um, please mention your name and affiliation. We will not be taking anonymous questions. We would like to know who you are within reason. Um, we will not send any cookies after you, but we need to know uh, who is asking this question. Um, also, uh, one of the most useful definitions I ever heard um, for the online that will be probably easiest, but is the definition of a question. The, a question is a short sentence ending in a question mark. Um, and a lot of people, especially academics, have a lot of trouble with that. They think a question is an expose. Um, it's not. Um, so please try to confine yourself a little bit in terms of uh, give the context to your question, but uh, make sure you keep it uh, short and sweet. 
Um, Yes, so if you are uh, uh, inclined to use uh, social media, if you uh, want to, you can follow us on Twitter. If you want to um, sort of uh, spread the word about what it is we're doing here, if you see uh, a beautiful insight coming from one of the presentations and you would like to share it with the world, uh, please do so, and that's not a problem. Um, and if you do so, please use uh, the hashtag CyberNorms2021. Okay, on to our first speaker. Um, our first speaker today is uh, Frédéric Douzet. Frédéric is Professor of Geopolitics at the French Institute of Geopolitics at uh, uh, Paris 8 University. Um, she is also a director of GEOD, and GEOD is uh, uh, a research and training center centering on the geopolitics of the data sphere, uh, focusing on mostly humanities and social sciences, very well networked in France with different institutions, so different uh, uh, researchers and institutions contribute and collaborate with uh, the research they do there. Um, Jode has also been selected as a center of excellence for international relations and strategy label by the French Ministry of the Army, so if you are wondering whether this is in any way connected to uh, the real world of policy and conflict, then there's your answer. Um, I can read out her whole CV. I think that's probably not the best way to go. I think we should uh, probably listen to what she has to say. She has a, a contribution for us talking about the shrinking of cyberspace, a blind spot for uh, cyber policy, focusing on sort of the deeper layers of the internet architecture, mostly on routing and the vulnerabilities we have there. And she's located two places to look for um, uh, changes uh, or manipulation of uh, the deeper architecture, one coming from states and one coming from, uh, from companies, um, laying bare a larger problem um, laying bare a larger problem for uh, uh, cybersecurity and internet governance. Frédéric, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you so much, Dennis, and thank you very much for your invitation. I'm really thrilled to be here and to be uh, speaking for this great conference. So. Talking about crisis, um, on October 4, uh, Facebook and all its uh, WhatsApp and Instagram uh, applications completely disappeared from the internet for several hours. And we found out that the cause was a faulty configuration of the data routing system. And basically what happened is that this faulty configuration completely erased all the routes to access um, the company servers and all the routes between the company servers as well. So it completely deprived the billion of users, uh, but also all the company's employees um, access to their digital uh, services, like all the digital services, including uh, the locks to the rooms. This incident, I think, um, illustrates one of the least discuss cybersecurity flows in the dialogues about the stability and security of cyberspace, which is the contraction of cyberspace. And if we look at the history of all networks, whether it's computer networks, but also transportations, migrations, it shows that they go through phases of contraction, and, um, but also decentralization. And decentralization has allowed uh, networks to grow very rapidly and to develop and expand, but they can lead to a form of fragmentation, whereas concentration can allow rationalization, um, cost efficiency, optimization. And of course, the internet has followed this trend, and it went through several phases of decentralization to a lower rapid growth, but also concentration at different levels of analysis. Now, of course, one of the constant feature of the internet is that it changes constantly and very rapidly. It's a very dynamic environment. But what's interesting is it also changes because of geopolitical conflict and crisis. So I think it's interesting to, in the context of this conference, to deal with this subject. And what we observe today is a double trend, a combination of both these trends. On the one hand, uh, we observe um, at, oops, sorry. Um, at the level of, um, we, we observe a, a dynamic of fragmentation along national borders, very often at the initiative of some states in the name of national security. 
And these states, they seek to restore control over their borders, digital borders, or, or what they perceive as what should be their national cyberspace. And usually these initiatives aim to defend what they perceive as being their digital sovereignty, and they try to control the routes that data take. Um, because controlling these routes uh, can offer a number of strategic advantages, like the ability to selectively block traffic, to spy on traffic, or to divert traffic for different reasons. This form of fragmentation is often, often labeled balkanization of the internet and accused of undermining the free flow of data and also the resilience on, on the internet, of the internet. And this form of, this dynamic tends to focus mo much of the attention, of the political attention at least. However, if we change the level of analysis, and if we move to a higher level of abstraction, we observe another dynamic, and this time this dynamic is driven more by market forces, which is the concentration of data traffic around a few major players in data routing, um, meaning the main data routing operators, and also a few large platforms like Google, Facebook, Amazon. And this type of concentration is really largely invisible outside a community of technical experts, and it also leads to a form of fragmentation that is just as problematic in terms of free flow of data and resilience. And it also raises thorny issues of sovereignty. And of course, to add a layer of complexity, um, the fragmentation along national borders does not exclude concentration within national borders at the level of the domestic network uh, to allow greater government control. So today, I would like to address both these issues as part of our ongoing interdisciplinary research that we conduct at GIAD. Um, because I believe that they have potentially important cybersecurity implications, and because they are not much discussed, if at all, in cyber policy circles. But of course, there is a hidden agenda, uh, because we've already published a fair amount of research on the dynamic of uh, fragmentation along national borders, but not yet on the dynamic of contraction, and this is an area where I would like to go next. So if we want to look at the fragmentation of cyberspace, there's been a number of recent incidents that can attract attention. Uh, in November 2019, uh, in the wake of severely suppressed political demonstration against the regime, Iran has managed to cut off most of its traffic um, from and to the global internet. But while doing so, Iran managed to still fully operate its own domestic network. So it took about 24 hours for the regime to selectively block access to the outside internet to most users, but with a small portion of the traffic um, that was vital to its economy, such as banking data, that was still going through. And Iran's initiative is not isolated. On December 23rd, uh, 2019, Russia claimed to have successfully tested a countrywide alternative to the global internet. And basically, Russia claimed to have managed to unplug its domestic network from the internet. This experiment uh, fits right into the framework of its new law to create a sovereign internet, um, what is referred to usually as the RUNET, and that was enacted uh, the month before they actually run that test. And this new law uh, and project involves restricting the number of points at which Russia's domestic network connects to the rest of the internet. Um, therefore basically trying to do what Iran has been able to do. Uh, so clearly Russia has set a strategic goal to redesign its architecture of connectivity in order to be able, just like Iran, to better enforce control over data routing and therefore information. So our research shows uh, that the data routing protocol known as the border gateway protocol uh, and Overall, the architecture of connectivity can be manipulated in the context 
of crises or geopolitical tensions and rivalries for geopolitical control. And this is best illustrated by two cases that we have explored and I will present now, the case of Iran and the case of the Ukrainian crisis. Just a quick point about our methodology. I will not go into great details because you can read our publications. Um, but basically, you know that the internet is a network of network and um, it's made of autonomous systems, autonomous because they decide on their own internal routing policies, but also on um, the, the partnerships uh, that they contract with each other in order to get the data to go across uh, the internet. Uh, so this can be done through commercial agreements or through peering agreements. And the routers of the ASs communicate between themselves through the border gateway protocol to announce all the possible routes that the data transit can take um, according to these existing agreements uh, between them. Now, this information is not public. These agreements in most cases are not public. So what we do with our methodology is we infer them um, because these routers, they have to talk to each other at some point to announce these routes. So we capture these announces and we use that in order to guess uh, what are these partnerships and therefore to create graphs that would give us an idea of what are all the possible routes on the internet. So to do so, we have a BGP observatory that uh, generates a graph, um, instantaneous graph every minute of the entire internet in real time. So it has about uh, 90,000 nodes and over 200,000 links. Um, and um, we complete this data with other available data uh, like root views or RIPE uh, that aggregate BGP messages between ASs that cooperate. And we've done that over time, so we can actually go back in time in order to see the, um, the evolutions. And uh, we add to that the name of ASs, um, I mean, autonomous systems, the country where they've been registered, the number of IP address that they have announced um, once a connection appears in the routing tables, um, and other sources in order to complete this data. So we did um, this uh, for Iran. So that's a picture of the traffic in Iran going down. And interestingly, we had run um, the case of Iran two years a year before they did that, because as early as June um, 2018, our team had produced a graph demonstrating that the network in Iran was connected to the global internet by only three points of entry, um, and that they were all fully controlled by the government, thus enabling uh, the regime to selectively uh, control uh, censorship, international uh, to selectively censor uh, international traffic. And the main finding is we've, we um, guessed that Iran had found a way to build an architecture of connectivity and to leverage the border gateway protocol to reconcile a priori uh, conflicting strategic goals, like at the same time creating a self-sustaining and resilient domestic network, but with very tight control at its borders to enable the regime to leverage connectivity as a tool of censorship in the face of social instability. But also, um, they managed to turn it into a tool of regional influence in the context of strategic competition. So we first look on this slide uh, at the architecture of uh, Iran's uh, autonomous systems and the way they are connected to the rest of the world. And this figure offers a representation through a graph of all the autonomous systems in the Middle East and their direct neighbors, meaning the autonomous systems to which they are directly um, connected. So every node is an autonomous system, every link is a BGP agreement. And if you look at the Iranian network here, you can see um, that it's on the margin of the graph, uh, and that's because it's tightly limited number of connections with the rest of the graph. Um, this means that Iran is connected to a limited number of its neighbors, uh, and 
it's connected to um, major autonomous systems registered either in the United States or in, uh, in uh, Europe. And there is no direct link, for example, between Iran and Saudi uh, Arabia or Bahrain or other, um, uh, um, other autonomous systems of the, of the region. Um, the following slide, uh, we studied more precisely the autonomous system of Iran and how they were connected to international autonomous system. So this is a simplified representation of the architecture of connectivity in Iran. So it's, we selected the autonomous systems registered in Iran and their direct neighbors. And if we observe this graph here, so this is the part of Iranian uh, networks and these are the neighbors. And you can see through this graph that there are only three main autonomous systems that connect most of Iran's traffic to the rest of the world. Uh, and these different autonomous systems are all under the control of the government. It's the Information Technology Company, te Telecommunication Infrastructure Company, and Institute for Research in Fundamental Science that was the historical provider that brought internet to Iran in 1993. So we also observe a relative lack of direct connectivity between Iran and most of the neighboring countries. This is even more obvious when you look at this graph than with the previous graph. Uh, and no direct connection at all with Saudi Arabia, with Bahrain, or with Kuwait, which means that mostly to communicate, to, um, to interconnect with other countries of the Gulf, um, it transits through foreign intermediaries in most cases. We're actually updating this research, um, focusing right now on the Middle East, uh, and it's very interesting because when you do a graph with all the countries of the, of the Middle East, you uh, see that there are still very few points of connection uh, between, uh, between all of them. So the other finding about this graph is that the Iranian network is constructed, uh, I mean, its architecture looks like a tree, and you can identify a sort of trunk of highly interconnected government-owned uh, autonomous systems, three of them, which lead the path to foreign networks, and then branches uh, that are managed by private internet service providers. And while these branches are well connected to each other, they do not have a great um, diversity of path that links their traffic to the outside. Um, so they're very well connected between themselves, but they're not connected uh, to uh, the outside. If they want to go outside, they have to go through the trunk to reach the global internet. This results in a sort of uh, strategic bottleneck uh, between the Iranian internet and the rest of the internet. And the government-controlled autonomous systems play the role of gatekeepers that control access to foreign content and decide what traffic passes through um, str this strategic bottleneck. And that explains also why, despite uh, the blockade, the network continued to function because it's built like an intranet. Um, we have reasons to believe uh, that this was done purposely, uh, especially after the Stuxnet attack, um, also because Iran feared that foreign um, powers might try to cut its access uh, to the global internet. So the idea of having a resilient network that's able to function, even if it's cut off from the rest of the internet, um, that was the, uh, probably the incentive. And to verify that, we looked at the domestic network. So if you zoom into the Iranian ecosystem of autonomous system within the domestic network, um, you can test whether the domestic routes are also centralized to allow control or not. And what we found was rather counterintuitive because we observe instead that um, the um, domestic network uh, is not really centralized, and that the most central autonomous system in this network are almost evenly disseminated throughout the network. So it's not that centralized, and if you look at Respina, which is the most central one, it's connecting more of a hundred autonomous systems. 
And we also notice that the TIC, um, the TIC gate, which is the, one of the government controlled gatekeepers, is underrepresented within this network. So it means that in order to communicate with one another, uh, the autonomous systems within the Iranian networks, they don't have to go through the trunk. Um, so the, the network is relatively rich, and we found, and this is the graph here, um, that the number of autonomous systems has actually increased uh, since 2010 in Iran. So our assumption is that this was done purposely in order to increase the resilience of the domestic network by having more autonomous systems and having more pathways between these autonomous systems. We um, decided to complete this uh, metric. Um, oh yeah, uh, we also wanted to compare how uh, the, the interna internal and external connection of Iran compared to other countries of the region. And you can see that the number of internal connections in Iran is much higher uh, than other countries uh, that are less internally connected, which means that uh, the network is, um, is very rich. We completed this um, uh, analysis with uh, two scores uh, in order to analyze the complexity of the network. And we found that um, uh, with a score, a complexity on the right of the slide, it quantifies the difficulty to control the network within a country given the number of IP addresses and the diversity of their administrators in the country. So the higher the score is, the most difficult it is to control the network. Um, in countries where most of the IP addresses are managed by just a few autonomous systems, there is a limited number of paths and a limited number of operators. Therefore, the network has a low level of complexity and is much easier to control. But this, uh, the fact that it's easier to control and that there are less paths means also that there are greater points of vulnerabilities. The network is less resilient. So it's a question of trade-off, and analyzing this data allows us to understand what these trades off are. Um, and in countries where the high number and great diversity of autonomous systems, um, when there is a, a higher number and greater diversity of autonomous systems, you have many more paths and the network is harder to control, but it's much more resilient. This is the case of Iran, and what's interesting here is that Iran uh, actually uh, decided to maintain a high level of complexity for its network, as you can see in the first two columns, um, because it's the, the, the level of complexity is about stable uh, between 2011 and 2019. Uh, whereas in other countries that have made an effort to better control their network, you can see the level of complexity dropping, which is the case of Saudi Arabia, for example, or Oman. Uh, and, and others, uh, and you can see uh, that Iran has actually a higher level of complexity than other countries like Iran, for example, uh, like uh, Israel, for example. This is a direct correlation with the fact that um, uh, Iran has strongly increased its number of uh, autonomous systems since uh, 2010. So we have a second measure to complete this complexity score, uh, which is the points of control. They measure the centralization of the network, so they represent uh, the minimal number of autonomous systems required to connect 90% of all IP addresses of a country. Meaning that if you need only three ISs uh, to control 90% of all the IP addresses, it means that your network is very centralized because all the IP addresses connect to a few autonomous systems. Uh, so the higher the value, the more autonomous systems you need to connect most of IP addresses, the less centralized is the network. And the lower the value, uh, the easier it is to control the network. So if you look at Iran, you can see that the value, the control value has strongly increased uh, between 2011 and 2018. Uh, so the, the network 
is not centralized compared to other countries of the regions, and the complexity uh, score is maintained, whereas in other places it's reduced. Um, so if you compare to Saudi Arabia, for example, um, the control value is 34% for Iran, it's 10% for uh, Saudi Arabia. And if you look at um, uh, Turkey, Egypt, these networks are very centralized, which means that these networks are vulnerable to congestions, they are vulnerable to BGP incidents, or they are very vulnerable to cyber attacks against these points of vulnerability because if you take down a major autonomous system that concentrates a lot of the IP addresses, then you can bring most of the traffic down. In Iraq and Afghanistan, there is a, a low centralization, um, particularly due to the lack of central authority that controls the architecture of the national network. But Turkey and Israel have comparable levels of complexity, but the level of the control value is much lower than Iran, which means it's more centralized. So we um, conclude that in Iran, the, um, the network, the, the main concern is control at the border. Uh, the network is isolated uh, from the uh, global internet, but it's uh, rather resilient inside, and it can function independently from um, the global internet which is really, uh, we think, strategic thinking about, uh, about the network. But we see that in other countries, other choices have been made, both to control external borders, but also to re-centralize inside uh, in order to have better control, which creates huge vulnerabilities. We did another study um, on Ukraine in order to analyze uh, how in a context of crisis this time, BGP could be manipulated. And we did that in the context of a hot crisis uh, right after the 2014 Maiden Revolution, when Russian forces took control of the Crimean Peninsula and started to back separatist forces in eastern Ukraine. And we looked at Crimea and Donbass. Um, and in both cases, we saw that the Russian authorities uh, modified BGP routes in order to divert the local internet traffic from continental Ukraine, drawing a kind of digital front line that is quite consistent with the military one. And this resulted in the fragmentation of Ukraine's cyberspace, leading to the emergence of separate subspaces. And we observed mainly three tendencies, and I'll show you the graph. The first one is the breakup um, and progressive integration of Crimea into um, the Russian network. The second one is the marginalization of Donbass. And we'll see we have two different situations that really reflect uh, the geopolitical situations, um, whereas Crimea is fully separate. Donbass sort of sits in, in the middle still. And we see also the third trend is the gradual increase in the distance um, between the two countries like Russia and, and Ukraine. So these uh, trends can be, uh, I'm showing you the first uh, graph uh, representing all the um, autonomous systems of Ukraine and their direct neighbors. And you can see here, and I'll zoom in later, that Crimean AOCs and Donbass AOCs are now at the periphery of the Ukrainian network, whereas before they were fully integrated. Um, you can see a zoom here, and that's a representation before uh, the crisis where the Crimean here, autonomous systems were fully integrated. Here it's the Ukrainian uh, autonomous systems and the Russian autonomous systems. So before the crisis, they were fully integrated into um, the um, Ukrainian network, and now they're at the periphery. You can find um, the same um, Crimea.com uh, here, LCC, Carlcom here. So there are a number of factors, a combination of factors uh, that can explain that. Um, but what um, caught our attention 
is the declarations from the Russians with the prime minister who tweeted in March 2014 that data transit between Crimea and Moscow should not be provided by foreign countries. So there is a deliberate strategy of territorial appropriation of the Crimean cyberspace. So it's interesting because what happens in the physical world can also be implemented or reflected by uh, the lower layers of cyberspace, which means that by studying the lower layers of cyberspace, we can infer strategies from states that might not be visible at first sight. And the uh, Russians, so initially they tried to disconnect the cable to Ukraine, but then they found out, oops, this is much more complicated. So it took them three years to put in, pl in place a progressive strategy uh, in order to achieve the digital annexation of Crimea and the marginalization of Donbass. And this involved deploying two cables in 2014 and 2017, but also uh, buying up local uh, autonomous systems. And you see here um, the distribution over time of Crimea's ISIS by country of registration, and many of them become Russian, although they were um, Ukrainian uh, at first. So we have a change. Um, this was also a situation triggered by the fact that there were Ukrainian sanctions against company that uh, continued to provide internet connectivity to Crimea uh, after the annexation. So Ukraine somehow also encouraged that trend. And as a result, the Ukrainian network became increasingly centralized around three major actors here, here, and here um, that were uh, very close to Russian power. This fragmentation uh, finally is very well reflected by the antagonism between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and here we selected a few graphs, so it's only the autonomous systems of Ukraine and Russia and how they're connected with each other. And you see the evolution over time with the construction of the Russian cables uh, providing connectivity to uh, Crimea uh, and uh, at different times of the crisis. And it shows very clearly the relationship between the evolution of the topography and the topology of Crimea and the unfolding um, of um, geopolitical events. This um, is something we did um, to test our hypothesis and measuring the latencies and it really showed uh, that clearly um, the, um, the, the latencies and the time it took from one point to the other to go from Crimea to um, Moscow was shortened now and that Crimea had become in the zone of influence of Moscow because the latency um, is much lower uh, when um, to, to connect uh, Crimea to Moscow, whereas uh, if you take Kiev, uh, Crimea has completely disappeared from uh, the influence zone of, of Kiev. So that's for fragmentation along national borders as a result of state strategies to ensure greater power over the lower layers of cyberspace. But that's only part of the story, because the other part of the story is really uh, around uh, routing operators, and it's much more driven by market forces. And as you know, states are far from being the only ones in this space, which is, for most part, privately owned. The internet has been able to grow and to develop very quickly um, because of its decentralized nature. And within a decade, the number of autonomous systems has grown from like something like 40,000 to 120,000. Um, and so you have a much greater number of autonomous systems. But counter intuitively, at the same time, when you study um, BGP data, we observe that um, we have a concentration because only a small number of autonomous systems now play a central role in routing the data globally. So we have a lot of autonomous systems, but only a handful are really significant in conveying a traffic from one end of the globe to the other. 
uh, and the number of autonomous systems that control the majority of the traffic is falling. And that's something my team would very much like to investigate further and to try to measure with our methodologies. But what's also interesting is the hierarchy among these major autonomous systems, because I think it's indicative of important strategic dependencies. If you look at the list, uh, so that was done by CAIDA in San Diego, uh, and uh, it shows, it's a, it's a ranking uh, that they do. And of the 10 autonomous systems that connect the highest number of other autonomous systems, you can see that eight of them are American, and the first one connects nearly four, uh, 47,000 other autonomous systems. The tenth one goes down to 13,700. The first French one is 5,600. So you can see that you have really big major players uh, that connect to a huge number of other autonomous systems. And this dynamic leads to a concentration of path through a limited number of routing giants, and thus to the shrinking of the internet. And the strategic implications could be major. First, this situation creates important and often visible strategic dependencies, as I mentioned. Um, and these major routing players may indeed be led to take, either by themselves or under the pressure of a government, decisions that might hinder data flows. Um, it's quite conceivable, for example, that uh, in the context of an open geopolitical conflict or in the context of sanctions against a country, they could be led to block traffic to and from certain regional areas. And because of their technical capabilities and their economic and financial powers, these routing giants can also compete for power with some states. And again, their geographical distribution is extremely uneven and reveals major power imbalances in the digital space. Second, uh, the number of alternative data routes is decreasing. And yet, the internet was designed as a distributed network in which data can always bypass blockage or partial destruction of the network through alternative routes. So this calls potentially into question the very model of resilience of the internet, and it potentially raises important cyber, global cyber security issues. This phenomenon um, is increased by uh, the fact that large private platforms, such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, content delivery networks, these private platforms have emerged in the data routing landscape and each of them owns their own autonomous systems. And now they're pulling their own submarine cables and deploying their own intercontinental routing architecture. So increasingly, they tend to bypass the traditional large routing operators that I have mentioned, typically tier one and tier two autonomous systems. And this to some extent also fragments the network along commercial lines this time. I mean, you often have even identity control to access these uh, platforms, or at least registration. And it participates in what some specialists call the flattening of the internet. Because it's the same handful of private tech giants that dominate both the infrastructure of the internet, but also its most popular services and applications. In other words, these private platforms are gaining control over not only the content they deliver, but also over the means of delivering this content. And increasingly, they exchange traffic directly with each other and with tier two and tier three, meaning local internet service providers. So they're becoming their own internet backbone. And this new model, um, was mainly driven by the need for these platforms to di distribute huge flows of video traffic for the users, for example. So they 
expanded their network in order to bring content closer to the users uh, in order to be able to, develop, to deliver the videos without buffering, for example. This potentially bears important consequences that we are just starting to explore, and so I'm not going to be exhaustive at all, and I'm happy to get ideas on this. Um, these platforms, they first concentrate a very large portion of the traffic due to their massive number of users. And when an incident occur occurs, as it was the case with Facebook, then the entire traffic of their users' data is interrupted with major consequences on their activities. And we saw a lot of businesses suffering from the lack of access to Facebook for a few hours. By the way, this dynamic of concentration is also to be found in services uh, that are becoming increasingly critical, like the cloud. Um, typically, um, AWS is uh, now in a ultra dominant position. Um, and in Europe, we only have one major actor, which is OVH. Um, and if you want an illustration of the resilience issue, well, the um, fire in the single data center has uh, brought uh, over uh, three and a half million uh, servers down. Um, so that's the first thing. I mean, they concentrate a huge part of the traffic of their own users. The second is, these platforms are not initially intended to become central players in routing, meaning first and foremost, what they, they, the reason why they expand is to deliver their own content to uh, their users, uh, not to convey the rest of the traffic. Uh, and the fact that they bypass large routing operators means that they don't pay these operators for conveying their traffic, so that generates a loss of revenue for these major actors who still need to exist because they still need to convey the rest of the traffic. So it's a dissociation that we're seeing uh, as well with uh, telecom operators that have not made the move of providing content and are now struggling for investments to um, provide a good level of connectivity. It also leaves potentially smaller independent um, internet service providers unable to compete with larger ones who can peer with content delivery networks run by video providers and therefore provide better services like uh, speedy video access. So the risk here uh, could be to leave some areas with lower population density underserved. And it raises the question of how do we make the internet grow to reach people who are not yet uh, connected. This vertical integration uh, leads to a set of global monopolies in different areas, like whether it's social media, search engines, microblogging, and so on. And it could push out local internet service providers if the platforms decide to go all the way to the last mile of internet access, to go all the way to reach their own consumers. And there are clear signs um, that um, these evolutions uh, might be underway. For example, investments in submarine fiber cables, edge networks, cellular connectivity, Wi-Fi, giant balloons. If you take them separately, they might seem insignificant. But if you take them as a whole, they could indicate, for example, one of these major takes giant ambition to provide not only the internet infrastructure, but also access to this infrastructure. So what does this mean as a conclusion um, for the future of the internet? What does it mean for the security and the reliability of the internet? Are we losing its original model of resilience? Should we consider recentralizing cyberspace? How could we think through policy, industrial solutions to enhance the decentralization of the network? How can we envision a multipolarity beyond the issue of state control? How can we develop innovative technologies to help provide a greater multiplicity of data routes, storage, access, um, in order to increase the resilience, the security, the stability of cyberspace? Unfortunately, I don't have all the answers, but I think that this is a largely overlooked policy issue that deserves both attention and research, 
and definitely food for thought for your new program on international cybersecurity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I on? Yes, I'm on. Um, would you care to join? Yeah. Um, thank you. That was that was a great talk. I have uh, uh, many uh, many questions, but I'm uh, assuming I'm not the only one. Um, um, the online uh, audience seems to be uh, a little shyer than perhaps expected. I have one question from the online audience, so I'll start with that, then open up to the floor, and uh, uh, we'll see where that takes us. Um, I have a question from uh, Yinchu Chen from uh, Taiwan, who's asking how to explain the importance of the connectivity and data operability in the economic and national safety perspective, so not only from a human rights perspective. So, so what are the consequences of, of what you've been telling us if you look at it through a prism of national security or from a prism of uh, economic? So if you, if you look at it from the prism of national security, uh, you definitely have human rights issues uh, because uh, clearly one of the great motivations of the states that have been uh, developing strategies to control data routes is to be able to perform selective censorship. So that could uh, uh, allow, for example, uh, to prevent uh, people from accessing the global internet, accessing content, exchanging views uh, in a context of, uh, of crisis. Um, if you take it from the economic perspective, that's the area I think uh, we need to explore more closely. Uh, but the dynamic of concentration is changing the balance of powers, which means that you have a few giants uh, that will be dominating the market. And I guess it's like in all um, questions of um, monopolies uh, that you can find in other economic context is how do you uh, manage to let smaller innovative companies emerge? How do you provide for the less wealthy? Uh, how do you serve regions that are underpopulated, or I mean less populated, less rich and therefore generate less revenues, how do you make that a priority um, uh, for these? Um... Yeah. No, there's huge questions there, so I'm going to tack on one on okay. this. Um, a short question. Don't go too technical because no, no, technical no, it's, it's, stuff is but, not but here. <laughs> what you told me about sort of the concentration of sort of, sort of the big companies using, um, basically creating their own network, their own tier one network to favor their own traffic. I thought, well, that's a very smart way to sort of bypass the whole idea of net neutrality, right? Because you're not doing it on someone else's network, you're doing it on your own network, so who can tell you anything? But as you clearly say, there's a fallout, right? So that leads, so that's one question, is that what they're doing? And the other one tacked onto that is that we are, we often talk about the internet and the availability of the internet in terms of a global public good. That does not mean that it has to be publicly provided, but if companies fail or if the actions of companies hamper that idea of a global public good, then what? How do we, how do we respond? Yeah, um, well, I think that's, uh, that's right. Um, and. I think the intention, the, the, I mean, the main driver for these companies was to provide good quality access to their networks. But the fact that they have such a dominant position and hegemony uh, m means that sometimes, and, and that, I mean, I, uh, I, I would need to talk to them, but uh, there is, sometimes you have the feeling that they try to be the point of entry in the internet or have like, they become the internet for some regions um, because that's where... Sometimes that's fairly open, but yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so that has consequences. And how do you fight this? Well, uh, we're already in a situation where you have huge monopolies and they are very, very powerful. Uh, and I think that joins the whole... I mean, there are antitrust initiatives against Facebook right now. Um, Google sort of pretended to break out, whereas uh, it's not really clear that they did. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, how do you deconstruct these monopolies in order to make sure that there is access for everybody, or how do you constrain them to play a better role in uh, uh, rerouting uh, other traffic? We may get back to this. Um, I'm going to go to the, OK, I have one. So uh, Tanya Tropina first, and then Lena Rick. Uh, thank you very much for this absolutely fascinating presentation. I want to ask you um, 
about the about the construction of these giants, about the construction of these monopolies. Uh, do you think we can learn from previous debates uh, in telecom regulation? Because you know the split of bells in the U.S., the structural and functional separation of telecom operators in Europe. Do you think this might work on these giants, or do we have to invent an absolutely new approach? Because those separations were also about vertical integration, but rather on the telecommunications market. Would this um, idea somehow be applicable here, or we rather have to think um, in a different context, like not only economy and competition, but also national security and international security? So will, will the framework of telecom separation in the telecom market work here or not? Um. I think it's probably more complicated. Uh, I don't pretend to have the answer because I'm not a specialist of antitrust laws or initiatives, but I, I really see these big companies now as both competing with state powers and the public good and being the main partner. I mean, they do bring connectivity in places. They do bring essential services. They have become public utilities. So it's... It really is a trade-off, is how do you make sure that what we care about for the public good uh, happens, uh, uh, but you can't do that just against them. I think you need to do it with them, uh, and how to do it, I sincerely don't really have the answer, but I think it will require more creativity. And if you look, I mean, the whole debate of, of our net neutrality shows that it's not simple. I mean, you have like two uh, yeah. um, cable operators in the uh, telecom operators for uh, internet connectivity in the US that share the market, and, uh, yeah. and it's not easy to... Um, restore competition in, in that world. And also the question is, who is we, right? So there is yeah. there is them, these companies operating in a certain, a certain region, certain countries, but also they have a home country which has influence on what they can and cannot do. So there is, there is multiple we's here, I think. Um, and the power imbalances are really important to document um, because yeah. clearly they're, I mean, these platforms are also a tool of soft power. They're also a tool of economic power. Uh, so I think it's it's interesting to look and and we're starting uh, this um, this research uh, on the the issues of concentration. So we haven't yet thought through all the potential consequences, but I think we need to think them through in order to uh, to assess you know what are the main threats and how we can counter them. Okay, we had a question there, Lena Rieke. Hi, uh, thank you also from my part so much for coming to speak to us and providing such a clear insight, I think, on the developments um, and power forces in cyberspace. So I have quite a broad, maybe abstract question, which I'm not sure there is one easy answer to, um, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, so how do you think, I mean, staying on the topic of the internet um, as a public good, that we kind of went from uh, John Perry Barlow's declaration of cyberspace uh, as independent to this situation today where we see fragmentation uh, and concentration of cyberspace due to government forces as well as market forces. Was it inevitable? Do we think we made a big mistake? Is it a problem of regulation? Um, I'd be really interested to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, well, and, if, and if we made a mistake, when did we make it? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would question your assumption that we went from John Perry Barrow's model. I think that's always been an utopia. Uh, and, uh, and very clearly all the fight over, uh, I mean, states made it clear uh, in the early 2000s that it wa this was an utopia and, and of course went to the other side of the utopia or dystopia, which is we can have full control over cyberspace. The reality is, in, is a bit in the middle. Um, I think it's, Again, a natural development of networks. They, they grow fast in a decentralized way, and then they recentralize uh, for network optimization, cost efficiency. I mean, there are advantages to this concentration. It's not just disadvantages um, that we need to take into account uh, as well. Now, if you take the fact, um, if you look at what states are doing, you take, you take China. 
China was one of the few states who understood right up front the strategic dimension of cyberspace. So they organized routing right from the beginning um, in a way that they can control the network. In many other states, it was more of an organic growth, like spontaneous generation with multiple actors, and the governments didn't really understand what was going on, or they, they understood uh, why it was interesting, so they also invested in developing the internet, but there were multiple private actors, uh, and it was largely unsupervised and uncoordinated, which led to the existence of multiple autonomous systems. And now, uh, a number of states are trying to <laughs> regain control. Iran managed to do it, Russia is trying to do it, but in Russia it's a total mess. There are so many actors, it's very, very difficult to do, so they're not going to do it overnight. Uh, and it, I mean, you even had like people pulling their own cables, and they had problems with the bandwidth. So sometimes, at the level of a building, someone you know develop its own autonomous system. So it's not. Uh, it's difficult. It's very technical. It has multiple interactions. It's, it's very complicated. But there is a clear will now to be able to achieve that. Maybe, maybe building on that, because that was, that was an interesting thing in your presentation. So you ran similar to China, basically, has like three major access points to which separates the internet from the internet wider, right? So I was also wondering about Russia. So what would it take for Russia, which is a much more scattered profile, I think, uh, for them to do this? But then again, if you, s from the same presentation, if you see what they did in Crimea, then you start to think, okay, maybe it's not as crazy as it sounds. So I'm, 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 I'm looking for guidance on how to assess the situation in Russia with the RUNET, how viable is that, what will it look like, um, and because it looks like a really complicated operation, but on the other hand, if you see what they do in Crimea, and you think, okay, maybe there's more. Yeah, but Crimea is just a handful of autonomous systems, plus they were helped by Ukraine that made sanctions against, uh, against Ukrainian providers that kept providing connectivity to Crimea. So uh, it's forced um, Ukrainian operators to, to either stop uh, agreements with Crimean ASIS or providing connectivity to Crimea, or um, crime, um, autonomous systems you know, registering in a different country in order to continue providing uh, connectivity. And it was a huge investment to deploy those cables to um, mm -hmm. Crimea. And, and what you can see also uh, that's interesting on our graph is that Crimea is both now mostly integrated into the Russian network, but it's at a distance, which means that there are not that many links so that they can uh, keep the connectivity uh, under control. But if you take Russia, Russia has many, many actors. Um, one of the slides, I think I have um, the, the number of uh, autonomous systems. So you have many more than in most countries, and they, are, they have multiple connections. So to deconstruct that, it's going to take, I think, more time. Uh. But it's a very, very uh, sensitive uh, subject in Russia right now. Uh. But also, I mean, so, th so the question below is, I mean, you said, let me see. You said, so they exercise increasingly a greater power over the lower levels of the internet, right? So that's, that's, that's yep. true, and you see that. The question that sort of comes to, to what end? So, so what are they, you say it's a huge investment, even for Crimea, if they would do it in Russia, oh, the investment would be much more huge? That's very clear in the law. Uh, they mm -hmm. think that uh, it's in their sovereign interest and mm -hmm. duty to control the roots of the internet and what goes in and out of Russia. So they want the roots of their national cyberspace under mm -hmm. control. And when you control traffic, it can provide strategic advantages. You can do selective censorship. You can block access to the internet to some regions, to some people. You can uh, divert some traffic. You can spy on the traffic. Um, there are many, many potential advantages. advantages. OK, good. Um, well. Good, there's a relative term here. Um, <laughs> more questions from the audience? A question Hello. in the back, Fabio Cristiano. Is this on? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Frederick, for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, 
internet access as human right? I think this is a question pretty much related to your presentation. And uh, uh, during the Arab Spring, in fact, uh, regardless of the uh, degree of control on the low layers, we saw that there was, in fact, uh, shutdowns in the whole region, right, regardless of the level of controls. And many other uh, countries uh, decided instead to allow for connectivity as a way for controlling uh, dissent, right? And this is a development we see also in China where uh, it is actually uh, uh, prohibited not to be connected in some regions, and one can be prosecuted for not being connected. So I was wondering whether, how can we combine the idea of internet access as a right with, without providing authoritarian regimes with an instrument for control, right? So I was wondering if you can say something about this. Well, um, I, I don't see how it's possible because it's a dual tool. Uh, it's used for freedom of expression and it's used for surveillance uh, and it's a very dual environment. So it's it's hard to, to know how it will be uh, used. It's the same we talk a lot about um, misinformation and foreign actors that are leveraging the platforms and social media uh, in order to conduct information campaigns. And I don't know if you saw the uh, Nobel Prize for Peace, uh, Maria Ressa, who said that in her country, uh, it was the government leveraging social media to, um, uh, to silent the journalists. So it's, it's dual, you can use it in both ways. Um, you mentioned the Arab Spring, clearly authoritarian regimes learn from it and, and we're worried about it. Um, and, and that created also an incentive. So something I didn't, we, we published in the paper, but I didn't show here is also we monitored BGP incidents uh, and we, we looked at the correlation between BGP incidents and um, social movements or uh, geopolitical incidents and it showed a very strong correlation in Iran, which probably showed that in the context of social crisis or, and political crisis, the, um, the government has been using BGP to, um, as a tool of censorship to prevent people from speaking. But having said that, Iran mostly shut down the access to the global internet, but it continued to function internally. No, because I, I would like to build on that because that was something that was interesting to me. So you say, okay, Iran is connected to the outside the internet at three points. So it's fairly easy, well, it's still a lot of work, but it's fairly easy to close it up to that. But then there is this huge uh, resilient infrastructure within the system. And I was wondering, how does that fare? So what's the relationship between complexity internally and surveillance, which we know in many countries is, is it's a trade-off. It's a yeah. trade-off. So Iran made a choice of having a more resilient network that mm -hmm. is harder to control inside uh, compared to Saudi Arabia that yeah. has a less resilient network, very easy to control, but with major points of vulnerability because you take down a few ASs and, and that's it, you have no connectivity. Yeah. So, and, and I think that decision came from the perception of a threat coming from outside of foreign powers that would try to take their network down. So they made it resilient, but they can easily isolate it from the global internet. Okay. Because in that complexity graph, there were a few really interesting developments between 2011 and 2019. I noticed Bahrain going from 10.20 in 2011 to 0 0.26 in, in 2019. Yeah. So I guess it's clear what kind of choice they made. Um, are there more questions from the audience here? Yes, John. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John Lindsay, Georgia Tech. Uh, thanks very much for a really, really fascinating talk. It really speaks to this you know, classic discussion about whether institutions follow geopolitics or whether they are uh, out of control and constrained states. And, and you kind of try to have it both ways, right, by uh, talking about um, routing protocols following geopolitical imperatives. But then you've got the story of kind of emerging platforms that are providing state-like uh, uh, services. And I guess I just want to press you a little bit on the relationship between uh, these two stories. Uh, is it, is it possible that uh, that platform story is also a reflection of, uh, of geopolitics, right? I mean, is this a story of, um, you know, 
U.S. hegemony being reflected in U.S. companies that are building out um, platform-centric governance, not because it's uh, opposed to uh, American control, it's just sort of the American style of uh, international governance happens to go by with and through uh, private sector actors. So I mean, I think you just maybe talk a little bit about how these two different stories interact. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, clearly there's been a decision uh, from the US government to let these platforms grow and regulated uh, for a very long time. And the US has always been very reluctant to uh, regulate them because despite the, the problems they might cause, they perceived the strategic advantages of having this supremacy in cyberspace outweighing the potential threat to the American democracy. Um, and now we have all this debate about Facebook in Congress and a rather uh, bipartisan consensus of our regulating Facebook and other social media because there was a threat to the American democracy perceived as really great. But I, I, I but so far it's been perceived as a strategic advantage and there's also some uh, interest in uh, this digital diplomacy and the fact that um, these companies are providing internet and public services to vast areas of the world and therefore constitute a form of soft power uh, that represents an advantage. Now, one of the difficulties was the Snowden revelations and the level of cooperation between the platforms and the government uh, and how the platforms could be coerced in competing, in uh, co cooperating with the government. And I think that undermines some of these strategic advantages because the platforms, in order to keep the trust of their users, uh, started encrypting their data much more, starting claiming that they would not cooperate with the government. So the relationship has become more complicated now, uh, I think, because of the way the um, US government has been accessing some of the data. Okay, I want last question. Oh, we can do, well, we have, yeah, short, short question. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, François Delerue. Um, I'm a cyber, uh, I am a senior researcher in cybersecurity governance at Leiden University. Uh, I wanted to make a comment on the, the presentation on something that I find interesting is actually there is also like something you can compare between the two forms of fragmentation is the fact that with the first one, we see how inside the state they want to be more resilient. It's what you discussed about Iran. But on the second one, what is interesting is we see more and more regulation within the state where they want to prevent that, to prevent the platforms to uh, control the network. But this is not translating outside of their border. And we saw this discussion in India, we saw this discussion in the US and in other countries. So that's interesting and I think there is a comparison to be made also on that, where there is an internal dimension where they want to regulate that and they kind of leave uh, these companies, this platform actually doing what they want outside of the country. Thank you. Yeah, um, I agree, and yesterday you, you mentioned a decision by the Supreme Court of India, which I'm not going to talk about because I haven't read it. But, uh, but I think we're seeing increasingly conflicts uh, between the platforms and the states, and, but the power imbalances are huge uh, because the platforms are much more powerful than the states, and the states have no control of the platforms because for most part, they are foreign. I mean, if you take European countries, the platforms that are, are being overwhelmingly used are all American. So maybe there are things we can do as the European Union, but at the level of national states, uh, it's very difficult to establish a power relationship that can get you anywhere um, uh, when, whenever um, there's big money involved. Okay, I think you're onto a very promising line of research here. <laughs> so uh, I think there's a, there's a lot to unpack. Um, it, it gives a sort of a new layer to the politicization and geopolitization between countries and with the big companies and adding sort of a deeper technical layer where we need to figure out how these things fly and then we need to figure out what we 
what we can do and what we want to do. So this is, uh, um, uh, this is enough to uh, keep everybody awake and uh, send them into the coffee break. Um, traditionally, uh, the speaker is available in the foyer, so um, uh, you can ask uh, uh, more questions uh, there. Um, uh, Frederic has to leave us uh, today um, uh, because of pressing engagement elsewhere. So if you have a burning question for Frederic, now is the time. Um, we will reconvene here at, could somebody shout this to me? Um, okay. <laughs> we'll reconvene here at 11.30. Uh, have a nice coffee break, and uh, to the people online, uh, see you hopefully later. Thank you. Thanks.
Cybersecurity Governance at Leiden University uh, and Associate Fellow to the Egg Program for Cyber Norms. Uh, I am delighted to be chairing the first panel of the fourth annual conference of the Egg Program for Cyber Norms. The first panel is titled International Law on Cyberspace New Conundrums um, and is dedicated to an important topic to me international law. For more than two decades, states have been discussing. Uh, what is now known as the framework of responsible state behavior, a set of norms encompassing both legally binding rules and principles of international law on the one hand, and on the other hand, the norm of responsible state behavior. In addition, in recent years, we have seen an increasing number of states releasing publicly their views on how international law apply in cyberspace, mainly in the past two years, Italy being the last state to do so a week ago. Yet, despite this important focus on international law in the discourse of state as well as in international multilateral discussions, uh, numerous questions, if not controversies, remain on how to concretely apply international law in this new context. Um, international law offers a framework to which states have expressed their support, yet how their behavior are actually effectively complying with it remains a question. The four, panel, the four paper presented today on this panel relate to this question. The first speaker will be Maroy Kuka, who is presenting a paper titled Resinking the Underlying Gray Zone in the International Law Applicable to Cyber Operation, a Data-Driven Approach. Maroy is PhD candidate in international law at Paris 8 University, and her paper today built on a doctoral research um, on rethinking how the applicability and application of international law is thought about uh, in the context of cyber operation. Prior to her doctoral research, Maroy worked for international, regional, and local organization on human rights related projects. The second speaker will be Jake Kenny, um, and he will be presenting a paper titled State Cyber Operations Act Back on the Right of Hot Pursuit and International Law. In, uh, in which is questioned the possibility to translate the right of hot pursuits that has developed in the law of the seas into cyber international law. Jake is PhD candidate in international law at Oxford University and a postdoctoral researcher at the Hebrew University Jerusalem. The two final papers of this uh, panel have been co authored and will be presented by one of the authors. The first one, which is the third paper of this panel, is titled Armed Attack in Cyberspace, Clarifying and Assessing When Cyber Attacks Trigger the Netherlands' Right of Self-Defense. And it will be presented by Ferry Osprung, who co-authored it with Paul Duchesne, who is professor in cyber operation and cybersecurity at the Netherlands Defense Academy, and professor by special appointment of the law of military cyber operation at the University of Amsterdam. And Peter Pipger, associate professor in cyber operation uh, at the Netherlands Defense Academy. Ferry is an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel from the Dutch Air Force, and an assistant professor in airport at the Netherlands Defense Academy. He is currently preparing a research project building on the submitted paper, and I'm sure today's discussion will show the interest for the topic, but also some new, offer some new ideas. And finally, the last paper uh, is titled Disinformation as a Service, The Legal Landscape of Dark PR, authored by James Shire, Assistant Professor at Leiden University, Judith Muller, Assistant Professor at Amsterdam University, Ronan Ofarte, a uh, senior researcher at Amsterdam University, and finally, Frédéric zwiedervin Bogashrius, professor, uh, uh, professor of ICT and law at Radboud University, Nimjeg, who will be presenting the paper is with us today. Each speaker will have about 15 minutes uh, for the presentation, and we'll have then about one hour, 45 minutes for a Q&A session. If you are following us online, please uh, post your question on YouTube, and we will ask them uh, to the speaker at the end of the presentation. And now giving the floor to Maroy for the first presentation. Maroy is the first to use the rules. Thank you, Francois, and thank you all for being here. Um, so my presentation is more of a proposal to rethink cyber operations through the lens of data, or what I call a data-oriented approach. When it comes to examining the application of international law to cyberspace and cyber operations, I think we all agree that much uh, of the problem is definitional. 
What is it uh, that we are trying to apprehend by international law? What are the contours of that object? Uh, so it is necessary as a preliminary step to clarify and understand the object, uh, the phenomenon, in this case, the notion of cyberspace, whether we agree or not on this terminology as it has an inherent spatial connotation from which we're trying to distance ourselves is another question. I'll probably come to that later. Uh, but for obvious practical reasons, I'll keep using the word cyberspace and ICTs interchangeably. So clarifying the object is methodologically the first step before clarifying how international law governs said object. And that has been done in the literature primarily through analogy-based uh, analysis. We suggest changing the lens through which the matter is addressed uh, and zooming in on the notion of cyberspace to focus on its core element that happens to be data. So cyberspace is ubiquitous and embedded in all the physical domains. It is a murky notion that encapsulates the pervasiveness of new technologies of information and communication and their peculiar attributes. And while analogies to other spaces on one hand, especially the high sea and the extra atmospheric space, and to new technologies on the other hand, um, uh, namely the invention of telegraph, telephone, or even the nuclear weapons have inspired the early debates regarding the regulation of cyberspace, differences exceeding commonalities weaken such analogous analysis. This is mainly because cyberspace is not a space uh, in a geographical nor a, nor a legal sense and is more than just a technical tool. Therefore, we suggest focusing on the notion's constitutive elements to offer a comprehensive analysis of legal challenges posed by new technological developments. Cyberspace is, after all, a complex heterogeneous concept and assembling multiple complex elements of different nature responding to different logics uh, to form one entity subject as such to legal apprehension is rather a contrived enterprise. Such conceptualization that may be relevant in other fields fuels confusion and exacerbates unclarity over how to deal with security threats posed by emerging technologies from a legal perspective. My presentation uh, that is, more, uh, is more of an introduction to a data-oriented approach uh, to cyber operations, answering two main questions, the why and the what. Why the recourse to a data-oriented approach, and what, it, what, it, what is a data-oriented approach? I'll also briefly touch upon um, how this approach might help advance the debate on the application of international law to cyberspace. Starting with the why, three main reasons uh, that are more observations, the, the combination of which has led to this focus. Uh, and uh, these are the centrality of data in cyberspace um, in, uh, from a technical, a factual, and legal perspective. Data is, in fact, a key component of cyberspace. It can be, nowadays, considered as a strategic target with implications on international security and stability. And data is at the heart of legal gray zones. So the first observation pertains to the centrality of data in cyberspace being its key constitutive component. This affirmation can be easily demonstrated through the study of different adopted definitions of cyberspace absent an internationally accepted um, definition of cyberspace. Uh, more precisely, in the multiple various more or less technically detailed representations of cyberspace that emerged, data occupies a central place as it is the core element around which the environment commonly referred to as cyberspace is built. Um, Okay. In detail, cyberspace is indeed described as an environment whose main function, raison d'être, is to perform data processing and is therefore evidently comprised of data in addition to other elements. Um, uh, the Tallinn Manual, for instance, perceives cyberspace as the environment formed by physical and non-physical components to store, modify, and exchange data using computer networks, data denoting the basic element that can be processed or produced by a computer to convey information. Secondly, or the second observation, data is commonly framed as a requiring specific protection dictated by privacy considerations. However, one may argue that data is also a strategic target at risk with implications on international security and stability. Consider, for example, the Office of Personal Management hack. A Chinese state-sponsored group with ties to the Chinese government gained access to the OPM database between 2014 and 2016, compromising sensitive data of over 21 million current and uh, 
uh, former employees as part of what is believed to be a large um, espionage campaign jeopardizing national security. Another example with more destructive effects is the Shamoon data wiping malware deployed against the state-owned oil company Saudi Aramco in 2012. The virus attributed to Iraq infected, uh, in fact, over 30,000 computers and erased data in a way that it could not be recovered. So data could be, in fact, affected in various malicious ways. Perpetrators talk to data itself or the system within which it operates. Data could be either the object of the operation where it is targeted as such, for example, uh, confidential data theft, or simply a medium through which cyber physical systems are affected, uh, producing damage, uh, damages far surpassing the data sphere. For example, uh, tampering with the data indicating the level of uh, pressure in centrifuges. Data could also be a tool used maliciously to serve a particular purpose. For example, the deliberate uh, dissemination of leaked data at a strategic moment to influence voters' decisions. Ransomware or data retention, data collection, data manipulation in the sense of modifying data in a registry, for example, tampering with vaccine research data or electoral lists are all but a few manifestations of harmful data targeting. The third reason justifying the recourse to a data-oriented approach pertains to the fact that data, due to its peculiar attributes, is situated at the heart of major unsettled legal questions, mainly but not exclusively with respect to the use of force and sovereignty. In general, the absence of immediate physical harm is at the essence of major disputed issues. It is unclear, for instance, whether a cyber operation that does not cause injuries and physical damage uh, would amount to a prohibited use of force under Article 24 of the United Nations Charter, as there is no common understanding on the matter. In the same vein, the question of how sovereignty operates in the cyber context in this climate of cyber instability with the rise of hostile remote cyber operations without accompanying physical harm remain unsettled. Similarly, the absence of physicality raised the question of whether data can be considered as a civilian object, thus enjoying specific protection under international humanitarian law. To circumvent these discussions and address the legal uncertainties, we argue that since the problems stem from uh, the inherent characteristics of data, a solution should be one centered, uh, data centered. Now, moving to the what, what is a data oriented approach and its characteristics? The proposal of a data oriented approach to cyber operations implies classifying data and categorizing data related activities. Technically, data has a dual meaning. It denotes both information intelligible to humans and machine readable instructions, or in other words, content and code. This duality is often overlooked in the literature, focusing exclusively on the informational aspect of data or the content level data. On a normative level, it seems that only data in the sense of content is taken into account. Two legally binding instruments are particularly relevant, namely the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime uh, and the GDPR. The GDPR adopts a substantial distinction between personal data subject to protection and non-personal data excluded from its scope. The Budapest Convention separates organically traffic data from computer data. Traffic data describes, in fact, metadata, which is also content-level data. Furthermore, data is commonly evoked as the essence of content-based activities, such as disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, propaganda, and any other information operations. Nevertheless, data is rarely, if ever, stated as a core element of cyber operations. Yet at the core of every cyber operation lies an action or a series of action affecting data, be it exfiltration, modification, alteration, suppression, etc. Therefore, we propose a typ typology based on the way the perpetrator affects data, or in other words, the action exerted on data as a, uh, a decisive criterion. Accordingly, recent major large-scale uh, large uh, cyber incidents could be classified in three categories of cyber operations, namely the collection of data or cyber espionage, uh, the prominent example being SolarWinds hack uh, disclosed in late 2020, where the integrity of the update was breached, allowing the copying of data. The, the second type of data, uh, um, the hostage taken or, of data or ransomware or re data retention, which is a sort of extortion whereby malicious actors encrypt data and demand a ransom in order to release the encryption key. Uh, the recurrence of this practice um, being highly concerning at the moment. And the, the last, the third type of data is of, uh, of, uh, of cyber operations. Of, this database uh, typology of cyber operations is the manipulation of data uh, broadly
broadly speaking, that started in 2016 with the Russian meddling in the United States presidential election. The aim of this suggested or data-oriented approach to cyber operations is to broaden and expand the focus on data to cover interstate interactions in cyberspace or cybersecurity, going beyond issues of personal data protection and cybercrime. Interestingly, the lines between cyber criminality and cybersecurity are becoming more and more blurred, particularly in light of the proliferation of ransomware targeting critical infrastructure, mostly deployed by, non, uh, by uh, uh, private actors, not necessarily ba backed by states. The move towards narrowing the gap between cyber criminality and the use of ICTs in the context of international security is indeed more than crucial. Data being a common denominator allows such a holistic perception of cyber threats. That said, the suggested approach includes exploring to what extent some data should be sacred, requiring specific protection, and some other data presenting certain characteristics should be restricted. For example, data in the form of virus or data inciting genocide or terrorism should be inherent, inherently unpermitted. Conversely, health data, electoral data, and data controlling critical infrastructure should be undisturbed. Between the prohibited use of data and the protected data, there is a whole range of data in this spectrum. And evaluating data and defining factors that determine which data or the use thereof um, would breach a rule of international law is one of the main characteristics of this approach, data, uh, this proposed data-oriented um, ap approach that I'm still trying to figure out um, how it works, uh, as it is pretty much a work in progress. Um, uh, so to give you an example, we can take the example of data retention or ransomware against a healthcare facility. It would be deemed a case of prohibited use of data, uh, in this case the malicious code itself, against a sacred protected data, which is the health data. The use of malicious code would be considered as a violation of sovereignty according to the Norwegian um, position, provided it is attributed to a state, and the targeting of the protected data, in this case health data, would amount to an infringement in human rights, mainly the right to life, the right to health, private life and property provided jurisdiction is established. Additionally, a distinction between governmental data and personal data may be pertinent as it allows the differentiating threats to data and consequently determining applicable set of rules. On one hand, the storage of governmental data abroad to raise sovereignty issues as competing uh, controls may be exercised. On the other hand, personal data enjoys special protection against its misuse dictated by privacy considerations. In the first case, data is at the core of interstate challenges, while in the second scenario, horizontal relationships between users and data processing actors are prevalent, with the exception of the state-conducted interception and collection of data uh, abroad or data uh, that does not fall under um, uh, its jurisdiction. So this leads to uh, two assertions worth exploring and ending here. Uh, so the first assertion is data defines to some extent sovereignty or sovereign rights. And the second ass assertion is data affects the enjoyment of human rights. Now how, th how this is done would be out of the scope, it, it is actually out of the scope of my paper as it is pretty much still a work in progress and any ideas or any comments uh, um, uh, with this respect are very much um, welcomed and, and valuable. Um, so I think my time is up. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to discuss it further uh, later in the Q&A. That's it. Thank you very much, Maroy. <laughs> that was an illuminating presentation recalling the centrality of data in these questions and making us like questioning whether or not that should affect the way we perceive international and the way international law is applied in this context and mainly questioning whether we should move forward from a framework that is based on the physical infrastructure and its territoriality. So that's very interesting and I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. I am happy now to give the floor to the second speaker, Jake. Uh, the floor is yours. And Thank you. <laughs> I think I have some slides as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Francois, and uh, for the invitation to speak here. Uh, it's great to be here in person. The last few uh, collaborations we've had have been online. Um, the paper I'll present today is titled State Cyber Operations, Hackbacks, and the Right of Hot Pursuit in International Law. By way of an introduction, 
Independent of the right of self-defence, the doctrine of hot pursuit in international law relates to the right of a state to exercise its coercive powers beyond state territory. The right of hot pursuit is well established in customary international law of the sea, as Francois mentioned, but um, it's not developed the same normative recognition in relation to state practice and other spatial dimensions of state activities, such as land or air. Specifically under the right of hot pursuit, the state has the right to pursue into the high seas and arrest a foreign vessel which has committed an offence within its territorial sea or contiguous zone. This paper uses the right of hot pursuit as a lens through which to examine state practice and the legal status of cyber operations where victim states respond uh, to attacks against them by conducting counter cyber operations to prevent or disrupt those operations at their source on the territory of foreign states, uh, which is referred to by some as hackbacks. First, I will provide some uh, background on the principle of sovereignty and jurisdiction in the context of cyber operations. And then I will outline the right of hot pursuit before giving a few examples of state practice in cyberspace that I identify in my paper and discussing the implications thereof. And finally, I'll summarize some of the paper's conclusions. Uh, so as some background, while there's currently widespread agreement that in principle existing international law does apply to state cyber operations, as we've just heard, there's considerable uncertainty over how international law applies to operations that fall below the threshold of a use of force uh, or an armed attack, effectively resulting in so-called grey zones where the application of rules is unsettled. This is the main area where my doctoral research focuses. In the cyber context, there's a debate between those who consider sovereignty to be an underlying principle of international law from which primary rules emanate and those who consider it to be a primary rule of customary international law, where such a violation would result in an internationally wrongful act. Among those who assert cyber operations are in principle capable of violating the sovereignty of a state, there are significant differences in views over how the principle or a rule of sovereignty applies. And it's important to note that to date, no victim state has claimed any cyber operation constituted a violation of customary international law rule of sovereignty. As uh, alluded to in a question earlier today uh, from the audience, while there were initially discussions that cyberspace may be designated res communis, that is a, a common good considered to belong to everybody or an area of territory that's not subject to the legal title of any state, those arguments have since been rejected by states and commentators. While the attributes of cyber operations are clearly distinct from their spatial domain counterparts, uh, sea, air, and space, in that they possess an inherently virtual element, uh, it's now generally accepted that cyber operations involve persons and objects, and they manifest on infrastructure and components, and therefore states can exercise power over people and objects on their territory and regulate their activities. And why is this important? Well, identifying whether state action or inaction may violate the principle of sovereignty or rules that emanate from the principle of sovereignty, depending on your position, is important in determining the legal consequences that such a breach entails. For instance, uh, the lawfulness of countermeasures that may be adopted by victim states to put an end to unlawful activity, recourse to dispute settlement and other remedies. So to move to the right of hot pursuit, uh, state practice of the right achieved general acceptance as customary international law governing the seas at the end of the 19th century, prior to its subsequent codification in treaties. And it's understood that Article 23 of the Convention on the High Seas and subsequently Article 111 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea codified pre-existing customary international law. Its codification in treaties played a role in states finding a balance between the interests of protecting the sovereignty of coastal states and preserving the freedom of navigation of vessels on the high seas. As an exceptional prerogative, the right of hot pursuit is based on the idea that actors that have violated the applicable laws of the victim state in areas under its sovereign control or jurisdiction should not be permitted to flee with impunity beyond the territorial borders where without the right of hot pursuit, the victim state would not be legally permitted to exercise enforcement jurisdiction. 
However, the right of hot pursuit does not sanction the crossing of boundaries, territorial waters, or airspace of another state, unless an explicit agreement exists between states to that effect, only into the high seas, that is this area of res communis, where it's accepted that every state may sail its ships or use high seas resources as they please, as long as it does not hamper the free use by other states. General international law doesn't recognize a right of hot pursuit on land, which would constitute a violation of the territorial sovereignty of a state uh, whose territory was infringed upon. As a matter of treaty law, the normal mechanism to obtain uh, jurisdiction over a person located on the territory of a foreign state is uh, through the process of extradition. As such, hot pursuit on land could only legally be exercised with the explicit consent of the states concerned. Though agreements of this nature have existed in various forms, uh, states conclude bilateral agreements which lay down conditions for hot pursuit over land on a reciprocal basis. However, no treaty with universal reach has been concluded or is it likely in prospect. The Schengen, border on, uh, border, uh, the Schengen Convention on Border Controls is a well-known example of such an agreement, uh, in particular Article 41, which uh, is subject to a number of strict conditions. Efforts to carve out a separate place for a doctrine of hot pursuit as a justification for cross-border military incursions independent of the right of self-defense have generally been uh, rejected. And so to look at state practice in cyberspace, uh, it's often stated that due to the covert nature of cyber operations, there's limited state practice in the area. However, in my research, I've found it's possible to identify a common trend of offensive practice in states conducting cyber operations that target systems on the territory of other states uh, among those who possess the capabilities to conduct such operations. And in various policy nomenclature describing such activity, an increasing number of cyber capable states directly acknowledge that they respond to cyber operations by launching counter operations that target the attacks at their source of origin on the territory of foreign states. And you can see here on these slides, um, I've given some, uh, pulled out some quotes as examples of state policies. Uh, for, for example, the US defend forward, the UK refers to active defense, Canada, active cyber, New Zealand refers to internationally active engagement and Australia have a policy of, to deter and respond. Many of these policies refer directly to international law, in some cases explicitly confirming that such operations are in accordance with international law, and in others reaffirming support for the application of international law to state cyber operations generally. This suggests that states do not consider such activity to breach international law. Nonetheless, the practice is clearly incompatible with some of the positions of a number of states and commentators who consider cyber operations capable of violating the, violating the sovereignty of a state and according to a rule of sovereignty as proposed in the Italian Manual 2.0. A number of European states have publicly announced operations conducted for law enforcement purposes targeting services and systems on the territory of foreign states. Uh, and for example here, the Italian Manual 2.0 considers law enforcement operations by a state attacking command and control services, servers located on the territory of another state to constitute a violation of that state's sovereignty. And so what is the relevance of the right of hot pursuit in the cyber context? Well, these, these policies uh, demonstrate emerging state practice in states exercising authority on the territory of foreign states in responding to cyber operations conducted against them. However, any parallels of the right of hot pursuit uh, where state practice emerged that later formed custody and international law as codified in the treaties and the law of the sea must first appreciate two key distinctions. First, the right of hot pursuit in the law of the sea is permitted only into the high seas, that is res communis, uh, and ceases when the ship pursued enters the territory of another state, unless following the express agreement of that state. Hot pursuit on land may continue only into the territory of another state following an explicit agreement with the state in question, permitting the exercise of the right in its territory. Likewise, hot pursuit into airspace of another state may only be permitted following an explicit agreement between states concerned. And the state practice identified above, uh, in my previous slides in the cyber context involves states exercising authority directly on the territory of another state, where victim state respond to cyber operations by following them beyond the limits of their territory to prevent and deter operations at their source. 
Second distinction is that while the aim of the right of hot pursuit and the law of the sea is to make an arrest in response to a breach of domestic laws of the pursuing state, state practice in the cyber context uh, seeks to follow the cyber operations back to target their source to disrupt and prevent those operations. And while intelligence obtained in counter cyber operations may lead to domestic indictments, as we've seen uh, in multiple occasions in the US, um, their main purpose is to disrupt and prevent those operations. While intelligence obtained in counter cyber operations uh, do not bring individuals that are responsible before the ju jurisdiction of the injured state directly. Nonetheless, hot pursuit provides a rare example of where states have developed customary international law to permit states exercising authority beyond their territorial control to balance particular interests in relation to unique areas of an attribu uh, unique attributes of an area of operations. In the law of the sea, it was namely balancing the protection of sovereignty of coastal states and preserving the freedom of the navigation on the high seas. In the context of cyber operations, uh, while defensive measures on networks within a state's territory, including following best cyber hygiene practices and firewall protection help in preventing attack, it's difficult to adequately address certain types of ongoing or continuous cyber operations without stopping the attack at its source. And so to provide some, uh, a summary of some of the conclusions of my paper, as cyber operations involve persons and objects, and therefore states exercise power over people and objects on territory and regulate their activities, the state practice of states responding to cyber operations through hackbacks in uh, conducting counter operations to prevent or disrupt those operations at their source is remarkable in the sense that such practice is largely ignored by those that assert positions on sovereignty such as that of the Talon Manual 2.0, and because such an exception would be unprecedented, as this state practice reaches beyond the right of hot pursuit to exercise jurisdiction directly on the territory of another state without their consent or permission. Just as the development of the right of hot pursuit in the law of the sea played a role in states finding a balance between interests, as states continue to work towards agreement on how international law and the principle of sovereignty applies to state cyber operations, the debate reflects similar tensions. On the one hand, there are those who deny a primary rule of sovereignty applies to cyber operations below the threshold for prohibited intervention in a position that favours operational freedom. And on the other, there are those that argue a purest catch-all rule of sovereignty applies to regulate state cyber operations against systems on the territory of another state. It remains to be seen whether states responding to cyber operations uh, in hackbacks by conducting counter cyber operations that present or disrupt them at their source on the territory of foreign states will, over time, form an exceptional right under customary international law to exercise jurisdiction beyond their territory, or whether, and in my view, uh, more likely, as states continue to develop the boundaries of how the principle of sovereignty applies in cyberspace, a de minimis threshold of a violation of sovereignty may develop under customary international law that allows for such operations without constituting a violation of the sovereignty of a state. Here I'm thinking that such a de minimis threshold may balance interests in protecting critical national infrastructure on the territory of a state, while also preserving the freedom of states to conduct low-level operations for reasons of national security. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Jake. That was a very interesting presentation. And what is, for me, what is interesting is reflecting on the two presentations we had is we had this idea that we may need to recenter the discussion, refocus the debate on the data. Here, what we have is this question that we have this ocean of data, and at the end, is it a rest communist where state could conduct operation without having to take into account the sovereignty of other states, or are other states having sovereignty or having jurisdiction over this territory, over this part of cyberspace? What is the relation with the conduct of state? So I think that's very interesting, and I think there will be a lot of questions of that. Um, and it's also always interesting for a international lawyer because hot pursuit is, yes, one of these concepts that has been forming in a very specific way, and that is very specific, and seeing it translating into cyberspace is very interesting. So thank you very much. We are now moving to the third presentation uh, with Ferry. Uh, the presentation will now uh, focus on self-defense, so I think it's also interesting because we are moving from this theoretical approach to what may be the way to respond from state to something practical, how the Netherlands will trigger the right of self-defense in cyberspace. So, Farid, the floor is yours. You. 
Thank you, Francois. Very proud and honored to be able to present the article that I wrote together with my thesis uh, supervisor, Paul Duchenne, Professor Paul Duchenne, and my dear colleague, uh, Peter Pijpers. We're talking about arm attack in cyberspace, and when does it trigger the Netherlands right? Could it trigger the Netherlands right of self-defense? Of course, it starts with Article 51 of the UN Charter, which states that nothing in the present charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs. This is particularly important um, because it provides states with a recognized legal exception to the prohibition of the use of force in Article 2.4. However, the Charter lacks a definition as well as of force as arm attack. Uh, armed attack. With regard to force, um, we stick to the prevailing idea that when the Charter speaks of force, uh, it probably implies armed force due to the rejection of the Brazilian Amendment, which tried to include economic force as well, but like I said, was rejected. So for us, force will be considered as armed force. But still, there is no definition of armed attack. Therefore, the purpose of this paper is to clarify what constitutes an armed attack in cyberspace. But on top of that, uh, we hope to suggest a tangible guideline with regard to that threshold um, um, and therewith escape the legal uncertainty that surrounds the topic at the moment. Okay, um, even though there is no definition, fortunately the International Court of Justice did state a few things. And first it stated is that armed attacks form a subset of the term force in Article 2.4. This implies that there is a gap between the two. Um, Every armed attack is at least a use of force, but not every use of force uh, is grave enough uh, to become an ardent, uh, armed attack. On top of that, the difference is uh, primarily one of skill and effect. So we have to look at the skill and effects in order to be able to separate regular uses of force with grave uses of force that are able to qualify as an armed attack. In general terms, this, this means that an armed attack only exists in case of a reasonably significant transboundary use of force on a relatively large scale with a substantial effect. However, the question, as you can imagine, is what is reasonably significant? What is relatively large and what is substantial? When we look at the application of international law for qualifying cyber attacks as armed attacks, in general terms, as well, leading academics and states, both states and academics, I uh, have to say, uh, is that international law applies to cyberspace. They also stated that some cyber attacks can indeed be sufficiently grave to qualify as an armed attack. And to be a little bit more specific, a cyber operation that seriously injures or kills a number of persons or that causes significant damage to or destruction of property and so on. The question again is what is seriously? What is the number of how many people is that and what is significant? Fortunately, there are some specific examples um, which have been made explicit by our the leading academics in the Tallinn Manual in this case or states um, and they mentioned potential armed attacks. Leading ap academics in written down in the Tallinn Manual said that assassination of a foreign head of state while abroad could be considered a potential armed attack. The UK gave us three uh, potential examples. When interference with a nuclear reactor leads to widespread loss of life, or a disabled air traffic control system uh, could down an aircraft, or when cyber attacks target uh, essential medical services, all examples of potential armed attacks. Uh, France said that uh, failure of critical infrastructure, if it leads to a technological or ecological uh, disasters and claim numerous victims, that could also be an armed attack. And Estonia said that when digital infrastructure or services necessary for the functioning of a state are targeted, that could also be a potential armed attack. The Netherlands said that serious disruption of the functioning of the state, serious and long-lasting consequences, again, what is serious, what is long-lasting, uh, could be a potential armed attack but also a little bit more specifically uh, when a cyber attack targets the entire Dutch financial system or prevents the government from carrying out essential tasks uh, like policing or taxation, that could qualify as an armed attack. And if it's qualified as an armed attack, a use of force uh, is allowed uh, as a countermeasure, also kinetically. So before going into um, integrating international and interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary policy documents, we first looked at, okay, what type of cyber attacks are out there and uh, which of them are eligible in the first place? So um, we thought there were uh, three main different types. First is cyber espionage, 
Second is manipulation of the information environment. Uh, the first, of course, is clear. Think about F-35 data that was stolen by China from, G from the US, at least al allegedly, I must say. Manipulation of the information environment. Think about the US election, presidential election 2016, with the involvement of Russia. And the third category, disruption, degradation, or destruction of core security assets. When we look at those, we see that the first one is not considered eligible because it is merely a counter or intelligence operation. Um, and that does not uh, work up to the level of a use of force. And if, it doesn't, if it's not a use of force, it cannot be an armed attack, as you saw on one of the first slides. The same goes for manipulation of the information environment, which is merely a potential breach of non-intervention principle, uh, which was also stated by at least the Netherlands and the UK, uh, which said that interference with electoral outcomes uh, and things like that uh, cannot be more than this potential breach of non-intervention principle, therefore not eligible for qualifying as an armed attack. The last one, however, um, is eligible because it's the most comparable to traditional kinet kinetic weapons and directly cause a physical effect. Therefore, the last one is considered to be eligible. Taking that into account, uh, we started looking at what policies out there to get it, to escape from the legal uncertainty, which always keeps talking about what's reasonably significant and things like that. Um, as well, France as the UK, um, uh, they have a cyber attack categorization system. And France explicitly uh, connected the highest level, level five emergency, uh, to Article 51 of the UN Charter, meaning that it is eligible for qualifying as an armed attack. The UK does not explicitly connect their highest level um, to Article 51, but it does hint towards an armed attack by stating that their highest level is also a national cyber emergency, essential services, national security, leading to severe economic or social consequences or even loss of life. So at least implicitly, also the UK says that uh, their highest category of cyber attack within the categorization system could uh, qualify as an armed attack. For the Netherlands goes that we do not have such a cyber attack categorization system. But what we do have is we have identified um, vital processes, in other words, core security assets, the third category that was considered eligible. Um, and we have a category A for that as well, which is the highest category. I'm thinking of the UK and the French cyber categorization system and the fact that the highest category could be eligible for, the same could go for our category A core security assets. And these are a few examples. Uh, think of nuclear material that uh, has been hampered with uh, electricity, gas, oil, energy, water barriers, clean water supply, apply all category A, um, fight the processes, core security assets um, that, in our opinion, could qualify um, as an iron attack when attacked. However, uh, the Netherlands has not only um, clarified what category A fight the processes are, but also uh, category B fight the processes. And thinking of the UK and the French policy, category B fight the process uh, could not uh, qualify as an armed attack. However, um, we just saw several positions of states and some of the examples within the positions of states are also in the category B fight the processes of the Netherlands. For instance, and sometimes it's implicitly, implicit only, but internet itself, if it leads to disabling the digital infrastructure or services necessary for the functioning of a state or air traffic control leading to air disasters, um, uh, ecological disasters because of attacking chemical substance factories, uh, financial systems leading to the disabling of taxation or communication networks leading to the disabling of policing tasks. Uh, the last one, um, it, it's on the list, but we took out of the, the next part of the research because we, would like, we wanted to focus on civilian targets only to get away from that discussion. So therefore, um, the suggestion uh, for us is um, because category A is eligible, could be eligible due to the um, Sarbatec categorization system from the Brits and France, and due to the fact that a number of category B fighter processes, core security assets, uh, are also part of the positions of states, um, we thought that the threshold for an armed attack could be in between those two. And the nice thing about the Netherlands um, um, category A and B fighter process is that they come with the with a tangible level. And the level was defined for explaining what the damage would be if those targets would be attacked. So, uh, and it's three sorts of damage, physical damage, uh, societal damage, and economic damage. 
So if those five processes would be attacked, that will lead to a certain amount of physical damage, societal damage, and economic damage. And you'll see two thresholds or two numbers, the highest numbers for the category A and the lowest for the category B. So in case of a physical damage, uh, between 1,000 and 10,000 people dead, seriously injured, or chronically sick, that could be a potential threshold bandwidth for the Netherlands, uh, potentially, <laughs> um, to qualify an armed attack. Um, in case of societal damage, uh, between 100,000 and 1 million people with serious societal survivability problems. Of course, another question is, what are societal uh, survivability problems? But that's a different research. Economic damage of 5 to 50 billion euros. So this is the bandwidth we theoret theoretically suggested to a few cyber experts in the Netherlands who at first we thought they would never say, okay, this is where the threshold is. But based on the desk research we did on forehand, they said, hey, wow, that's a nice bandwidth you just provided us with. With that in our hands, we would like to go a, a small step further. So this is a little <laughs> bad slide, but the second column uh, are the examples of the uh, cyber attack scenarios that we provided to the uh, cyber experts. And the column on the right are, is the band, are the bandwidth that you just saw. So we asked them, okay, if a head of state, oh no, that's not a good example. If a nuclear installation is attacked and it leads to 1,000 to 10,000 people dead, would it when would it qualify? Uh, asking them as if they were advising their, uh, their minister, that, that was the question. And actually what came out of that um, uh, this, uh, are three categories. So um, when they graded each, uh, each scenario, they said, okay, in this case, well, one, people, one person dead is enough because it's inherently dangerous. And in other cases, they went up and they uh, moved the, the threshold a little bit higher. But what came out is the middle category. You can't read it, I can see that from here, but the first category is comparable to kinetic attacks directly leading to physical damage with an inherently dangerous character. If you attack a nuclear facility, it's inherently dangerous. If you attack essential medical services, it's inherently dangerous. Uh, you can be sure that people will die if you, if you do that. The second, uh, second, second category I'm sorry, is also comparable to kinetic attacks, but indirectly leading to physical damage. For instance, uh, electricity supply, gas supply, uh, it will not kill immediately, but in a few weeks or maybe a few days, people could die from it. Um, and the last one is the least kinetic, uh, not comparable to kinetic attacks, in fact, uh, leading to societal disruption. Um, and what we saw is that uh, the lower the number of the category, the lower the threshold. So category one, inherently da dangerous character, the intent is to kill, so the threshold is lower. And category three, uh, well, you don't know if the intent is to kill, so the threshold is a lot higher. And therefore, these thresholds were suggested. And actually, it's not really about the numbers in the thresholds, it's more about the categories, the separation of the categories, um, but um, based on the theoretical bandwidth uh, I just showed you, um, these are the outcomes for the uh, tangible levels potentially able to be used as a uh, uh, threshold for arm attack. Questions are later. Do I have to show the potential discussion points already or? You may, yeah. Okay, <laughs> the questions we still have um, is the first one, of course, would such a tangible policy framework have a deterrent and a stabilizing effect? Or would it lead to other countries exactly knowing when to, where to where to go and, okay, just stay below this red line and we do nothing? Uh, or would it have a stabilizing effect? We don't know. Um, could the suggested uh, policy framework be su suitable for other states as well? Uh, we just defined a few real numbers, but if you made them relative, relative to the GDP or the GMP or the number of people, the population size, perhaps it could be used for other countries as well. Could societal di disruption, and think of the fact that force is considered to be armed force, um, do we have to get away from that? Because if we consider societal disruption, which is, which is not armed force, um, do we have to rethink about the fact that, for instance, cyber espionage, is it, is it not possible to qualify cyber espionage as an armed attack if it leads to societal disruption? We said no at first, but when this came out, maybe you have to reconsider that. Um, oh, that's the fourth. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.
No, so thank you very much. That's a very interesting. Thank you for providing us also with questions. So we yeah. will have already like uh, some grounds for discussion. But what I think is very interesting in this uh, in this presentation, and what I think will trigger some questions. But well, maybe first, this question of deterrence effect of the legal framework and having a clear approach to the legal framework. And that's one of the question is states are publishing their views, but is these views having a consequence in terms of deterrence or in terms of effect over the other states? And that's a very interesting point. And also what is very interesting for me is we have all these discussions that are really theoretical about international law and the different rules and principles. Yes, the use of force is not really defined, and then an armed attack is a graver form of use of force, but what is it? So what is in the real world? What is in cyberspace? And that's very interesting, actually, to see how you want to identify or how we may identify it in the real world, which is a question that is not only for, for the use of force and for self-defense, but also for sovereignty, with this debate on the threshold of arm um, or all these questions. So I think it's a very interesting uh, research. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we are moving to the next and the last presentation. So Frederick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Ah, slides are there already. Thank you. And this works. How do I advance the slide? Should I point somewhere? Oh, yeah. Ah. Uh, hi, everybody. Good night or good day, depending on your time zone. Um, I'm Frederick. I have to say that uh, clearly the main author and the leader of this project is uh, James Shires, the person here on the left. But he had something even more important to do than this conference, because uh, a few days ago he welcomed his new son, Hal Felix to the world, so therefore I step in. This um, uh, uh, cooperation um, is uh, largely triggered by earlier conferences in this series, um, and we're combining different disciplines. James Shires uh, works here at Leiden University, and he is in uh, international relations. I'm a legal scholar. Ronan uh, Fahi at the University of Amsterdam, also a legal scholar, who, who knows an insane amount of knowledge uh, on um, freedom of expression. And Judith Muller is um, a communication scientist who, who knows a lot about the effects of media, etc., on people's opinions. In this project, we focus on disinformation, but we narrow it down uh, a lot. Namely, we focus on um, what we call dark PR firms that offer disinformation as a service because um, it turns out that there are that there's a group of um, commercial companies who provide their services to um, uh, governments sometimes to political parties a bit like um, for instance um, cambridge analytica but uh, you'll see a few more examples and we feel that um, this aspect of uh, this information could use uh, more attention in scholarship. You could compare it a bit with um, um, what you could call um, access as a, as a service or hacking as a service. You've probably seen um, uh, the past months at least uh, media reports about the NSO Group, which is a commercial company that uh, governments uh, can hire when they want to hack or access a computer or, um, uh, for instance, a phone of um, somebody. So there are companies that offer hacking or access as a service, and we focus on companies that offer disinformation as a service. And um, we focus on two overarching research questions. Firstly, a um, more empirical question, like what exactly is happening? How many of these firms are there? What are the money flows? What is, what is it worth? What could be the effects of such uh, disinformation campaigns? And secondly, that's mostly Ronan and me pushing for that question, um, I, I, the lawyers, how should policymakers react um, if we agree that the empirical uh, answers suggest that there is indeed a problem, because if the problem is actually uh, uh, trivial, then um, policymakers don't have to step in. And we make, as I hinted already, we call such firms uh, dark PR firms, and at least 
three aspects make that PR dark, because we assume that PR in general, or marketing in general, is not too controversial. You may dislike advertising, but uh, generally it is not prohibited. However, there are certain aspects that can make PR dark, we say. Firstly, disinformation campaigns, for instance, a fake news website, um, typically keeps it secret which firm has built it. Um, so, so dark PR firms typically keep their own influence in the dark secret. Secondly, they typically keep their client dark. So for instance, if some dictatorship is hiring a firm to spread this information, the firm typically keeps the client secretive. Third, um, it is typically hidden that the information is meant as PR or is meant to steer people's opinions. It is typically presented as uh, normal news or normal, um, for instance, opinion pieces that are not presented as, um, uh, as information that has the goal to steer people's opinion. Actually, opinion pieces was a wrong example, I realize. Now, it's typically, for instance, uh, presented as news or something. So, a few remarks about what um, we know already, mostly compiled by James Shires, the young father. Here's an, um, an intriguing example. There are, for instance, dark PR firms that set up fake fact-checking websites that have as the goal spreading disinformation. For instance, at the left, um, a website which is presented as a more or less neutral, but at least a normal news website with, effect, uh, with fact-checking pages, but it is uh, built by a um, dark PR firm, I believe from Canada, um, but it is uh, targeted at a market in India, so it looks also like a um, local site from India, and um, there they have been hired by the government of Modi to spread um, uh, um, praise of uh, what uh, Modi's government is doing and to discredit uh, political competitors. And at the right, a similar example in um, Tunisia, also a fact-checking website that um, um, the money flows are not completely clear there, um, um, but uh, it appears that uh, one political group in Tunisia uh, hired a company to build that site to spread this information about another political group. I guess, by the way, an added threat here is that people start disbelieving uh, fact-checking sites in general. Then, a few remarks about the firms. Uh, so far, what we have found is that um, there are like a couple of firms, uh, these dark PR firms based in L London, um, at least one in Canada, in Toronto, and at least one in Israel. So generally, you could say richer parts of the world, you could perhaps also say the global north. There are also a few of these firms based in countries with relatively high education levels, but low salaries on average, like the Egypt and the Philippines. So this is where these firms are based. Then, who are the clients? Uh, these um, you could characterize perhaps as the global south. So for instance, oh, you also have some of these firms based in the US. So you have, for instance, US-based uh, dark PR firms who do campaigns in Bolivia and Venezuela um, and sometimes in the Gulf states too. And you could imagine that typically the clients are, as I said, uh, governments, sometimes political parties, but you could imagine they're typically not too democratic, semi-democratic or purely dictatorships. Um, then the next question that we want to dive into further, that is mostly uh, Judith Miller's input, is like how effective are these campaigns? I will uh, admit already this is extremely hard, probably impossible to really assess. However, uh, especially Judith Miller, she knows all the literature by heart. Um, uh, there's decades of research in general of how um, 
influential media are on our opinions. And me, as a legal scholar, one of my, the main things I learned is that it's actually less influential than you might think, because people are influenced by so many things, their partner, their friends, their colleagues, uh, how they have been brought up, that media is only one thing nudging people's uh, political opinions. So that may be, well, it depends what your starting position was, but because I used to think that media was in incredibly important in pushing people's political opinions. So generally, it is hard to measure the impact of campaigns. Here, it is even more harder because so far the reports come from social media companies themselves that discover such campaigns. But yeah, this is not peer reviewed. They may have uh, their own agendas in publishing such reports. Um, we know, for instance, that Facebook monitors certain countries, doesn't really monitor other countries where they have difficulties following the language, etc. There are also reports by other firms, kind of security firms, again, not peer reviewed. It may, may all be true, but it's not peer reviewed. Little academic work so far, and this is the world we live in, the few academic institutes have much less resources than the commercial companies uh, doing these reports. And you can also imagine uh, experiments is very hard, like would be the holy grail in medical research or something that is not ethical to do with um, influencing elections, etc. Then about what policymakers could do. Our first message is careful, 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 because this is a picture of the, let's stick with European law for the moment, this is a picture of the European Convention on Human Rights, which includes a right to freedom of expression. And in generally, it is good policy, like when in doubt, when regulating information, which is a type of speech, a type of expression, even when regulating or trying to regulate disinformation, when in doubt, don't regulate is generally a good rule of thumb because you don't want to interfere, interfere too much with freedom of expression. There are possibilities to interfere, but you have to be really sure that you're addressing a real risk and that you don't um, over-regulate, that you don't silence important voices. So when in doubt, don't regulate seems to us good policy. Apart from our own opinion, that is basically what follows from human rights law in Europe. That is what the Court of Human Rights says. There are possibilities to regulate speech, but careful, careful, careful. Um, there are possibilities of regulation that may help and uh, have less risk of over-regulating. So we could perhaps um, take inspiration, for instance, from election law. In many countries, that's already a fun thing, you can learn from different policies in different countries, but many countries have various types of transparency requirements about election campaigns, etc. Cetera, et cetera. For instance, uh, who paid for this, um, uh, sometimes even, or there are suggestions of requiring like what targeting criteria were used for uh, targeted political advertising, etc. So perhaps we could take inspiration from that. And if the policymakers um, uh, targets wrongly, at least you haven't prohibited any speech. But I also have to admit, transparency requirements is typically what policymakers do when they don't really know what to do. It is also possible, but again, careful, 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 is to um, um, make social media companies more responsible for what happens on their platforms. We see a worldwide trend in uh, decisions by judges and also by policymakers to um, require more from social media companies in um, addressing risks of what happens at their platforms, etc. And there are good reasons for that, because since, for instance, in Europe and the US since late 90s, early 2000s, um, what nowadays we call platforms have been largely been free from responsibility, um, unless you warn them like something illegal is happening on your platform. That seemed wise 20 years ago, now policymakers tend to think we need to make them more responsible, the social media companies for instance. Partly that makes sense, but we also have to be again careful, because let's say theoretically you fine 
social media companies uh, for all illegal activities that influence elections, etc. At some point, they might decide, you know what, to escape fines, we ban all political speech from our platform. From now on, it's only cat videos. And that, on balance, would probably harm democracy more than it would help. So, yeah, it's becoming boring, but careful, careful, careful. And then back to the empirical questions. Um, it is really important that we have more of an idea how effective the campaign, these campaigns, these disinformation campaigns are. Because if uh, the honest conclusion is we don't know, but everything seems to point at uh, that is basically wasted money that, it, that these dictatorships spend on these firms, and uh, it doesn't all seem that effective, that basically means um, that policymakers should re probably not react because the risks of regulating speech are so high. So um, this is our uh, presentation of our project. Uh, we have one related paper out already, and still it is, um, apart from that, it is still a um, work in progress. And if you have any citations or something or uh, suggestions, please email it our way. And looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, we are switching chairs uh, for the... Um, okay, thank you very much for the presentation. That was also very interesting. And that's interesting to see how we have this, this question of disinformation, manipulation of information that is becoming more and more important on the international discussion on cyber security. And at the end, one of the big questions is how does it work, which is what you show us, and maybe how we can regulate it. And that's, for me, that's always one of the interesting questions also, because we tend to see it connected to cyber operation, why maybe the legal response may be different. So I think that was one of the interesting points for me from, uh, from your paper. So thank you very much for your attention. Now we have about uh, 50 minutes for uh, Q&A. So please, if you want to ask a question and you are following us online, post it on YouTube and my colleagues will uh, pass it on me. Uh, I've already received two questions and I am also opening the floor for questions in the room. Um, so who wants to yeah, go first? I will maybe ask first one question we have online and then we'll move for a question in the room. So the first question was asked by Tatiana nascimento Ein from Twente University. And she had a question for Maroy on the first uh, presentation. So her question is uh, relating to this idea to refocus the, the way we think about the international law applicable to cyberspace on data and saying that, yes, but you may want also, like when we think about cybersecurity, there are other aspects and data that need to be protected that are considered in this protection. So how this refocusing on the data question uh, will still allow to protect or to take into account these different aspects, if you understand. Like, for example, the protection of the physical infrastructure or the protection of the infrastructure, which is also part of the cybersecurity question. So that will be uh, the first question. I will uh, directly ask the second one, and then we can have already like two answers on that before moving to other question. The second question was asked by Stefana, Stefan so, so, sorry, so Santo from the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich. Uh, and the other question for Ferry on uh, self-defense. Uh, um, so his question is, how does the NATO recognition of that the impact of significant malicious cumulative cyber activity might, in certain circumstances, be considered as amounting to an armed attack? Uh, how that will fit in your paper? So this question of having the accumulation of effects that we see more and more uh, expressed when we talk about the international applicable to cyber operation, how that will be taken into account, for example, in the Dutch approach on self-defense. So that will be the two first questions, so I will invite the two speakers to, to answer them. Um, I mean, you can stay at your, at your seat, yeah. Okay, okay uh, I can go first. Uh, that was, uh, uh, okay, so it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, thank you, Tatiana, for asking that. Um, so I think what answers this question partly is the dual meaning uh, to um, given to data. So data is... Uh, 
code, uh, um, software, um, uh, it's everything that, it, that could be readable by machines, but it's also content. Um, and I think uh, seeing data that way and um, um, this dual meaning and dual sense of data um, make it possible to include the, the protection of the logical, infra uh, the logical structure or the logical layer of cyberspace. Um, as for the physical layer, I, I don't think there is a question there of protecting the physical infrastructure itself because I don't think much of the questions that we have today in, um, in, in, in discussions are not regarded, uh, are not with respect to the physical component of uh, cyberspace and rather um, uh, revolving around this virtual attribute of cyberspace. So I, I think this uh, answers the question. Maybe if I may build on the question, yeah. uh, like push a bit more on that, and which will connect to the two other presentation uh, we are just after you, is um, one of the aspects today when we are assessing the different type of cyber operation and how they would uh, treat, like they will constitute a violation of specific norms, is to identify their consequences, is to assess the effect. Um, and what we saw, for example, for self-defense is the effect to take into account is the fact that it may lead to the death of people, it may lead to injuries or damages. Mm -hmm. So if you focus only on data, how would you Oh, I mean, no, you don't say you will focus only, but if we focus on data, how is that will be taken into account in your approach? And how you avoid having kind of either a blind spot on some effects or having maybe a double standard that will then make create some complication. Yes, actually, this uh, this is a very good command. Um, so uh, I think my answer to that would be um, targeting data could be, I mean, Perpetrators could target data directly, and so we have the effect directly on data in terms of um, uh, uh, tampering or altering their uh, technical um, uh, um, attributes, uh, confidentiality, um, availability, and the third one is integrity, if I remember cor correctly. So um, these are the cyber effects, uh, and then we, data is also a vector, so we could target data to produce uh, effects surpassing uh, data and surpassing the cyber sphere and then um, uh, um, cause the, the, um, the, uh, the dysfunctioning of a, a control system that is uh, in charge of controlling, for example, a, an infrastructure or even causing um, uh, injuries or, or loss of lives in case of uh, ransomware uh, against healthcare um, data. Um, I don't know if that <laughs> answers the question, to be fair. I think that there is... There, there is still work to be done um, uh, to um, differentiate those effects. Uh, so direct effects on data and then uh, indirect effects uh, surpassing data. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think there is a lot of questions on that and like, it will create a lot of dynamics for different research. Okay. Ferris, if I may. Uh... Yeah, the, the question was whether, well, uh, criminal activity could lead to, uh, to an armed attack. Um, Originally, Article 51 was designed for states, uh, for interstate contact. Um, but uh, if the liter literature that I saw um, uh, speaks of either states or uh, groups related to a state. And uh, it even talks about organized armed groups, which are capable of reaching scale and effect that is comparable to what a state could do. And if you look at it that way, um, we're talking about non-state actors capable of committing armed attacks. And if we look at 9-11, that is an example in which a non-state actor uh, had been able, has been able to commit an armed attack because it was officially considered and qualified as an armed attack. So um, theoretically, my question would be, yes, that's possible. Uh, if those criminals are an organized armed group capable of reaching the same scale and effect as states would be able to. Okay. And second question for you, just building on that, and another question is on the, the approach you exposed and the way you expose the different um, thresholds or the different effects you are taking into account, we understand that you take more like one operation is producing that effect. How would you take into account the accumulation of different effects or different cyber operation in time uh, in your approach? Yeah. Or is it something you have been discussing when you were doing the interviews or when you were... Uh, well, yeah, lawyers would speak of the accumulation of accumulation defense of theory. Effects. Okay, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, again, um, if you look at the cyber threats 
uh, as far as I have knowledge of that, um, the most effective cyber threats are those that are combined, several as attacks combined, orchestrated in such a way that they could reach the levels that I just presented. If you look at it that way, you would probably need more than one attack and you would need to um, use the accumulation of events theory. But thinking of attribution, you would have to be certain that they are, that they are connected and also attribute to the same uh, actor, either a state actor or the non-state actor capable of reaching the same level of... Uh, so I think that's a possibility as well, yes. Okay, great, yeah. So the elephant in the room has been now named attribution, which is always a question with all this, uh, <laughs> this question. I am now opening the floor in the room. So yeah, well, we have a lot of questions. So I don't know where is the microphone. Can you raise your hands so we, we see? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thanks for fascinating presentations. Uh, Misha Hanse from IFSH, IFSH in Hamburg. I have also a question to Ferry and about, I mean, you mentioned the risk that once you define these red lines, somebody is going to make sure that he or she keeps just below the, these lines. But what about the other risk of somebody crossing unintentionally these red lines, because you know, with cyber operation, we have cascading effects. We might also have indirect effects. For example, if people believe the integrity of a system, like stock exchange market, is compromised, there might also be psychological effects. So this might cause like a mass panic or something. So how would you factor these indirect or in unintended effects into your framework? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, maybe I would just take a round of questions if that's fine with you, and then oh, we will, okay, uh, yeah. that would be easiest. So, yeah, Lena. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for coming to speak to us and for giving us some insight into new conundrums in international law and cyberspace. Um, so my question is for Maroi, but maybe it also has some implications for the rest of the panelists. Um, and I'm kind of wondering about the utility or lack of utility of international law um, in addressing uh, challenges emerging in cyberspace today. So let's take uh, the protection of data from cyber operations as an example. Um, if this data is not specially protected, so if it's not health data, but it's maybe personal, confidential, civilian data, like financial records, um, and it's targeted during armed conflict, the international law, uh, humanitarian law and human rights could apply, but you have this issue of um, does data satisfy certain definitions? Is it an object? Does basically, do existing legal frameworks do enough to protect data in those, or specific types of data in those situations? For international human rights law, you know, jurisdiction is an issue. What if there isn't any jurisdiction? So, um, even though these cyber operations targeting data could have uh, immense destabilizing effects for entire societies, you still have the issue um, of the operations falling through protection gaps in international law. Um, and my question is essentially, what do you see, what do you think is the way forward for international law in addressing these issues? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take one more question. I think Denise had one. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, I have three, but um, I can ration them if you want to. Um, um, starting perhaps with uh, with Ferry. Um, so, uh, the first question: so, so whether this would be something uh, that states would look at and say, "Okay, I'm going to stay below the threshold." I'm afraid that's very much what's going to happen. The other thing, and it's perhaps more interesting, but if you look at the, 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 the numbers you have for, for your proposed thresholds, they're very uh, uh, liberal. So there's, there's, those are high numbers. And I'm interested because I can imagine that, that uh, the sense of restraint that the military might feel might not be shared with uh, society at large. So how do you, um, so, so the tolerance that society has for these things might be a lot less than what you as military thinkers have come up with. So how do you deal with such a discrepancy? I mean, if, if an armed attack only begins at a thousand people dead or seriously injured, I think you're going to find that a lot of people in the Netherlands will disagree with that, right? They will say, no, no, it happens before that. 
Um, so that's one. Um, and another one, and th I'm going to poke Frederick a little bit because he says cautious, cautious, cautious. Yes, but we have a problem at hands, right? And I remember um, uh, uh, in Tallinn at SciCon that Herb Lin, who will be virtually with us on, on Thursday, at some point said, and I thought it was a really good point, he said, okay, I am terrified of the United States without the First Amendment, but I'm equally terrified of the United States with the First Amendment. In other words, a, a conundrum, right? So, but naming a conundrum is one thing, but pointing towards where we need to go is, is another. And I would be interested to see if, if I can poke you a little bit further on, on that point. And then the third question um, is, is, for, um, um, is for Kenny, right? Jack. Yeah. Jack, sorry. Jack Kenny. That's it. Um, um, so, so, you're, so basically, you look at what states are doing, and you look at the framework of hot pursuit to see if it fits. And if I understand you correctly, it doesn't fully fit. My question is, is a, more a question of, of, of background. So how do countries like the UK, like the United States, who have these defend forward uh, or, or active defense kind of policies, how do they ground them in international law now? Do they or do they not? Do they leave it open totally? So it's more a question of information, but it's also perhaps interesting to see what kind of framework might be applicable. Thank you for your indulgence, Chair. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, I think we will start with this question and with we'll a second round of questions from the room after I saw there are still some people interested in asking questions. Uh, may I start with you, Frédéric? And then we'll follow the order or the sitting order after. Yes, um, I'll mostly focus on the question of Professor Bruders. Um, I may have um, exaggerated the careful, careful, careful. No, I think you should be careful, but um, Let's focus on Europe now. Law is still very much a regional discipline. Uh, more than in the US, for instance, in Europe it is possible to regulate speech, and we do that. And, um, and also under human rights case law, uh, I'll give one example that shows that actually quite far-reaching measures are allowed uh, by the European Court of Human Rights in um, the UK, there was a ban on any paid advertising, uh, any paid television advertising by political parties. So that's a huge limit on freedom of expression. Obviously, uh, a political party complained, um, first to national courts and then to the human rights courts, but the UK actually had a very good story behind. It was well-meaning, and the idea was to make elections fairer, because um, otherwise richer political parties would have an unfair advantage. So that shows that, um, and, uh, but uh, the UK could also show that they had serious policy uh, d discussions before adopting that ban. So that shows that the far-reaching measure as completely banning the most protect-worthy type of speech, political speech, for a whole medium for television was allowed. So that illustrates that you can go quite far if you have uh, seriously argued and, in principle, plausible reason for that limit. So we can limit the freedom of expression, um, and I'm very much in favor of that in some contexts. Um, but we do need also some empirical evidence to, um, for, for, let's stick with this information, for how uh, effective the campaigns are. If, if all the empirical research so far says, well, um, there's no reason to be worried, actually, apart from what columnists say in newspaper, that would be an argument of being even more careful with regulating. If there's empirical evidence that suggests on more influence that is yeah, that um, changes the balance. Okay, thank you very much. Maroy? Okay, well, let me just correct the pronunciation of my name. So it's Marwa or oh. Marwa. Uh, no, oh. it's, it's me. I, didn't, uh, I should have said that in the beginning. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, a very good question, a very good um, comment. Thank you. Um, so as uh, on the, re the relevance of the um, uh, international law, um, I think, uh, Francois, you have written a, a piece on, the, uh, um, on the, rele the, uh, the relevance of the recourse to international law um, um, when we talk about the, uh, the regulation of cyberspace and cyber uh, operations, um, which actually uh, is about the question why uh, why international 
wouldn't be uh, relevant. So it's asking the question, the, the negative question. Uh, and yeah, um, and uh, it, it actually uh, answers uh, that part of, of your question. As for uh, data protected in times of war, um, I'm in fact focusing more on peacetime cyber operations, so I'm afraid um, that's out of scope of my uh, research, but the ICRC are doing uh, a lot of work and are um, advocating for uh, um, um, the protection of data, for considering data as a civilian object and protecting data, and maybe also um, uh, classifying data. For example, there is certain type of data uh, um, that should be protected. Um, so if we cannot uh, uh, reach consensus, if states cannot reach consensus about the status of data during armed conflicts, we could at least uh, consider certain types of data um, as uh, uh, enjoying specific protection. Um, so, uh, and, and um, I think there is a third element to your comment and question. Um, yeah, as for the utility of the recourse to, the, to, to this approach, I, I think there's a number of benefits. And to give just one example, uh, the data-oriented approach um, uh, allows, for example, the articulation uh, between the um, uh, sovereignty as it, uh, it is understood under international law and that is inherently territorial, and uh, the, the notion, the vague notion of digital sovereignty that is emerging in the sense of uh, um, um, strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the hegemony and uh, um, prevalence of uh, foreign um, private actors, um, mostly American uh, internet firms and, and uh, Chinese as well. Um, uh, so, and, um, and to finish just um, really quickly on that, uh, there is also evidence of this, uh, uh, of the recourse to, to this uh, uh, data-oriented approach in the, um, the state discourse. For example, we have the uh, Switzerland uh, in, in their um, and its uh, official position regarding the application of international law uh, to cyberspace and cyber operations, uh, it articulates, without, without taking a, a firm position, it, it articulates the, uh, the main issues and the main unsettled um, questions uh, when it comes to the application of international law to cyberspace in terms of data. Um, and it sets forth um, those challenges and it uses the, the, the terms of data and it uses the framing of, of data. Um, uh, if we take also the, the position of uh, the Netherlands, um, we could see that there is an emerging focus on data, mostly uh, in the uh, financial sector and uh, uh, bank sector. Um, and there are numerous our, um, uh, other examples that um, I'm afraid I don't have. I mean, I think I extensively uh, answered this question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, yep. Jack. Uh, yeah, um, thanks for your question, Dennis. Um, your understanding is uh, that you summarized uh, firstly is correct. I mean, essentially, hot pursuits an example of a very rare exception uh, where states have uh, extended their enforcement powers beyond state territory in relation to uh, unique characteristics of the domain in uh, the sea. Um, and really, when you use that as a lens to examine hackbacks, you see... Um, that it goes even further beyond this into state territory. So it's really exceptional when you look at uh, what states, pos states' positions are on sovereignty. Uh, and I guess that's the second part of your question, which is um, what do states say when they lay out these policies on international law? Um, international law is sometimes only briefly uh, mentioned in these policy documents, but other times they will directly uh, go into international law uh, it's clear that they don't see these necessarily as violations of international law. Um, of course, many states are yet to make uh, public their position on how sovereignty applies to cyber operations. Um, but it's not uncommon for there to be, uh, in my view, uh, very clear contradictions between what states say in terms of how sovereignty applies and the operations they're conducting. Um, I'm thinking here a good example is France, who have a very strict uh, position on sovereignty, which you refer, might refer to as a purist position on sovereignty, where uh, in almost any operation uh, carried out against a state would uh, constitute a violation of, uh, of, of sovereignty. At the same time, France, in the last couple of years, have announced multiple operations where they have, uh, sometimes against encrypted uh, communications networks used by criminals, um, 
targeted servers on the territory of foreign states and affected many devices on the territory of foreign states. So, I mean, which would certainly constitute violations of sovereignty in their own position. Um, and on the other end, I think it's interesting you have the UK position, who are one of the states that I pulled uh, up as an example here. Um, they have expressly denied the uh, existence of a cyber-specific rule of sovereignty. Uh, they're one of a rare position uh, to, to take that, but it, it gives them the uh, freedom to conduct such operations without uh, being in, in conflict of their position. So um, those are the two very extreme positions as examples, but I think it answers, goes to your question. Of okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ferry? Yes, um, well, the first question was about unintended indirect effects. Um, well, first of all, hopefully it's not very likely to reach those levels uh, unintended. Um, I, I think it's very difficult. But even then, um, once I heard on a YouTube film, a senior US international lawyer, I think his name was Charles Dunlap, for those who know him, referred to a uh, Pell graph case, which is about a woman uh, near a train station, the clock fell on her fireworks. Uh, the question was, what was reason reasonably foreseeable? Uh, so if it's reasonably foreseeable, you can connect the act to the uh, perpetrator and, and so on. So um, my guess is, as long as it's not reasonably foreseeable, unintended indirect effects will not be, uh, well, the perpetrator will not be held account for, but that's my best guess. Um, uh, the other question was, um, uh, Dennis, um, I don't know whether uh, the line for civilians is lower than for military. Uh, first of all, I think it's not up to civilians, but up to politicians to define that line. I don't know how willing they are to go to war, but perhaps they are, they are even less willing to go than we are. We are not very willing to go. Um, uh, and also, but that's a, bit, a little bit the other way around. Um, if you look at World War II, for instance, when we started strategic bombing uh, efforts, Germany on Britain and the other way around, that didn't break the morale of people. Of course, they were already in war and they were not persuaded to stop through the bombing. So it's a little bit the other way around, but it, it's not always the case that uh, civilians would like to reach a threshold earlier. That's what I, will, I would like to respond to, to that. Is that a sort of an answer to your question? <laughs> <laughs> I think it will be part of a much longer conversation. Yeah. But I'm interested. I'm, I think yeah. you're probably right. But if you would project these... So I, th I think you're probably right. But if you would project these images, uh, if you put them in a newspaper and ask people to debate about it, mm. you would get a very interesting conversation, I think. Yeah. And I think your point is well taken and it would be part of it. But I think my side of the equation would probably also be part of it. But people would say, no, no, no. We, I mean... This is the threshold, and below this we do nothing. Well, this is also not true. We wouldn't do nothing, but I think it's a longer conversation, but it's an interesting point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and if I may just add a few, co few comments on the different answers on the different questions. Um, I think one of the elements here, which is also very important to take into account with international law, and what, uh, what Mahua was saying is, it's actually highly political in its application. And so on this question that Misha was asking, there is a little chance, if not no chance, that we have a clear cut threshold where you say it will be 10 deaths or it will be 100 deaths or 100,000 deaths. Because the first element will be you will anyway have to take into account the political context on what are the relation between the two states. The incident may happen in a specific context that will trigger a specific response. So that's where international law is always frustrating because it's not as domestic law. You have all this element to take into account, which is how it will be triggered politically, how also a state will manage to uh, have the support of the international community in its claim or not, because that may also affect the answer. So I think it's one of the elements which is very important uh, to take into account. And on the question of staying below the threshold, for me, what is important to see also is it's already what is happening today, and not because we have legal uh, deterrent categories or because we have clear-cut uh, categories, but actually it's what a lot of states are doing today, and it's what we see. They don't do high-level, high-scale cyber operations, but rather low-scale cyber operations that are more annoying operations. 
so it's why some states come uh, with this accumulation of effect, even developing like different forward strategy, because they want to find an answer to that where you have all these low scale cyber operations that do not trigger any form or any right of clear response. At the same time, you want to be able to address them. So I think it's where it's always yeah, interesting with international law, this political element. Uh, other questions? I saw a few hands. Yeah, like again, not a fan. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the great discussion, uh, Louise Marie Urel, uh, LSE. Um, my question is for Frederick. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I guess I have two questions in one, <laughs> so forgive me for that. Uh, one is a more of a methodological curiosity, um, because I think the main thing when it comes to disinformation is really how do we research this. Um, so my question in terms of curiosity would be, how to actually, how did you actually map dark PR? You said you listed three criteria, but how was it in practice? Um, and that leads me also to the question of, you know, whenever you, you talked about, you know, some of them being in Canada, is that kind of the institutional representation of that PR firm? Because in many cases, uh, these PR firms are kind of clandestine or they're like small groups or sometimes they're even big, but they might be registered in a country, but they're actually kind of operating from another kind of uh, jurisdiction. So I, I was wondering, just because of these dynamics that are sometimes really hard to trace, how actually was it in the case of the paper? And I'm very much looking forward to, to reading it. And the second question is really on the how to regulate side. Um, um, and I was wondering whether, you know, within the paper you actually touched upon kind of the platform regulation side, because obviously there is a discussion not only about the hybrid kind of nature between, you know, information operations, kind of international law, thinking about cyber attacks and cyber operations, but also like on the platform governance side of looking how companies are already kind of targeting or shaping what is kind of permittable in terms of what are these PR firms, like which ones are actually staying in the platforms and which ones are actually being taken out. Uh, so I was just you know, curious to hear more about the research and how you actually factored in into the discussion about regulation, these, these, these two different sides, kind of more of the international law vis-a-vis -vis kind of the platform governance, which plays a huge role in just determining who gets to say something and publish something in these uh, environments. So thank you. I think there were two other questions in the back. Yeah. Uh, Marielle Weimers, Maastricht University. Uh, I will add another question to Frederik. Because uh, when I was listening to your presentation, um, first of all, I think we should applaud that you're bringing together different disciplines. I think this is really an exemplary case. Uh, but still, while pulling together these different strands, I'm wondering whether there is a, a geographical blind spot in the current design. Um, so for example, when you speak about the actual location of the firms, you indeed point out, usually these are Western firms. Uh, when we look at the populations where these tactics are being em employed, this is mostly, as far as we know, Global South. When we think about regulatory responses, we look immediately towards the EU, and the EU is trying to defend its own communicative space. Yeah. Uh, so my question then is, how are we protecting the actual populations that are being targeted? So would this be done through either exemplary norm setting and then trying to export these norms, which is a very challenging to, uh, route, or the opposite, targeting the actual firms, which has its own problems? Uh, so I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about this. So how do these two lines come together to actually look at these populations as well? And there was a third question. Yeah. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Ingmar Snabili of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, working for the Cyber Task Force. I had a question to um, uh, Frederik, oh. and, and it, it, yeah, it speaks to um, uh, the issue of, of disinformation and disinformation campaigns, and whether you made any distinction also in, in the sort of the empirical research that you did um, between um, cyber enabled uh, disinformation and um, regular disinformation through maybe through cyber means, but not through malicious um, uh, uses of ICTs. So, whether 
you came across um, cases where um, there were actually cyber operations conducted to be able to um, circulate uh, disinformation and whether that would change anything about your sort of your consideration of um, how it affects um, uh, freedom of speech and um, uh, other uh, sort of limitations or legal frameworks that, that would apply. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. I, yeah, we don't have other questions in the room, so I will turn to you, Frédéric, <laughs> because you have a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, thank you for all your questions. Um, um, and if I don't have enough time, or if I, uh, if I don't answer it um, uh, to your liking, we can discuss uh, over lunch too, of course. Um, first questions: Is there? Um, um, no, no, so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah, how do we decide uh, what saying where companies are? Um, we should pay more attention to that. So far we were, I have to admit, our team was implicitly thinking about offices and not about uh, postal registration. And for instance, Cambridge Analytica, we've seen pictures of their office. So for some firms you can see, so we have to be more explicit about it, but so far we were thinking about physical offices, but yeah, after the pandemic, I guess dark PR firms will also work from home and perhaps from a beach in wherever. Um, the responsibility of platforms and what they take down. Um, that is definitely, it's definitely possible that a large part of the answer lies there, like how much responsibility do we give to platforms? Um, European Union has proposed an um, ambitious and uh, a proposal with the Digital Services Act with different levels of responsibility, etc. There are quite a few drafting mistakes, probably, but it is an amb ambitious effort w w with quite a few good ideas in it. Um, so I definitely think that part of the answer is um, giving nuanced or nuancedly phrased responsibilities to platforms and it's definitely also um, needed that uh, we require such firms um, to have uh, enough people speaking a certain language if they enter a certain territory. So they can't claim afterwards, yeah, we didn't know about incitement to genocide because we had nobody who speaks uh, the local language. That brings me to uh, the other question. Isn't there a regional gap? Yes, clearly. Uh, during the discussions, I also wrote down to the notes to ourselves, we should probably invite like an international law specialist too, which we don't have in the team yet. And then the question, um, how to protect the people in the global south? Um, not, I don't have a clear cut answer. Uh, we should probably work in different streams at the same time, in parallel. For the moment, we have a reasonably functioning democracy in Europe, um, and we don't even know to how to formulate answers. So one track in parallel is thinking, so how would we regulate it? Um, uh, scholars can give, can map out arguments, but it, ha it has to be politicians that uh, uh, decide in democratic backing. Also, I think you can target um, the firms partly, um, which uh, uh, there are countries and regions with rules on export, on uh, surveillance uh, uh, tools, etc. I think that makes sense. Uh, um, and we can only give inspiration to countries in the global south for what type of laws they could adapt. But if the clients are dictatorships, that is uh, tricky, of course. So that think. No, I think that gives the global north, weird phrase, but let's say the, the, uh, nevertheless gives a responsibility to regulate firms that may do damage in other countries. Um, I have to admit the last question that I didn't fully get it, but I'm around for lunch. So, you, yeah, you, but I don't want to steal all the time from the other speakers. 
You asked for a distinction between two types of disinformation, but... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll just speak out loud. Yes, whether you made any distinction between... I think it's okay. Um, That's all. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Uh, whether you made any distinction uh, between, um, let's say, uh, uh, disinformation that is spread maybe through surely digital technology, um, let's say what um, uh, Cambridge Analytica did um, using social media platforms. Of course, there's cyber involved. Uh, but what uh, when it um, disinformation is spread through malicious use of ICTs, through um, cyber attacks or cyber operations, um, that in addition to... Um, spreading disinformation also, of course, um, uh, violate other, um, maybe not elements of international law, but certainly uh, the, the sovereignty of the state or the, um, uh, the right of, of, of non-interference in a state. Ah, thank you. So would an, what an example of the second one would be, for instance, you hack the uh, website or the social media of um, of a prime minister and you spread so a combination of um, ah, so far we didn't think of that category so so far we just thought of um, disinformation spread uh, uh, digitally or actually we would be open for paper disinformation too probably but all the examples we've seen are digital um, it makes sense I guess that distinction that you suggest but so far we didn't make it and also didn't really come across uh, examples of because we already have quite a narrow focus we want to focus on that on firms that are hired by governments so far we didn't see such firms such dark pr firms engaging in uh, hacking like um, activities to spread this information but it is definitely a possibility and i'll add that to our to-do list to give that more thought Thank you. Yeah, I guess if I may add on, on the second example, one example would be what we saw during the Georgian conflict when, in addition to having cyber attacks of different types, you had also defacement of websites where they were injecting content mm. on the website. So you will have this first uh, cyber attack that will be break into something from a cyber security perspective. And then you will have this uh, manipulation of information component, which is in, ca in this case was changing picture, but could also take uh, one step further with what we see in terms of development of uh, disinformation. Indeed, indeed. I'm going to oh. give that more thought and happy to discuss more over lunch. So we have already another paper for next year, I guess. <laughs> 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 okay, great. Um, I will maybe, because we are running a bit out of time, so what I suggest is maybe asking one question to all the panel. And, Maybe in the line of the question Lena asked on what are the utilities and non-utilities of international law and what we see with international law, what I would be interested to, to hear here, and which is a question we see a lot when you, you speak to policymakers or when you have these debates about international law, is do you think that international law is offering or will be offering the right and so the right framework on what you have been working on? So, for example, one of the questions that, was, uh, that could be asked is this deterrent effect that you were uh, highlighting uh, very, do you think it's something that is working? Do you think something that is not working? Um, or do you think we should move and have new rules, new regulation, and what we have in place? So the lex lata, as we call it uh, among international lawyers, is not enough and we need to move forward. So I have an idea for some of you, but I, I would be maybe curious to see whether you think we need a new framework or if the framework we have in place is sufficient and it's just a question of adaptation or a question of interpretation. So let's follow the order of presentation, maybe. Marwa, if we can start with you. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is, if the international law um, have the right answer? Um, does international law have the right answer or answer all these uh, uh, threats that have be we've been discussing um, today? So um, I think international law offers some responses. Uh, I think we can find a lot of solutions uh, in international law, but I think also some other uh, branches of law uh, could... Um, um, could have some other um, solutions as well, um, thinking particularly um, uh, about uh, global law, um, uh, cyber criminality law, uh, and, uh, um, um, and the like. Mm. 
but we should also maybe um, think about some other solutions outside of international law, because we have a lot of interactions uh, between private actors and state actors. And I think there is something there to explore uh, in depth. And I think that some other res responses or answers to those unsettled questions could be found there. So today, for example, I, I presented, let's focus on data and here is why. And maybe my next paper would be, let's focus on data and here's how it's done and uh, would provide um, some more uh, answers integrating international law and some other branches uh, of law and internal regulations and states. Thank you. Um, I think on anyone talking about international law frameworks and how they apply to cyber operations, I think it's helpful to keep in mind the context of other areas with unique attributes and how the principle of sovereignty was developed to apply to them. Um, and when I'm thinking, you know, today I spoke a bit about law of the sea, but uh, it's not unusual for states to take a long time to find their positions. Cyber as well is an area where there's many cyber capable states who have uh, developed their capabilities and many states still aren't sure of their interests in the area. Um, I see in, uh, in drawing out balancing similar interests, you know, I spoke about uh, a purist application of sovereignty where uh, you can have you know, absolute protection, you might say, where any operation will constitute a violation of sovereignty. Um, and the opposite, which is you know, saying that there is no uh, rule of sovereignty that applies to cyber operations, which would give you absolute freedom. I think it's over time uh, finding a balance between that. And I think when you look at state positions, uh, which are being released, uh, especially in the last two years, uh, three years, you can see now states, uh, I think there'll be some sort of de minimis threshold that will emerge where states will find some agreement in balancing these interests. So I think, you know, do, does international law frameworks uh, fit with cyber operations? I think over time, uh, this, this seems to me to be a normal process. Uh, of states finding that happy medium. Uh, so that's all I would say on that, I think. <laughs> and also, a lot of this discussion actually about um, disinformation outside of the EU context, I think you know, it ties into some of the other work that we're doing on uh, the principle of non-intervention in electoral interference. You also have uh, an international law framework, which, um, you know, again, with, as long as it's attributed to a, a state, um, you can then look at you know, coercive uh, behaviour and whether electoral interference might amount to a, a violation of the principle of non-intervention. So there might be something to consider. Yeah, I think with regard to my topic, um, the, the, the threshold, probably a certain amount of ambiguity might be helpful um, in a way, um, but still, um, starting with norms or making international law by interacting, by talking about it, getting cyber operations out of secrecy, opening the debate. If we don't start doing that, we'll never get there. So um, if we start doing it, we have a chance that customary law might uh, appear somewhere or somehow. Uh, I don't know whether you call it state practice or opinion juris or all those terms, but that's how you build it, um, step by step. So international law is probably certainly a vehicle for doing that. I don't know if there's any other vehicle uh, suitable for it, but um, we, need to we need to take steps, small steps, one at a time, and then we'll probably get there, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Frederick, I know you are not an international lawyer, but uh, I think it's uh, also... Yeah, it's indeed, as the last speaker said, it will take time, and that on top, of that, there's generally uh, the, the fact that when regulating new technology, law tends to be slow, and there are good reasons for that, because adopting law take, uh, takes uh, democratic debate, and that is slow. I'm not, uh, it's unfortunate, but I'm not saying that we should speed up lawmaking, because that would become too hasty. But um, nevertheless, but that's a bit, uh, I have to say that as a legal scholar myself, I hope my discipline has some relevance. So, um, no, but in the end, I do think um, after norms uh, slowly emerge that uh, the end goal should still be binding treaties, etc., in international law, even if it's frustratingly time-consuming. 
Okay, great. Yeah, I think the, on the, the question of low being slow, it's maybe also something useful in this context that we don't rush to find an answer, but we take also the time to reflect on what is happening and adapting the framework when it's needed. So I think it's going both ways. Yeah, it's frustrating because it's slow, but at the same time, it gives us the time to think the, the responses and the answer. Um, so thank you very much. We had two other questions online, but we are running out of time. So I'm sorry, but uh, I will invite uh, the person maybe to contact the speaker. Same thing if there is other question uh, in the room. Uh, do not hesitate, we'll have the lunch break, and I think the four speaker will be uh, with us for the lunch break. So, And uh, I just uh, want to thank you for your presentation, and thank you for the question, both online and in person. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. And good morning, good evening to anybody who is joining online from various parts of the world. Um, this is the second panel of this conference, and this is the first hybrid panel we have. And the title, the name of this panel is Great Power, Perspective, Sovereignty, Norms, and Attribution. Just thinking about it, the US, China, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, we call some states great powers in cyberspace that do shape the way we look at conflicts in cyberspace. They do shape political discourses. They do shape policy narratives. We have heard at the previous panel, for example, the previous session, how France and some other countries construct sometimes those very extreme political narratives. So what are the perspectives of the, these great powers in cyberspace? How do they shape these policy imperatives? How do they deliver these messages? How they, do they construct narratives and governance frameworks? And can we decode, decrypt this discourse and see what's behind these messages? And this is what we are going to do in the next two hours. We are going to look at these great powers and see what's behind the messages and how they construct them. And we are joined by four excellent panelists here. So on site with us is Misha Hansel, who is the senior researcher on international cybersecurity at Institute for Peace Research, for Peace Research and Security Policy at the University of Hamburg. Uh, we have online Ricardo Nani. Hi, Ricardo, um, who is a PhD candidate um, in international relations at the University of Bologna. We have Oleg Shakirov joining us from Moscow, as far as I understand. He is a consultant at PIR Center in Russia, in Moscow. And here with us, um, he's also joining online. And here with us also June Lee, who is the program coordinator at the Technology and International Affairs Program at Carnegie Endowment, where she works on projects on cyber norms, attribution, and financial cybersecurity. Um, and without any due delay, I'm going to move to our first speaker, Misha, uh, who is going to talk about great power narratives uh, of the crisis of cyber norms building. How do we understand this? How do we understand leg legitimization strategies and dilemmas? Uh, Misha, please, the floor is yours. Looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, for having me. Uh, it's great to, for the first time, participate uh, in this event. Um, looking for my slides, yeah. Uh, I'm going to present a paper on great power narratives on the crisis of cyber norm building, or put differently, stories that states tell why the international community, at least partly, failed to stabilize um, cyberspace. A paper, um, the focus of the paper changed a little bit over the course of the last couple of months. So now it's less about the sources of narratives and more about the impact of narratives. And trying to switch slides. Hopefully this, do I have to point somewhere? Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, a little background. Um, what I call in the paper a new international public diplomacy on cybersecurity. I think it's fair to say that maybe five years ago it would have, wouldn't have been possible to write this study because just we didn't have these number of high profile um, political statements on international cybersecurity. And I mentioned only um, a few here. Of course, you know the United Nations Security Council open debate on cybersecurity. There has also been uh, it this summer an NBC interview with Vladimir, with Vladimir Putin, and I think almost a third of it was dedicated to or was covering cybersecurity issues. Also, Joe Biden's speech in Geneva. Um, so, as a political scientist, uh, when you see this material, you think, okay, what can I do with this? 
Uh, and so far, at least, there has been no a narrative analysis of international cybersecurity or this uh, sort of international public diplomacy. So I found this quite interesting. Um, why do we see uh, these um, increasing numbers of high-level political statements uh, in the first place? I think uh, different regions, uh, re reasons for this. Um, on the one hand, there is a convergent expectations on the need to do something to stabilize cyberspace. This comes from industry, comes from non-state actors, also state actors. So I think it's hard to say nowadays that there's nothing to regulate or to, to do in this area. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there is continuing disagreement uh, at, um, within the international community, and there's, of course, ongoing cyber attacks. And I think these two factors cause pressure on state representatives to justify their role within this process and what they have done uh, to improve the situation and also maybe to do a little blame shifting. Um, so to point, to, to finger point at other actors that might have behaved uh, differently. Um, and a lot of these public statements um, in terms of structure are uh, structured as narratives. Um, and I come to this, to these structural issues uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, so I ask myself, what, is the, what are the key differences between the great power narratives on the international community's failure to, uh, to stabilize cyberspace? This is a um, comparative part of the research, but also going beyond just comparison and descriptive analysis, I asked, um, when do narratives have a life of their own? So when do they create something that is not Mm, controlled by the narrators themselves. Uh, what kind of legitimization risks or traps do they create or establish? Um, very briefly, narratives um, are important because narratives can be found in every culture, society, every religion. People are storytelling animals. We have already um, a great IR research and FPA research on narratives that shows us that narratives can become dominant within domestic um, um, policy discourse and they can privilege some policies over others. They can be highly entrenched and institutionalized. They can also be the baseline um, through which um, past policy choices are evaluated. Um, so it would be no surprise to see narratives also being a large part of the international discourse on cybersecurity. Now, if we turn to the empirical part, um, or let me say some, some last um, remarks before on the structure of narratives. Um, basically, every narrative has, a very, on an abstract level, a very similar structure. You have a setting always, so that shows you, okay, what are the stakes involved? What are what is the underlying problem? What are uh, possible solutions? Then you have protagonists, of course, and they need to be characterized. Some of them are characterized as dishonest or as timid or weak or brave or you name it. And then there is implotment. And implotment in, within the narrative basically links actor characterization, actor behavior to favorable or non-favorable outcomes. So this is a very basic narrative structure. So um, in the research, I compiled English, English language statements by embassies, UN delegations, press secretaries, um, both um, of US and Russian representatives, um, trying to find and to analyze these structures within um, public statements. And I won't go into detail too much into the um, descriptive, descriptive empirical analysis here. Um, only picking up on um, the actor characterization, because there's one interesting difference. Uh, when you look into the US narrative, you see, of course, um, for example, Russia or China being characterized as uh, acting irresponsibly or maliciously and all this. Um, so there is a negative actor characterization. You find similar characterizations uh, within the Russian narrative, of course, but the Russian narrative in with regard to actor characterization is much more complex. So it's not just that, for example, NATO, NATO countries or the US are characterized as uh, aggressive, but sometimes also as weak because of domestic uh, politics. And sometimes also there is this notion of, um, well, Western policies are um, ideologically driven 
or driven by uh, irrational ideas or whatever. So this is a much richer actor characterization um, within the Russian narrative. Um, moving from the description and the comparison to the more analytical parts, um, the question now is, um, you have these narratives, but do the narrators fully control what happens um, and how they resonate within multiple audiences. Of course not, it's um, quite difficult and quite challenging to do so. You have to anticipate resonance within different audiences, multiple audiences. You have to um, uh, look at long-term and short-term benefits and risks. There's also coordination deficits, so different agencies contribute to a narrative, sometimes contradicting um, each other. And of course there's strategic interactions, so narratives provoke counter-narratives. Um, of course, this is also hard to anticipate. Um, narrative control in the paper I understand as anticipating or the ability to anticipate and shaping inter-narrativity. Inter-narrativity basically is how narratives interact with another or how they pro provoke counter-narratives or uh, amplify, reinforce counter-narratives. So are different types of inter-narrativity. There's interaction between international and domestic narratives between policy or issue area narratives and strategic narratives, and of course, between ego narratives and alter narratives. Um, now, what does this mean? Or can we analyze examples where narratives have created legitimization risks that uh, have not been anticipated before? Are, these, uh, are we able to find these examples? And I mentioned, or I will go into detail into some of them, at least. Um, and one is um, to be found within the US narrative. And I'm sure you remember, of course, the um, election campaign last year. And I think one of the most salient foreign policy issues was um, the way to deal with Russia, right? And um, the Biden campaign made very clear that there needs to be a um, reversed Russia policy um, because of um, you know, some inappropriate relationships between like administration officials from the Trump administration and um, certain Russian representatives, and this whole suspected, you know, Russia collision. So um, the Biden campaign promised to be much tougher on Russia. Um, and then at the end of 2020, there was, as you all know, the solar winds hack, or news about the solar winds hack came out. And of course, by this immediately became a sort of test case for this promise to reverse the Russia policy. So um, the incoming administration immediately said, well, we will this will be a top priority. There was also criticism of um, Trump administration as basically saying uh, the Russians are not responsible against the advice of the US intelligence services. Um, so this immediately became some sort of a test case. So you have this electoral campaign narrative on the domestic level, uh, and now it became wedded to the cybersecurity narrative. Um, then of course, uh, in 2021, in the first half of this year, this wave of ransomware attacks, um, highly spectacular ones like on the Colonial Pipeline network. And um, of course, it, was, it follows only logical from this promise of the Biden campaign and um, that now um, there needs something to be done. And the Biden administration uh, communicated red lines quite um, directly to um, the Kremlin. Um, like in this example, so made it clear that you know, this has to stop and we expect the Russians to act if new ransomware uh, attacks are gonna be uh, done by uh, Russian uh, criminals. So it became even more a test case. And of course the risk um, of this um, rather harsh cybersecurity narrative was, is the administration gonna able to follow up on this? And uh, if there is a new wave of ransomware attacks, and of course there was, um, at least some new ransomware attacks, like the Kaseya attacks. And then there was growing resentment within Congress and the media um, because it was not immediately visible, is there any US reaction? So red lines has been, have been crossed, but there was no visible um, reaction or retaliation, uh, right? And this can be understood as an emerging negative of a foreign policy fiasco, actually. So this would be a case of how a, a narrative unintentionally in the long run created to, or almost created, 
and foreign policy fiasco. Um, of course, the Biden administration officials tried to now realign narratives and to manage expectations. So they told the public, well, we never expected Putin to immediately end these attacks or to go public and promise to end these attacks and to, to, to take responsibility for them. Um, also, uh, they tried to recharacterize the Kasaya attack, saying, well, we're still not sure if this is um, done by Russian criminals. And so all kinds of efforts um, in order to somehow do damage control in this case, right? And I think it's too early to tell whether this will, in the end, turn out as a, um, the construction of a foreign policy um, fiasco or not. But the important point is here that this could be a case where you see these unintended um, effects and uh, these kind of narratives taking uh, a life of their own. Um, there are other examples as well. I will skip over this uh, and keep with the, with the US narrative. Um, there's another interesting issue here because, of course, we have these um, accusations of um, malicious behavior coming uh, especially from uh, Russian soil, Chinese soil. Um, and. <clears throat> Um, very rarely are, uh, is there a clear indication, okay, uh, what kind of norm violation is this? And we can speculate about the reason of this. And one possibility is that when you think of a narrative that would emphasize norm violations all of the time, it would be difficult to reconcile this with the vision of, um, or with the idea of, you know, gradual improvement of the regulatory framework. So remember, I mean, um, Russian representatives over and over again argued uh, for the need for a radical overhaul of the normative framework. So they're up until now, there are statements like, we still have a legal vacuum here. So we need more binding rules, we need more uh, stronger rules, whereas the US narrative is much more focused on we need to implement the existing rules. Um, so it's much more pragmatic and gradualist. Now you can of course say, if if the US were to announce or to accuse um, Russia or China of norm, norm violations all the time, then of course it seems to be implausible that we do not need radical change, right? If the existing framework would not be able to prevent anything of this, then this would actually play into the hands of the, or might play into the hands of the Russian narratives of the need of radical reform. So, and anticipating this risk of playing into the hands of a Russian counter narratives might be one might have been one motivation for uh, the U.S. Um, stopping short of um, making explicit accusations of, of of specific norm violations. So these are the kinds of effects I'm interested in in the paper. Um, and of course, this is very much work in progress, and there's uh, all kinds of open questions. So what is intent? What is unintendedly um, happening? What is ad hocism? Um, what is in, uncoordinated. Uh, also, does it, does it really matter whether or not there is consistency or credibility? I mean, this is the whole uh, area within the IR. And also, uh, what if any, um, is there any lasting impact that narratives can have and through what kind of mechanism? So, um, thank you for your attention. Very much looking forward to the Q&A and to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Misha. And for all of us, let's move to from normative orders and narratives and these great comparative analysis and zoom in into these great powers one by one. And we are going to step aside here from the issues of foreign policy, diplomacy, and constructions of narrative to, to the area of internet governance, of the technical governance of the network. However, with a, with a bit of a twist here, again, narrative, um, digital sovereignty. Many of these great powers use this construction of digital sovereignty to make some sort of a claim. But what about? And Ricardo Nani is going to talk about Chinese stakeholders at Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, 
ICANN for short, uh, the organization which is responsible for uh, the domain names and unique identifiers governance, and uh, a quest for digital sovereignty in internet governance by Chinese stakeholders. Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I see myself as the main picture on the screen, so I take it I'm also visible um, uh, um, both on YouTube and uh, live at the conference. Um, is there a chance I could see my slides? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so um, as anticipated, I'm, um, um, I'm working on um, uh, the role and influence of Chinese stakeholders in, um, in internet governance uh, at ICANN. So I zoom in in particular on this organization. Why that? Um, if we could please go back to the first slide. Um, the reason why I do this is because I want to um, observe the impact of Chinese stakeholders on state centricity or state influence um, in uh, multi-stakeholder uh, governance settings, with ICANN being the epitome of um, multi-stakeholder governance. First of all, because it kind of created the concept, but also because it's at the core uh, of the governance of uh, um, the internet's uh, essential resources. Um, so why the debate on digital sovereignty and why um, multi-stakeholderism? Well, digital sovereignty, uh, because of course it's uh, all the hype uh, in nowadays discussion, digital sovereignty for the European Union, cyber sovereignty, and only more recently redubbed uh, digital sovereignty uh, in China. Uh, but nobody seems to gauge, and that includes me, uh, the actual meaning of this term. So if we take digital sovereignty to mean um, anything that includes uh, a strong state role of regulating uh, internet-based activities and its resources or infrastructure, um, in this case, we can observe um, a return of state or the potential return of state uh, in uh, traditionally multi-stakeholder governance fora as a facet of uh, uh, digital sovereignty. And also as a, a scholar in international relations, I believe that uh, looking at multi-stakeholder um, internet governance fora is uh, uh, important for its implications for the liberal international order at large. I maintain in my paper that um, the um, multi-stakeholder setting uh, of the internet is based on um, uh, the free market tenet of the liberal order and having been established under the guidance of the US, with the US initially maintaining a special role in relationship to ICANN and with the IANA contract, um, it's also uh, a facet of the US's hegemonic role uh, in the 90s, one that is continuing nowadays, although it's more and more uh, challenged in many, in many ways. Um, so having said that, one can explore the challenge to multi-stakeholderism uh, multi uh, through the lenses of uh, uh, digital sovereignty. And I'm looking at China because um, China is the main global superpower uh, nowadays. It's also being debated in my discipline, international relation, as a challenge to anything that represents Western-led or US-led uh, order. In kind of a Cold War narrative, but I'm going to show that at least when it comes to technical internet governance, um, some more nuances need to be added. So as you can see on this slide, uh, I'll be approaching the topic um, with uh, a historical institutionalist uh, approach. And so I will be looking in longitudinal ways from uh, the foundation of ICANN up to nowadays, how the um, Chinese uh, attitudes, how Chinese they call this attitude uh, towards ICANN has changed, transformed in, in the interaction both among Chinese stakeholders and between Chinese stakeholders and ICANN itself. And I do that through a threefold data collection and uh, analysis approach. 
starting from network analysis, where I use Big Bang, which is a Python-based uh, uh, tool developed by Bentel and colleagues that allows uh, to analyze open mailing lists and um, uh, open collaborative communities more in general. Uh, I selected um, mailing lists from um, three working groups uh, within uh, ICANN. One uh, that is the uh, Chinese Generation Panel, which allows to see such actors as the China Network Information Center, the first state controlled actor in action. Uh, one that is the GNSO's working group on um, subsequent on a new GTLD subsequent procedure. Um, which allows to see private actors such as registrars and registries in action. And then another one that is the IANA Issues uh, Working Group, which allows to see the users community uh, in action. And this way I, I could compare uh, selected stake, Chinese stakeholders in their interaction within ICANN with other uh, um, actors involved within the group and check how uh, these um, uh, type of engagement they had uh, transformed in time. And then I could look at um, documents, and especially through a qualitative thematic approach, um, starting in particular from the um, uh, governmental advisory committees um, docu um, minutes uh, from the period between 2014 and 2016, uh, which is the period concerning the IANA transition. Of course, I, I had to take uh, key historical moments in my analysis when analyzing documents for the sake of parsimony and feasibility. However, uh, when looking at GAC, um, I could easily uh, see what kind of impact uh, gauge what kind of impact Chinese stakeholders, and in this case, the government as a stakeholder, uh, could have on policy outputs uh, of ICANN. Of course, indirect one, because the, the Government Advisory Committee uh, is a, an advisory body, but that, of course, is uh, the role that uh, governments maintain within uh, ICANN. And so that added up to uh, network analysis on the three aforementioned uh, types of factors. And then I followed up with 29 semi-structured expert interviews with Chinese and Western representatives of six stakeholder communities, governments, international organizations, civil society, uh, businesses, academia, and technologists, with a strong stress on technologists. Um, for those uh, who uh, studied uh, internet governance longer than I did, uh, for sure it's not surprising to involve technologists in interviews, but um, in international relations, that's uh, quite a new thing. And in the literature, I, can, I could find a lot of assumptions and conclusion made uh, without uh, much awareness of how the technological processes work. Um, and this, of course, has implication on the type of conclusions that are reached. And what I could see during the interview process is that technologists respond uh, to the same questions in qualitatively different ways compared to uh, policy experts, for example. Uh, maybe because they're not policy experts themselves, but also because they have a privileged view and an expert view on aspects that policy experts cannot gauge. So it's important to uh, put the two views uh, um, together. Can I see the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, then of course, uh, before moving to the empirical part of my uh, um, of my research, we need to look at a few um, caveats that I met throughout the um, uh, the research process. Of course, the conceptual overlapping among stakeholder communities is one, but that's embedded in uh, what internet governance looks like. Uh, then, of course, I, I found it averagely more difficult to approach uh, Chinese stakeholders for interviews, and that might be due uh, both to the authoritarian characteristics of the Chinese government, but also to the fact that um, there's a strong East versus West uh, divide uh, on such topics as uh, internet governance, uh, especially in the media. So subconsciously, uh, I, as a white European researcher, could be um, a threatening uh, inquirer. And this is connected to the next caveats they have to raise, which is the problem of digital orientalism, which is to say um, a Western bias 
in observing uh, Chinese cyber policies, whereby, according to Morozov, we as Westerners tend to see happening in uh, the Chinese cybersphere anything uh, that we don't want to see happen in our domestic one. And that's uh, a real uh, widespread, uh, simplistic and dualistic view um, of um, the Chinese cybersphere and the East versus West uh, technological competition that I'd like to reject. Uh, and then, of course, I had to address the ethical questions in network analysis, because, of course, the um, uh, mailing lists are public, but uh, when you go and analyze the actual interaction of individuals, uh, there are uh, limits to what you can and cannot do. And then, of course, there are all the unknowns on the public-private relations among Chinese actors uh, in China. After all, the big debate on uh, to what extent Huawei is actually controlled by the Communist Party is still uh, an open one. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and this is when I'd like to start talking about the uh, empirical findings uh, after having completed the methodological and uh, theoretical uh, uh, illustration. So um, this is not just to show you the history of ICANN. We're in an in internet governance conference. Probably most of you uh, already know the um, already know this date and these uh, um, moments in history. Probably even better than I do. Uh, after all, I was only five in 1998. Um, uh, however. I'd like to go through these points and see uh, what happened in terms of china icon relations at these stages. And we see that, yes, uh, ICANN was founded and the backlash um, between China and ICANN commenced very soon. We remember that China uh, was a supporter of a multilateral um, form of governance as opposed to a multi-stakeholder one. And already in 2001, China suspended its participation in ICANN um, amid the, the Taiwan question. So the way in which uh, Taiwan was allowed to participate to the governmental advisory committee. However, um, non-governmental stakeholder, even state-sponsored ones um, of China kept participating in ICANN. So there was not a fully-fledged detachment of uh, China from the ICANN uh, uh, environment. And when the UN World Summit on the Information Society fell short of replacing ICANN or even setting an agenda, or a timeline for replacing ICANN. And actually, on the contrary, it endorsed multi-stakeholderism as a uh, uh, internet governance principle. China gradually be began to come back into uh, participating in ICANN. And China was readmitted into GAC. Uh, an agreement was found on uh, referring to Taiwan as Chinese Taipei and recognizing it as a member of GAC. And when in 2012 and 2014, um, new issues of contestation against ICANN, and in particular the special role that the uh, US retained uh, in relationship to uh, ICANN uh, with the IANA contract. Um, China was part of this contestation process, but it was not um, undertaking any actions that were uh, an open boycott. Uh, of ICANN um, or lack of participation, suspension of participation, uh, that instead it undertook in the first decade of the 21st century. Instead, while uh, China was participating in Net Mundial at the governmental level, uh, it was also hosting ICANN meeting. Uh, the Beijing one from 2013 is well remembered as uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, ICANN meetings ever. In 2014, uh, the then head of the the Cyberspace Administration of China participated um, at ICANN 50 in London and openly endorsed multi-stakeholder reason. And while this is a pure rhetorical uh, exercise in, in many ways, uh, many pa interview participants familiar with ICANN recognize that throughout those years there was a strong rapprochement between China and ICANN. China began participating in, um, in, the, uh, in ICANN much more proficiently, and that does not only involve the government, but also uh, private stakeholders, such as Alibaba, which is active in, um, um, in the GNSO. However, there was no fully fledged um, upstep 
in uh, Chinese presence or influence within uh, uh, ICANN that one can expect. Actually, the profile remained quite um, low scale, low key in many, in many ways. And during the Ayana stewardship transition, China, uh, its government and its stakeholders pushed for ICANN reform rather than uh, pushing for ICANN's replacement. And so in a way, um, there was an acceptance of ICANN's existence, uh, whether by interiorizing norms or by simply accepting the status quo and the fact that Chinese stakeholders should have instead made an effort to become more influential within ICANN rather than striving uh, for uh, replacing it. So if we can go to the next slide, which is the last one, uh, I'm gonna go towards uh, conclusions. As I mentioned, the uh, Chinese stakeholders tend to have a low profile within ICANN, but they did display strong engagement in key moments. And while they were not always influential, they could create coalitions. We could see that within GAC, with the uh, Chinese government in its effort to uh, bring together um, other state actors across geopolitical lines, across traditional geopolitical lines, uh, to push back particularly particular um, proposed uh, bylaws reforms, not always successfully, actually. Uh, but still, uh, despite Chinese stakeholders have become more participatory in ICANN, uh, there still is an extent of ambiguity. Um, China is still growing stronger and stronger within uh, the United Nations um, International Telecommunication Union, uh, so a mainly multilateral body, although it's got an extent of uh, uh, multi-stakeholder and private-based participation there. But again, this is not necessarily a confrontational move according to uh, many of my um, interview participants because actually ICANN and the ITU uh, started stronger forms of collaboration more recently. So what we can see is that Chinese stakeholders uh, have grown more participatory multi-stakeholder governance, the more they grow capable of um, influencing decision-making within these bodies, and in particular ICANN in this case. And this has implication um, for the liberal international order. Uh, so I go back to the core of my uh, discipline in this case. Now, of course, these findings cannot be overgeneralized to the liberal order as a whole, but when we look at uh, regime complexes, uh, governance settings where uh, influence can be casted by different actors in different ways, in different subsects of uh, uh, the regime. Uh, in those situations where uh, scalable technologies um, involved, and this is the case of uh, the internet and any internet-enabled technology when it comes to um, having economic profits, the need for uh, global scale economies is uh, one that is perceived by uh, pretty much every company. Um, these findings can be general generalized uh, or better transferred to these um, uh, settings. And we can see that the challenge of China to internet governance, and if we want the liberal international law, the more at large, is a more nuanced one whereby, uh, yes, there are extent of, com uh, of contestation. Yes, China and, um, um, has a, a strong control on its uh, co domestic uh, contents, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, all aspects that fall outside the scope of my paper. But in many other governance settings, the Chinese stakeholders are just increasingly participatory. The more they see they can carry that weight and influence decision-making within uh, the given um, regime setting. So this is all from me. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to listen to your comments and questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Ricardo. And as somebody who is active at ICANN, I must admit this presentation is very dear to my heart and I will have some questions uh, to you perhaps later, depending on how many we will have here. Um, and we will continue zooming out of China and zooming in to another great power, Russia, with Alek Shakira from PR Center, who is going to talk about decoding Russia's quasi-attributions on cyber attacks. So here we are to another narratives. Um, welcome, Oleg, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, and uh, thank you uh, to the organizers and my friend, fellow, fellow panelists. I remember fondly the conference of uh, 2019, and uh, uh, I'm glad that 
I was honored to participate this time, even though it's only uh, on Zoom. So, uh, and also I, I'm, I'm uh, thankful to, um, I'm thankful to the organizers for supporting this uh, nebulous and weird idea of uh, quasi attribution. Uh, so let's uh, get started. Uh, first slide. Uh, so I, I think I will not speak for uh, too long. I will try not to because my my, my presentation is pretty straightforward. Uh, so first I will. Uh, so in general, I will speak about what Russia thinks about uh, attribution of cyber incidents and whether Russia does uh, such attribution or something uh, different on its own. Uh, Russia, of course, has been very critical of uh, situations where it was accused of uh, committing some kind of wrongful act in cyberspace. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if, you're, if you live in Russia, you know that uh, particular states are uh, blamed or associated with cyber threats in Russia as well. So uh, even if Russia is opposed to cyber attribution, it doesn't mean that uh, Russian officials do not uh, blame or uh, identify particular countries as uh, sources of, of threats. Uh, and, and so I, I was thinking about it for a while and I decided to frame it as a quasi attribution. Uh, so why quasi? First of all, because Russia has this negative attitude towards uh, cyber attribution as practiced by the United States and uh, the West generally, uh, but also because Russia does something uh, in its own right, uh, but maybe not exactly attribution. Um, so our first uh, section will be on uh, what's wrong with attribution from Russian, um, from the Russian perspective. So Russia has been very quite quite critical of uh, attribution in cyberspace. Uh, it has uh, these long-standing ideas that uh, there are some unique features of this uh, new domain that make it difficult to apply uh, traditional uh, international law and other uh, other types of norms. Uh, but of course, Russia has become even more critical recently uh, when it increasingly became target of these attacks. So to, to better understand and conceptualize um, what's wrong for, with attribution from a Russian perspective, I decided to um, dig deeper and uh, identify four uh, independent but related uh, points of criticism. So first, uh, attribution is difficult. Uh, second, it lacks uh, legal basis. Uh, third, it's uh, as it's practiced now, it is politicized. And finally, it is dangerous. Uh, I'm not uh, sure how much uh, everyone of you is familiar with this notion. So we'll go uh, uh, with them one after another. So let's start with uh, why it's difficult. Um, next slide. So we have nice portraits of, uh, uh, of Vladimir Putin and other uh, key policymakers uh, involved in cyber policy. Uh, so. Uh, Vladimir Putin said uh, uh, famously in 2017, he compared hackers to artists, but another part of his uh, uh, statement was uh, that he said that it was uh, pretty easy uh, to simulate as if someone was uh, conducting an attack as if, as if it was if it was Russian. So this idea that uh, simulating uh, someone's behavior, uh, and that's why uh, obfuscating one's own behavior is uh, deep uh, rooted in, into Russian kind of policymakers' psyche. Uh, another quote from uh, Andrei Kruskik and Anatoly Stritsov from 2014, where they uh, basically argue that because of uh, anonymity of information communication technologies, uh, it is difficult to identify the aggressor, and this can lead to, to all kinds of uh, difficulties in uh, terms of applying international law. So this this notion, it's not sometimes it goes without saying in Russian uh, statements and even academic articles, uh, but it's it's really the core of uh, Russian skepticism about uh, attribution. Uh, so uh, next slide. Uh, consequently. Uh, this difficulty of uh, identifying what happens in cyberspace uh, is, is further complicated by uh, the lack of proper legal basis. Uh, this, uh, this lack of uh, legal norms can be resolved domestically, which all different countries do, but internationally Russia has, has long been uh, an advocate for uh, a separate uh, 
legal legally binding document on uh, international information security on uh, cybercrime, and uh, it, it ultimately believes that uh, current norms are not sufficient, and even those that are, are sufficient, uh, no one really knows how uh, we should apply them, or uh, no one applies them consistently. So there are many legal problems, and they complicate it, uh, complicate uh, this whole uh, attribution business. Uh, at the same time, uh, Russia believes that uh, there has been some progress made already at, at the international level. Uh, uh, in particular, the uh, reports of the uh, groups of governmental experts, and in particular, the 2015 report. So the, uh, the 2015 report, uh, it uh, mentions that, uh, well, it has, it has a, a separate norm on attribution, but it also mentions that all accusations should, should be subst uh, substantiated. And this is uh, one thing that Russia always uh, highlights it uh, during the OEWG process. Uh, Russia said that uh, um, negotiators should not overstep uh, this, uh, this norm and should not include something into the document that has not been agreed uh, prior. Uh, next. So we have uh, two components. So it's difficult. It is not legally uh, well-defined. Also, because because of this uh, situation now, uh, attribution as it's as it's practiced by by Western state, states, it's politicized. Uh, so this, in simple terms, this means that uh, Western states can, uh, because of lack of poli uh, difficulty of uh, checking who 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 has done something uh, in cyberspace, and because of uh, lack of proper legal basis. Uh, states can do uh, can attribute cyber attacks arbitrarily, uh, and this is basically what Russian uh, policymakers argue. Uh, so um, you see here a quote from Ali Khramov, who is the uh, deputy secretary of the Russian Security Council, and uh, he he was uh, quite critical of the naming and shaming approach as practiced by the United States, and uh, he suggested that. Uh, um, uh, Basically, everything was determined by political context, and if uh, the United States and its allies saw someone as a as an opponent, they could uh, uh, just arbitrarily attribute cyber attacks to them. And of course, logically, this leads us to the fifth point, uh, which is uh, attribution is dangerous. Uh, so on this slide, you see Valery Gerasimov, uh, who is uh, uh, chairman of the uh, joint uh, of the uh, is the chief of staff, and uh, he he mentioned at the conference in 2017 that uh, the uh, the application of uh, Article Five of NATO to cyberspace creates this problem that you can well NATO in Russian uh, uh, fears can uh, arbitrarily assign blame for a cyber attack and then use it to justify some kind of retaliation, including by the use of force. Uh, and so um, all these like four components uh, are linked. Uh, so because it's technically difficult to identify who was uh, who had, has done something and there is no legal basis, uh, people can uh, manipulate these accusations for political purposes. And uh, in the worst case scenario, this can lead to uh, some uh, dangerous outcome. So this is what uh, Russian Russian views are. They are not uh, formulated in one single document. They are sort of distributed views on uh, attribution. Uh, but what about Russia's own uh, approach to uh, to attribution? Does Russia actually do this? Uh, next slide. So Russia does not uh, do the uh, attribution. There is no kind of official attribution policy. The term is not. Uh, Officially used by policymakers, it's used by private sector companies, but it's not used by policymakers, and it's only used to refer to these Western actions. Uh, at the same time, we can see that in some statements by Russian government uh, representatives, uh, they they contain some kind of information about foreign threats, and sometimes uh, these officials even name foreign countries as uh, not as perpetrators of attacks, but as sources of threats. Um, and these these statements might include. Um, some particular uh, situations, for example, a, a particular attack, but they also may be more uh, general. So that's why I use this term quasi-attribution kind of very loosely. Uh, it includes 
all well not all but many statements that uh, somehow uh, a science attribute some kind of uh, cyber uh, behavior to a foreign uh, power to a foreign entity or something uh, to study this uh, I, I combined a small data set not the data set really but a spreadsheet of several uh, instances where we can see such attribution practice next slide so these are this is the type of, of slides that you should not have on on your uh, on your presentation because it's too small. Uh, but basically, I have here uh, ten uh, examples of such attribution statements or like situations where Russian officials said something about uh, uh, foreign powers, uh, where they either named a particular state or groups of states. Um, or when they named a, a particular foreign entity. Um, so we'll not go uh, through all of them, but we'll look at uh, three uh, cases. Next slide. So for example, in uh, 2016, there was a um, probably the most kind of vocal statement by, by the Russian authorities. Uh, the Federal Security Service, the FSB, uh, issued a statement in early December, saying that uh, it's received information about preparation of some com uh, some upcoming uh, cyber attacks by foreign special services uh, that uh, would destabilize Russian financial system, and uh, uh, the the statement further read that uh, the investigation discovered that uh, servers and command centers for cyber attacks were located in the Netherlands and belonged to to a Ukrainian hosting company. Uh, so this was uh, this was not uh, an attribution statement in this uh, uh, kind of Western understanding, but it was what I refer to some kind of uh, some kind of attribution, quasi attribution. Uh, and uh, we we actually we had some follow up from the statement. We had uh, reactions from the Dutch Ministry of Security and Justice. Uh, we had a statement from this Ukrainian hosting company, um, but uh, of course it was there, there were no attacks. Uh, as far as we know, and uh, maybe this this kind of attribution help. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the second case. Uh, so this is a more more recent example. Uh, it's a study published by the uh, National Coordination Center for uh, so basically Russian National uh, Search is called uh, in Russian N C I R double C in English, and the Ross Telecom. Ross Telecom Solar uh, is a cybersecurity company. So they published the joint report, which is kind of a technical report about a series of large-scale attacks on Russian government agencies. Uh, the report is technical, does not uh, include any attribution uh, statements. Uh, but the representative of Russian third, uh, Deputy Head uh, Morashov, when he was commenting uh, on this in the, in the press release, uh, he said uh, there is a long statement, but he said that judging by the uh, characteristics of this attack, we have reasons to believe that this group has the resources of, of a foreign intelligence service. Uh, and of course, uh, several weeks later, there was a, a follow-up report by Sentinel-1, which uh, actually uh, used, used this, this information and uh, suggested that uh, the actors behind these attacks were uh, were Chinese uh, and not Western, unlike uh, what some someone believed originally. Uh, so this I also classify as quasi uh, attribution. So basically attributing some kind of uh, cyber, cyber threat to to a foreign uh, entity. Uh, and uh, the third case that we look at, um, it's uh, very recent. It's from September this year. Uh, we had uh, Duma elections, elections to the Russian Parliament. Uh, elections took place uh, for three days, and uh, during all three days, uh, we had statements from different agencies, from the Ministry of Digital Development, uh, from the Central Electoral Commission, uh, from some uh, information security companies, uh, from um, kind of civic minders, uh, and they all said that there were massive uh, DDoS attacks that aimed to disrupt uh, different types of electoral infrastructure, including electronic voting system. What's interesting is that in many of these statements, and uh, it's difficult to verify uh, which of them were separate and which of them were kind of coming from the same source, uh, but it was uh, it was mentioned many times uh, that 50% um, of IPs used in attacks were from the United States. And of course, this is, might not be something very interesting 
uh, when it comes to to DDoS attacks because uh, they can uh, well basically requests can can come from uh, thousands and thousands of IPs. Uh, but this notion that um, half of uh, half of these kind of malicious activities were coming from the United States became a central uh, point in this whole story. So Russian ambassador in Washington actually informed the White House about this and uh, requested some kind of uh, reaction from uh, from the United States. Uh, senior Russian security officials, such as former uh, President uh, Dmitry Medvedev and uh, Secretary of the Security Council, uh, Nikolai Patrushev, they uh, reiterated this uh, notion that 50% of, of attacks on uh, Russian elections were coming from the United States. Uh, and so they kept this kind of narrative going. So even though Russian uh, agencies did not blame the United States for conducting these attacks, the idea that the United States was kind of the source of threats uh, became uh, very prominent. Uh, and also interestingly and quite uh, randomly, Russian uh, speaker of the upper chamber uh, when asked about uh, the possibility of sanctions, uh, she said she did not include sanctions in response uh, to, to, to such attacks if there, there were sufficient grounds. So, of course, in practical terms, this uh, doesn't mean anything, but it was uh, quite an interesting development because uh, Russia, of course, is quite critical of not only of attribution, but also of uh, these uh, sanctions that are imposed against Russia for uh, cyber activities. So it would be... Uh, a, a break if uh, Russia actually decided to impose some kind of uh, measures in response to uh, to these activities. Uh, yeah, so let's, uh, as, as we move closer, closer to the end, let's uh, uh, move to the next slide. And uh, let me share with you some, uh, some general insights. So uh, if you look at all these 10 examples, uh, we can see a strong emphasis on territoriality. So Russia, uh, most statements, uh, refer to attacks from the territory of, of foreign states rather than by uh, the, those states. So basically, Russia officially says that uh, we see these attacks, we do not attribute it to, to your government, but uh, you are responsible for doing something about it. Uh, also, we see that there are multiple agencies in Russia that issue uh, these quasi-attribution statements uh, but uh, all statements were a foreign actor, namely some unidentified foreign uh, uh, intelligence is mentioned, uh, coming from the FSB or the Russian CERT, which is also part of the FSB. Uh, most of these statements, they uh, include few details, uh, at least publicly. Uh, the, the report that I mentioned, uh, produced by Rostelecom and uh, the Russian CERT, is probably an exception because it's quite detailed, it, it's a uh, technical report, uh, unlike uh, many other kind of quasi-attribution statements that I analyzed. And uh, follow-up measures uh, from what we know include uh, improved defenses, because sometimes Russian officials would say that uh, we discovered this and we did that to better protect elections next time. Or they might include some diplomatic action, like we've seen with the recent elections where Russia notified the White House and expected some kind of... Uh, action from the United States. And next slide. Uh, so there are at least three motives in my mind for this uh, quasi-attribution. Uh, so first is kind of more uh, natural is to mitigate these attacks. And actually, uh, this is most uh, uh, clear from the activities of, Ra of the Russian third. Uh, so it, in addition to these statements, to these public statements where uh, representatives of this uh, agency name particular countries for being responsible for most attacks. Uh, they also routinely send uh, requests to foreign states, and these are not uh, public, uh, but in its reports, uh, the CERT uh, announces that it's, it sends uh, on average 50 requests, requests a week uh, to 10, 15 states. And uh, I counted that uh, in 40 months uh, since uh, August last year, it sent uh, 3.6 3. thousand requests to, to different countries. Uh, so the second motive is to demonstrate capabilities. Uh, so for, first, it's a signal to other states. And uh, the example that I gave with the report uh, where Rostelecom and uh, the third uh, started some kind of um, espionage campaign against uh, government bodies, it was clearly uh, designed to be a message to, to this foreign power that was 
allegedly involved. But also, in a way, uh, and I don't think it's a stretch, uh, it's a it's an effort to prove itself uh, a capable institution domestically because uh, the CERT was created um, relatively recently. And so I, I think it has to also de demonstrate that it can do work um, uh, on, on par with the other organizations that are responsible for national security. And of course, uh, there is a big component about shaping public perceptions. Uh, uh, so internationally, but primarily domestically, these statements are aimed at identifying particular states as sources of threats. So again, this does not uh, uh, appear like a, an attempt to identify the United States as a uh, culprit of all these uh, attacks, uh, but uh, identify it as a source of uh, some kind of dangerous and malicious uh, behavior in cyberspace. Uh, so let's, uh, let's move uh, to the next slide and then to the next slide. Um, and uh, another slide, yeah. So uh, here I have some some speculative thoughts about how what impact, what ideas this might have for uh, international discussions on cybersecurity. Um, I would just quickly name a few. So I think the 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 Russian example illustrates that although Russia is opposed to uh, cyber attribution, it of course also has the same interest of uh, knowing what is happening in cyberspace, and so there is a lot of um potential uh, value in having some sort some types of discussions about uh, approaches of different states i, I realized that it's uh, complicated because uh, we are living in this kind of uh, competitive moment and uh, there is definitely a lack of trust but it's something that uh, should should be states should consider doing i also believe that uh, uh, states should ensure uh, greater transparency regarding uh, routine requests that they uh, receive and proceed like those that I mentioned, uh, uh, Russian sort sends to, to multiple states every week. Uh, Russia has not decide, has not yet fully opted for uh, uh, kind of multilateral attribution, but it has hinted several times that uh, this is something that it is interested in. But anyways, the, there is a, definitely a, a moral uh, to be to be played for some kind of cooperative model of attribution. Because right now uh, we are in this situation where we have a group of like-minded states who attribute uh, cyber attacks themselves, and they are not really interested in, in what other kind of less, less friendly states think. Uh, but uh, it, it bears to think uh, whether uh, states can do uh, something cooperatively despite these uh, fault lines. Um, and of course, I believe it would be helpful if states could assess current practice of attribution, be it uh, Russian quasi-attribution or Western attribution against UN cyber norms, in particular against the normal attribution, and see whether it fares, fares well or whether something could be improved. Uh, anyway, um, these are just some thoughts on this topic, and I hope uh, you, you, some of you find it useful, and I will be happy to continue the conversation. And I would like to return the floor to uh, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Oleg. Um, great presentation. So moving from quasi-attribution, zooming out from Russia, to quasi-nemesis, if I may say, or real one, attribution in the US. Uh, Jun Lee, please, you have the floor. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Tatiana. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for having me here today. My name is June Lee, and it's wonderful to be in person at a conference after so long. Um, continuing on our thread of attribution, uh, my presentation is titled Public Attribution as Source of Cyber Norms, an Empirical Study of U.S. State Practice. Great. So the recent flurry of um, state governments involved in publicly attributing cyber incidents to nation states, for instance, the SolarWinds hack to Russia or the Microsoft Exchange hack to China, uh, have drawn increasing attention to the state practice. Uh, yet much of the academic discussion has been largely theoretical or based on a few case studies. Um, 
In my research, which draws from work from my undergrad thesis, I sought to bring an empirical foundation to this discussion and really hone in on government decision-making processes underlying US state action. Um, so my research asked three main questions. Uh, first, how does the US government conduct public attribution? Uh, second, when and under what circumstances does the US publicly attribute cyber intrusions to other states? Uh, and third, perhaps most relevant for our conversation today, uh, what's the relationship between public attribution and international norms? Great, so in today's presentation, I'll start off with a couple definitions, uh, including what I call the four channels of public attribution by the US government. Uh, I'll then provide an overview of my methodology and original data set. Uh, I'll review some of my uh, main data findings, uh, including some systematic trends I found in how the US government does implement public attribution. Um, at the end, I'll discuss um, the relationship between public attribution and norms and implications of my empirical work uh, for normative development. Great. So Buchanan and Ridd define attribution as determining who or what is responsible for an act. Uh, this question is present in all domains, uh, but particularly interesting in cyber due to the potential anonymity uh, afforded by the internet. Attribution can be split into two processes an analytic process, or the technical forensic means of determining the responsible actor, uh, and a strategic process, or how to communicate this attribution finding. Um, and strategic attribution can occur publicly, privately, or not at all. Um, and I focus on public attribution, um, which inherently involves a trade-off between uh, disclosing the responsible adversary, uh, but also revealing sensitive intelligence sources and methods. Attribution can be made at multiple levels, but I also focus on attribution specifically to a nation state, uh, which has implications for international relations. And finally, I focus on attribution by the US government, uh, which is the most active player in this space, uh, perhaps unlike Russia's quasi-attribution, um, and has the greatest documentation of process. Uh, great. So an early observation I had in compiling my data set was that the U.S. does not publicly attribute through a unified process. Um, public attribution can occur through many different means of publicity involving different agencies, audiences, and purposes. And so for this paper, I defined four channels through which this occurs, which encompass the primary means of public attribution in the U.S. Uh, this is technical, criminal, official policy, and unofficial policy. Um, so the technical channel involves technical alerts, and these are released by the Department of Homeland Security's CISA and FBI. Um, alerts typically aim to disclose technical details needed to patch vulnerabilities uh, or support network operators in identifying future incidents. Um, in this context, public attribution helps to under, um, underscore the severity of a particular incident uh, and really support network defense. Uh, an example seen here is the 2018 technical alert for North Korea's fast cash campaign. Uh, which targeted ATMs around the world. Um, second channel uh, is criminal channel, and this involves kind of indictments and criminal complaints released by the Justice Department and FBI. Uh, the goal of this channel is to bring a criminal case against individual hackers affiliated with a nation state, um, and these indictments must stand in domestic court of law. And the example seen here, often referenced in the literature, is the 2014 indictment of five Chinese PLA hackers uh, for extensive cyber espionage. Um, the third channel is the official policy channel. Um, this involves official policy statements, such as public remarks uh, and press releases uh, issued by senior officials. Um, and the goal of this channel, I found, was to publicly reveal the state adversary uh, responsible for cyber intrusion. Um, and these statements are sometimes accompanied by sanctions or the announcement of a new strategy. Um, and I intentionally called it a policy channel uh, to distinguish it from the criminal legal proceedings or the technical alerts. I'm happy to go into that more on the questions. Uh, an example is this 2018 op-ed and press briefing by Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert, uh, attributing the WannaCry ransomware to North Korea. Um, and the last channel is the unofficial policy channel. Um, and this involves leaks by unnamed officials, typically in major news outlets. Uh, the goal here is to shape the public narrative around a cyber incident uh, when the, the discourse is classified or the government can't speak officially. Um, and this channel is typically not included in the literature on public attribution, uh, but I found it to be the most common means through which the US government communicates its attributions publicly. Uh, moreover, these leaks are often treated uh, in the press as a channel of government communication, and I therefore included it in my study. 
Uh, an example is the 2017 Washington Post article uh, in which unnamed US officials attributed um, the Olympic destroyer um, attack or the hack of the Pyeongchang Olympics to Russia. Um, so for my research, I compiled an original data set of public attributions uh, by USG actors to a nation state from 2010 to 2020. Um, so to do so, I consulted publications by the previously mentioned government agencies, as well as news reports. Uh, for each incident, I tracked a number of variables, um, including the state subject of attribution, um, the type of incident, and the timing of attribution. Uh, timing measured from the date of first public disclosure of the incident uh, to the first public attribution by the USG. Um, and I also conducted 11 interviews with former government officials and private sector security experts. Um, so uh, overall, my data set included 42 public attributions um, by the US of cyber incidents to states in this period. The attributions targeted four states, uh, perhaps not a surprise, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. Um, the timing ranged from zero days to seven years after uh, public disclosure. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about my methodology at the end, uh, but one of the most striking observations from compiling this data set was that these four channels not only provide a descriptive taxonomy of public attribution, uh, but they really highlighted some interesting trends in how the US actually implements public attribution. Uh, and I'll walk through some of the main ones today. Uh, so first, the timing of public attribution uh, seemed to vary systematically by channel. Um, so this box plot shows the distribution of attribution timings by channel. I don't know how well you can see it, but what's important to note is that the median timing marked by these black arrows uh, varies significantly across channels, uh, with unofficial statements occurring 11 days after public disclosure of an incident, uh, and criminal channels taking uh, over two and a half years. Uh, and this variation in timing is likely influenced by the procedural requirements of each channel. Uh, criminal charges and technical alerts uh, depend heavily on collection and disclosure of potentially uh, sensitive evidence, um, disclosure which requires an extensive bureaucratic process. And this is not the case for unofficial or official statements. Uh, second, I found that the state subject of attribution also appeared to vary systematically by channel. Um, so looking at each channel in turn, you'll see that the criminal channel, so indictments, primarily targeted um, Chinese and Iranian activity. Uh, technical, the technical alerts uh, disproportionately targeted North Korean cyber activity uh, and some Russian activity. Uh, looking at the unofficial leaks, you'll see that the majority of them targeted uh, Russian activity and some for the other states. Uh, and drawing from interviews and some case studies as well, I found that uh, channel-specific initiatives and organizational factors uh, appear to have some influence on this consistency. Uh, so for instance, a lot of the, um, all of the indictments targeting Chinese cyber activity uh, were part of the Justice Department's broader China initiative, uh, which in intended to combat uh, perceived national security threats like IP theft, espionage from the state. Uh, similarly, all the technical alerts focused on North Korea were part of DHS's broader, uh, broader monitoring of North Korean cyber criminal activity under the moniker of Hidden Cobra. So to further examine the effects of each channel, uh, I conducted two case studies, uh, and I'll quickly walk through one today. Uh, so Operation Ababil was a series of DDoS attacks on US banks and financial institutions uh, launched by a group of hackers called the Cyber Fighters of Izzad and Al-Qassam. And within days of the campaign beginning, and with widespread media reporting on potential uh, Iranian state involvement, uh, USG officials leaked to the press that Tehran was responsible for the attacks. And this occurred on three separate occasions uh, while the campaign was still ongoing. Now, public attribution through an official channel uh, took place more than three years later, uh, when the Justice Department and FBI released a criminal indictment uh, charging seven government-affiliated Iranian hackers for the cyber campaign. Um, and I elaborate on the process and timing behind uh, this public attribution process in my paper, uh, but I found that um, at the end of the day, more than geopolitical context, uh, the Justice Department's uh, organizational commitment to prosecuting cybercrime really drove the USG's decision to speak publicly on the incident. Uh, at the same time, uh, the DOJ's internal process of collecting evidence needed to bring a criminal indictment uh, really shaped the process and ultimate timing uh, of public attribution by the US. 
And across my data set and in my interviews, I kept coming back to this uh, observation that internal processes and organizational logic specific to the attributing channel have a significant influence on when and under what circumstances uh, the USG publicly attributes cyber incidents. Um, so shifting the conversation into international norms, uh, there has been some discussion, already some today as well, about how public attribution could contribute to the development of international norms in cyberspace. Uh, states have been hesitant to reference specific international norms violated in public attribution statements, um, suggesting some reluctance to crystallize norms that could constrain their own activity. Um, yet there are, uh, the literature does speak to a couple ways that public attribution uh, is relevant here, and I'll point to three mechanisms. Uh, first, public attribution can signal one's interpretation of the rules of the game. Uh, in a domain where most conduct is covert, a public attribution of specific cyber operations to a state can help to formalize ideas on permissible state conduct in cyberspace, uh, shaping the normative and operational environment of future activities. Uh, second, public attribution, especially when it carries the threat of force, uh, could shape states' likelihood of engaging such conduct in the future um, by influencing states' habits and repeated behavior, uh, both of which are constituent elements in the formation of norms. Uh, and third, public attribution, especially when issued collectively, uh, can build diplomatic support for norms of behavior. Uh, and this can really translate to more formal norm bodies, such as the UNGG or OEWG. Um, so to bring in my earlier discussion, I propose uh, three ways that the four channels and the accompanying trends identified in public attribution are, re are relevant for a normative development. Um, and I'll caveat these are more speculative and I invite you know, questions and further uh, research into these fields. Um, but first, uh, public, the channel of public attribution really shapes the purpose of this act. Uh, and some channels have a more explicit purpose of shaping the normative environment uh, and may be better suited to this purpose. Um, former, so former U.S. Assistant Attorney General John Carlin noted that the U.S., in the case of the criminal channel, should only pursue indictments uh, anytime an adversary violates a norm uh, that we want to defend. And similarly, similarly, because criminal indictments are backed by this collection of evidence, uh, this could support clarification of norms going forwards. Uh, in a similar vein, official policy statements are the most common and highest profile means of collective attribution, uh, which could indicate broader acceptance of underlying norms and really support the normative uh, development. Uh, second has to do with those trends in timing I, I mentioned. Uh, while many factors influence how responsible states uh, interpret public attributions, uh, more rapid public attribution could carry more weight in shaping international norms, as it sends a very targeted message to the adversary and third party on the appropriateness of particular conduct. Uh, it could also signal the advanced nature of an attributing state's technical capabilities and political will to respond to similar attacks. Uh, and finally, coming to that consistency in the state subject of attribution, uh, consistent targeting of particular state's cyber conduct, uh, even if it arises from channel-specific organizational factors, uh, could create the perception of politicization of public attribution. Right? And this could influence the degree to which other states are willing to back U.S. public attributions, uh, undercutting the value of such statements as a means of dip building diplomatic support uh, and contributing to the long-term development of norms. So uh, in closing, I'll leave you with kind of three final thoughts. Uh, the channel of publicity really matters for the purpose, timing, and state subject of USG public attribution. Uh, and this cha the channel used could influence the efficacy of public attribution as a source of cyber norms. And finally, uh, future research uh, should highlight how and under what circumstances public attribution contributes to normative development. Um, so thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, June. And uh, I will open the floor for questions. I will see, uh, I see already that we have some questions online, so I will start with our online participants, if I may, and then I will open the floor um, for your questions in the room. So, um, Stefan is asking a question to Oleg. Oleg, did the release of the Sentinel-1 research lead to renewed discussion within Russia on the Ross Telecom report and <coughs> Russia-China relations? 
Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Stefan. Uh, good question. Um, so it was the, the Sentinel One report was noted, and it was reported by uh, by Russian by Kommersant, which is Russian uh, one of leading media in Russia. So it was, uh, I think, it was well read. Um, I've seen a couple of mentions of this story, and uh, there was kind of general discussion, but it it did not lead to any kind of uh, major. Uh, reassessment of this situation, and uh, there, there was no, as far as you know, there was no public reaction from either uh, Rostericom or uh, the third. Thank you very much. And are there any questions here in the audience? Please raise your hand if you have one. Um, well, I will leave you some. Yeah, so uh, please, and if I may ask you to state your name before you ask the question, because we have the online participants who would probably be interested in hearing who is asking the question, as they cannot see you properly. Okay. Um, hi, my name is uh, Dennis Bullers. Um, uh, I work at the Hague Program for Cyber Norms. Um, I, I have a number of questions, but I was hoping to have a little more time to sort them out. Um, so. So maybe maybe one question uh, to to Misha first. Um, you spoke of um, uh, the the element of consistency, right? So so the importance of consistency in in these these processes. <coughs> and that's interesting, right? Because often we see, for example, uh, we see uh, uh, consistency can put you on your on your back foot because we saw Russia is often not seen as a very consistent actor. Uh, Donald Trump was anything but a consistent actor. Now you have. Biden stepping into into a legacy of, of inconsistency, where the expectation is that he will be consistent, right? So, so how does that play out in in the in the dynamics there? Um, a question also uh, to uh, to Jun Li. Um, uh, you spoke of um, so the official cha so the unofficial challenge uh, channels and the official channels. They are. The fastest, right? If, if I uh, presume in terms of timing, mm -hmm. uh, what was interesting to me is what you always hear in in the discussion about attribution is that attribution is built in layers, right? You have the technical attribution, mm -hmm. and that builds towards a political attribution. So it was kind of interesting to see that the technical attribution takes a long time mm -hmm. to come out, mm -hmm. um, uh, not as long as the criminal attribution, but at least a long time. Mm -hmm. So in a sense. There's two possibilities, right? So either the political process is is getting ahead of the technical process, or they have the technical process, but they're not ready to to uh, flesh it out yet. But in in either case, it points to one of the Russian questions about okay, what is the evidence base for these kind of accusations? Mm -hmm. um, another one is you said um, the goal of the criminal uh, criminal attribution is to bring a criminal case up, to bring a criminal court case. I think that is actually widely disputed, right? So, so the, the criminal cases are very much signaling, uh, they're pointing towards uh, uh, countries, um, even though the criminal indictments are obviously uh, related to, to individuals or entities. Um, but it is, it is naming and shaming, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's finger wagging, it's not actually, uh, um, uh, there is, often no real expectation, I suspect, that we will actually have a court case against mm -hmm. these uh, certain individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then Oleg, um, um, it's, it's really interesting, the presentation is really interesting, and I'm really interested in the idea of quasi-attribution. Um, uh, and I was wondering um, where you sort of, you sketch the development where this, this quasi-attribution is, is coming on, right? So it's, it's something that's happening now. Um, and again, this is sort of a question about uh, uh, consistency. Yeah? So on the one hand, uh, Russian is very vocal about all the pitfalls of attribution. On the other hand, it's starting to do this. Uh, what is the what is the, the the rationale behind it? Is it mostly domestically oriented? Is it more internationally oriented? What is their uh, what is their rationale behind it? What do they want out of this? Right. So we're still going to this route of quasi -att attribution. What do they hope to gain from this? Thank you very much, Dennis. And let's start with Misha because first question was for Misha. So Misha, the floor is yours, and then June, and then Oleg. Yeah, thank you very much, Dennis, for, for this question. It's an interesting question. And to me, it's rather, um, the jury is still out uh, under what conditions consistency matters or not. I mean, 
Uh, and Trump might be a good example. I mean, in some ways, I think Trump was quite consistent, for example, quite consistent in saying that democratic norms doesn't really matter for him. So, I mean, you know, so uh, it depends what, what was his prime audience and what are the values of his prime audience. And this also extends to the international uh, arena and when we talk about uh, international cybersecurity. Um, I think inconsistency can be a weakness that can be exploited via counter narratives, for example. Um, but um, it's an open question under what circumstances. Um, what's also important, I think, is that in the case of the Biden administration, um, this sort of benchmark or this sort of expectation that now that it's time for more consistent um, cybersecurity policy was established by um, Biden himself, so to speak. Uh, so that's what, what I meant with showing in this example that actually uh, there was this original narrative coming out from the incoming Biden administration that now we're going to have a more consistent Russia policy. And this created this kind of expectations. And only after this, um, acting inconsistently becomes a source of potential weakness, yeah. right? So this is a kind of uh, self-inflicted yeah. weakness. Um, but it doesn't have to be, of course. Thank you, June. Great, yeah, thank you for your questions, Dennis. So I'll take them uh, one by one. So first, the uh, layers of attribution point. I think, that, I think that's a really good point. And that's something I'll note is that the public attribution in different agencies, what I've observed, tends to be a parallel process, right? So at the same time that Homeland Security is doing the technical analysis of what's going on, um, the intelligence community or you know NSC, they're all trying to assess, you know, as soon as incident occurs, who is responsible, what's going on. And you're right that technical and you could say strategic attribution are ways of thinking of reaching this attribution finding as well. Um, I will say that uh, the fact that official policy statements occur more quickly than technical alerts does not suggest a uh, blanket that attribution is politicized because those official policy statements, they don't disclose the evidence, but that doesn't mean that they aren't backed by the evidence, right? So something, uh, I think, an often common criticism by Russia and China that uh, does need to be heeded. Uh, for your point about the criminal channel as a tool of signaling, I think that is uh, correct, right? So. There's controversy about the idea of public attributions naming and shaming, right? Does simply pointing the finger, does that have any kind of punitive value? Um, and I think, uh, I, would, I would say no, and I think that's where the criminal channel is really important, because even if there isn't any kind of extradition of the foreign hackers, the fact that it is a criminal channel, it carries both a, a punitive and a communicative function, as Timar, uh, he wrote. Um, and you know, because of that, that contributes to that signal. Um, and not only that, but I think um, this, uh, further advances the idea that criminal indictments can be used as a means of shaping that normative environment, right? Because it's giving, not only pointing the finger, but it's also giving a value judgment that, you know, we think that a punishment should be assigned to this conduct. Uh, in that sense, the use of a criminal indictment uh, enhances that signal. Yeah. Thank you very much, June. And Oleg, uh, you're the next. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for your uh, interest and for your questions, Dennis. Uh, so I have a uh, Few thoughts. So first, I uh, just want to uh, highlight from the beginning that this is not uh, in any way an official term. Uh, this is something that uh, I, I kind of came up with. Uh, so I think it's fair to, to call this practice uh, quasi-attribution. Uh, I think from from the beginning, my my uh, hypothesis was that there would be more kind of inconsistency between uh, Russian criticism of. Uh, uh, of attribution as practiced by the West and what it actually does. Uh, but uh, looking at these examples, uh, I find more consistency. So uh, in, in no example, Russia actually blamed uh, a particular foreign state uh, for, for organizing an attack. So there is always a lot of uh, ambiguity in these statements. And in uh, three statements where uh, foreign intelligence or foreign special services are mentioned, uh, no special services are mentioned. So Russia does not kind of contradict its own uh, idea that you should not uh, uh, make any accusations without providing evidence. Uh, as, as for motives, I think it's uh, it's mixed. So I have uh, I had I had this slide with uh, some some ideas. Uh, so I think uh, when we speak when we, when we talk about uh, situations like with this Ross Telecom report, um, 
it it may be that uh, foreign uh, some some kind of foreign signaling is the primary goal, and we haven't yet seen uh, too many of those. Uh, but uh, it re remains to be seen whether this is something that will be done. And I think kind of larger and more speculative question is whether uh, kind of some kind of attribution will be a feature of, uh, uh, I don't know, of great powers or just of uh, potent uh, cyber powers. So the mere fact that you, you can demonstrate that you have some awareness of what is happening in your networks and who is attacking you will be some kind of... Uh, uh, skill that that you need to have uh, to to demonstrate to others that you are kind of strong cyber power, uh, but in some other instances, uh, I think uh, domestic domestic factor is uh, more important. Uh, for instance, in all uh, examples where uh, these quasi attribution statements were done in the context of elections, I believe that uh, the the primary goal was to indicate that uh, there is some kind of malicious activity coming from abroad. So someone is trying to undermine our elections. Oh, and by the way, uh, let's let's recall when uh, these foreign powers said something about us. So turns out they are not the only one, ones who are being attacked. So we are in, in a similar situation. So it's a, it's, it's a way to indicate to, to your domestic audience and uh, to some foreign audience that uh, we have similar problems and uh, also to indicate that uh, we believe that uh, a particular group of states are uh, kind of threatening Russia. I actually have an immediate follow-up question, if I may, um, to Oleg and maybe also to Misha. Um, we know that many of Russian attribution messages are probably coming actually in Russian, right? So I want to ask, um, when you look at the attribution public messages, um, those quasi-attribution statements, as Oleg calls them, for internal audience and for external audience, are they the same? Do they use the same narrative? Do they use the same language? Do they use the same metaphors? Because when Misha was talking about Russian attribution messages, that they are richer in language somehow. I also thought about these historical coincidences. You know, the language Russians inherited from the Soviet Union, this external enemy language. So first to Oleg. Uh, Oleg, have you ever compared which messages are for internal <coughs> and for external audience, and do they differ? Yeah, thank you. I think it's an interesting question. Um, so I, I can offer you only the preliminary judgment. So from what I've seen, there are... Uh, there are no particular differences, but not all of these statements travel abroad. Uh, there are some situations where they do travel abroad. So, for example, uh, in Duma elections this this September, uh, we had uh, these statements in Russia, in Russian media, but then we had the Russian ambassador in Washington who communicated it to the White House. Similarly, maybe he lost something in translation, but in general, there was no uh, major uh, tone uh, change. So last year, there, were, there was a... Uh, vote on uh, constitutional amendments, and uh, there was a similar kind of indication of some kind of uh, DDoS attacks coming from uh, from the West. And uh, a few months later, uh, Russian uh, special representative Andrei Kursky he spoke at the um, at the OEC conference, and he repeated the same uh, figures that was that were uh, first uh, put forward by by the Central Electoral Committee. Uh, so, fr from what I observed, there is no change in uh, in the tone, but there is a change uh, in the fact that not all kind of not all messages uh, travel abroad. Uh, thank you, Oleg and Misha. Do you have anything to add from your observations? Uh, maybe. I mean, of course, I cannot. Um, or I did not really look into Russian language statements mm -hmm. because I, I looked into English language statements. So uh, they statements that obviously were intended to address an international audience. Um, and when I compare these statements, there are still, of course, different audiences and different institutional contexts. And comparing these statements across different institutional contexts, for example, uh, whether it's a press conference um, um, or, the, or whether it is um, within the UN, I think there is uh, much more consistency compared to the US case. I mean, there is variation in terms of actor characterization, but there is, in all these statements, you find a lot of uh, accusations, not attributions, not attributions of uh, particular cyber instances uh, or attacks, but accusations of overall 
overly um, aggressive NATO behavior, for example. Um, in the US case, it's much more differently, and obviously because the channels are very different, um, right? Uh, so the statements, um, for example, issued by the um, US delegation to the United Nations are very different to like when the Department of Homeland Security uh, does a press conference statement. Uh, thank you, Misha. So, oh, so, so the entire external enemy narrative versus like a bit of inconsistency uh, when different um, departments are speaking in the U.S. June, if you have anything to add, I will give you the floor. Otherwise, I will go to the questions. Yeah, yeah. I um, nothing major to add. Uh, I think I did a little bit of analysis of kind of the uh, language use, and maybe one interesting observation is that a lot of uh, there were multiple cases in which incidents were. Um, publicly attributed multiple times through unofficial channels. And I think that was the case in my uh, case study as well, I showed. Um, but what's really interesting is that the language used in each of those uh, press leaks tends to be very inconsistent, right? Some of them will refer to, you know, Tehran was responsible or Iranian affiliated cyber hackers, or there is not the same level of consistency you might expect when uh, statements are coordinated internally. And I think that speaks, um, again, to kind of the an organizational and um, like channel specific nature of public attribution. And you know, in some, some cases, for instance, like those collective attributions, those language is very important, and those are issued collectively with other states. But uh, for the most part, you know, technical doesn't always speak to criminal, doesn't always speak to you know, the White House. Uh, thank you very much. And I see uh, Monica's hand up, and then Louise Marie Hurel. So let's, let's go in this order. Thank you for those uh, fascinating presentations. Um, Monica Kaminska, I'm with the Hague Programme. Um, I have two questions, uh, one for Misha and one for June. Uh, so for Misha, um, you mentioned that these narratives take on a life of their own. Um, and I was wondering to what extent this is a consequence of policymakers still having a very limited understanding of cyber issues. And I'm thinking in particular here of, you know, SolarWinds versus Microsoft Exchange. So, you know, the, the dithering narratives going back and forth. Um, to, to what extent is that sort of, uh, you know, a limited comprehension still? Um, and then for June, I find it really fascinating um, that you said that the most frequent channel uh, is unofficial policy and leaks. And it really reminds me of the way that Israel does this, because uh, uh, Israel is very loath to um, attribute officially. Um, and often, often they go via uh, newspapers and the media. So I'm really interested in the purpose of these um, and whether these unofficial attributions are always followed up with later official attributions, how this process uh, sort of unfolds. And if they're not, um, does this actually interfere with norms processes? Uh, what happens then? Um, uh, you know, is it sort of the case that if you unofficially attribute something and then you don't officially attribute it, uh, you know, what does that say about the norms that, that, that you're promoting? Thank you. Uh, thank you. And next, uh, Louise Marie, and we have one more question here. So, Louise Marie, go ahead. Yes, um, thank you so much for this uh, amazing panel. Um, I guess I have, again, three comments, <laughs> um, but bear with me. I think the first one, um, I think it's more for Jin. Um, I was wondering whether when considering your taxonomy or you know the different layers that you call, whether you were also looking at non-state uh, attribution um, and how did that factor in into that process? Because I imagine like in the process of documenting, you might have bumped into these kinds of other uh, sources. So that is one question. The other one I really, um, I was really kind of, um, I, I was thinking about what Oleg said that cyber attribution is almost as this staging of capability in a sense uh, of what a cyber power means. So the performing of a cyber power includes having this kind of like uh, practice of cyber attribution in a very public uh, and confrontational sense. So I just kept thinking about who can actually do cyber attribution within that particular mindset. And that um, reminded me um, of an attribution that Venezuela did uh, quite recently of U the U.S. in terms of attacks um, against their critical infrastructure. And obviously, I mean, it was in English and it was in Spanish and in terms of kind of media reporting, got no attention. So I just kept thinking about this unevenness of reporting and circulation, which leads me to the third point on the unofficial policy that you mentioned also, Jung. Um, I was wondering, uh, is it more frequent 
because as Monica already hinted, is it because you're using media sources and the circulation of this information is more frequent? So I was just wondering whether you also kind of consider that element, so thank you. Uh, thank you. Louise, if you can just pass the microphone across the table, thank you. Thank you very much to a very rich presentation. I'm Raluca Cernatoni with Carnegie Europe. Um, I would have uh, three questions slash comments. <laughs> the first question is to Misha um, and the role of narratives. Um, and um, I have been focusing myself on, on um, the role of hype storytelling and narratives. And I wonder if uh, it would be interesting as well for you to look into the literature on ontological security uh, and identity building, the self other. And I think that uh, Tatiana also mentioned that in her comment, and I find that fascinating, and how these narratives and counter-narratives uh, contribute to an ontological security dilemma, actually. Um, and then uh, maybe to focus also on or unpack the role of audiences, because um, I find that uh, that this also came up in the follow-up discussions, and how certain audiences react to messaging, either domestic or foreign aud audiences. Um, then I would have a, co a question to, to June. Thank you for, for a very rich pr presentation. Uh, and and um, uh, my question is related to efficacy. And um, if uh, public attribution is exercised, for instance, by only a handful of governments, my question would be what is actually the efficacy of public attribution in a norm uh, uh, or responsible state behavior or norm building um, in, in the cyberspace em environment. And Louise actually saw my follow-up questions uh, and the role of cyber proxies and the role of the private sector in this regard. And my final uh, question will be to Ricardo. And I think that in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that you draw in your analysis on science and technology studies uh, literature. And I was wondering how does that factor in into your analysis? Thank you. I try to be fast. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess uh, we have one more question here. I'm collecting all the questions, so I hope these speakers are writing your notes and points down. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, I, I would also love to hear from Ricardo, uh, just your reflections on the Chinese version of this, right? I mean, China gets accused all the time with various degrees of proof. Uh, after Snowden and Stuxnet writes, uh, China was handed uh, proof of their own. And so, so, so is this a similar discussion? Does it play out differently? Uh, second, I, I loved seeing uh, June and Oleg uh, back to back because uh, the interaction between these two stories is really, really interesting. So, um, so a question for June first on this. Um, what did you find in the maturation of these four channels and their interaction kind of with this fifth channel that you didn't talk about of kind of the, the uh, industry attribution, which, you know, is always there in the background. Solar winds, right? Industry attribution. USG then says, oh, we basically agree with that. And then to Oleg, right? If you have this, this trend of kind of maturing U.S. attribution capability, it just really seems that both of these Russian strategies of undermining confidence in attribution and engaging in, in pseudo-attribution uh, are kind of responses to this. Um, and, and, and in particular, you know, uh, June mentioned the Olympic destroyer uh, um, uh, op. And that one's fascinating because you've got Putin saying out loud, well, you never know who it could be. You can't attribute to Russia. And then you've got this GRU op, which is exquisitely engineered to look like it's coming from somewhere else, as if to say, hey, guys, you do not know what you're doing. Your, your technical attribution is totally out to lunch. But now we know that, right? And it kind of undermines the credibility of that entire approach. So again, the interaction and, and maturation of both of these is really, really fascinating. So Oleg, I'd be really curious to see, you know, um, you know do, you, do you kind of agree with that? Do you see this really as kind of a reaction to improving technical capabilities on the US side? Uh, thank you very much. And um, I would actually like to start with Ricardo here. Uh, Ricardo, the floor is yours for your questions. Thank you, and thanks for the questions as well. Um, may I ask to, um, the last speaker to repeat the question to me? Because I'm afraid maybe it was connection, but I lost the first bit. One moment, we are going to organize this, please. Oh, mine was easy. I just wanted to hear your reflection on kind of the Chinese version of the counter-attribution story. 
Right, okay. Um, so I haven't done much research on that, uh, and that's because I haven't quite studied um, cybersecurity. I'm more on the internet governance side um, of the of the matters. Uh, but of course, uh, when it comes to uh, norms and the application of uh, universal norms in um, in uh, um, in the in the realm of cyberspace. Uh, that plays a role in the Chinese narrative. Because, for example, whenever China is uh, accused of uh, uh, not respecting human rights or whatever other piece of international law, uh, the uh, kind of uh, standard retaliation uh, is generally, well, look at the US, look at uh, uh, what you are doing inside your country. Uh, you're accusing us of espionage, but then uh, if you who did the uh, who had the NSA scandal, the Prism scandal first, you're accusing Huawei of building backdoors um, to uh, the Beijing government, but then the Prism scandal happened eight years ago in the U.S. Uh, so it, rather than a version um, of um, the attribution discourse uh, from China's part, uh, what I tend to see is the use of uh, uh, um, previously acknowledged um, um, uh, crimes, uh, whatever we want to define it, committed by uh, the US as a uh, tool to hamper any type of accusation that uh, gets leveled uh, against China. This is one thing that is uh, uh, particularly uh, visible and that, of course, um, plays into the uh, sovereign test uh, rhetoric that China tends to um, show in its uh, foreign policy, not only uh, when it comes to cyberspace, but more in general, the whole idea that you can't complain uh, about domestic matters of other countries, one on which uh, China uh, stresses uh, um, it's one that China stresses a lot. So uh, if we look, for example, at the uh, principles enshrined in the uh, UN Charter, you have human rights, but you've also got sovereignty. And of course, in the kind of uh, uh, discourse that you get out uh, from China when it comes to foreign policy, uh, the latter sovereignty is much more stressed. And the uh, whole rhetoric on um, uh, the Snowden case and the other cyber crimes um, broadly defined, uh, committed by the U.S. are uh, the kind of uh, rhetorical weapon to counteract any uh, type of accusation and go, you're not in the position of accusing me. Look at yourself. Look at what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, there again, I haven't quite studied uh, this type of aspect specifically, but I hope this kind of answer uh, helps. And then I go to Raluca's question, uh, how does uh, uh, SDS comes into my research? It's not uh, at the analytical level, not at the theoretical level, but just in the construction um, of my methods. And in particular, at the um, underlying idea that um, infrastructure is political, that uh, infrastructure can be a tool for politics, and therefore the uh, need to systematically involve um, technologists in, um, in the analysis, uh, especially in this, in my case, through interviews, but also through uh, the network and the network analysis of uh, exchange among uh, uh, technologists. And uh, this is not new in other disciplines that um, deal with internet governance, uh, but it is not uh, something that has um, yet been incorporated systematically in international relations literature. In international relations literature, uh, there's um, still a lot of um, that uh, idea that the discipline is self-contained and that you can look uh, at um, what at state's behavior or actor's behavior, uh, mainly at the state-centric and state-to-state -state level or systemic level. And so, yeah, SDS in my case is just a um, literature on which I based to build my method, that's it. Uh, back to you, Tatiana. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Ricardo. And June, I know that there were a lot of questions and comments to you, so please, you take the floor. <laughs> 
Thank you. I will uh, try to address each one quickly, but as comprehensively as possible. So for Monica's first point about kind of leaks being most common and being used by Israel, um, something interesting in the literature is that a lot of times these press leaks are, you, they can also almost be thought of as there's ambiguity between whether they are planted by the government, right, or actually leaked and unauthorized by government authorities. Um, there is one uh, scholar who called them pleaks in this sense, this like this ambiguous area, we don't know which it is. Um, and um, you know, to, the, to that degree, that that contributes to its power, right? Even um, when uh, it is planted by the government, there is this uncertainty. Perhaps it is a reflection of the government's true uh, finding, but it's not something it's willing to speak on publicly, and that contributes this perception of credibility. Um, a lot of times, uh, I found that those unofficial attributions were followed by some kind of official attribution or you know, sanction or indictment, um, but in the case that they are not, I think I tend to agree with you that uh, they interfere with the norms process. And I know there's a paper recently uh, published very recently by the Hague program on the three tales of attribution, and I'll refer to that there where they kind of refer to the signal of impotence, right? If you uh, like name and shame, but it's not followed by any kind of action, um, that you know could almost signal impotence on the part of the U.S. of you know, we're not following up on this perceived uh, threat that we consider this action to be wrong. Uh, on the multiple questions on the private sector and non-state attribution, uh, yes, I did look into that. That was one of my uh, main uh, independent variables just because the U.S. has such a rich um, private sector presence here, both in cybersecurity firms like CrowdStrike, um, you know, and also internet companies, you know, like Facebook, Google, Microsoft. They've all been very active in uh, public attribution, specifically to nation states as well. Um, what's interesting is I found there wasn't any uh, consistent effect of uh, private sector involvement in this space on USG statements, right? So in some cases, going back to the very early like report on APT1 um, and that you know being released by the private sector, some of my um, government official interviewees noted that that really opened the way for the U.S. government to be able to speak publicly, right? Here's a private firm that released a 70-page report that publicly attributing this uh, extensive operation in China with all the evidence to support it. Clearly, public attribution is possible, and now we can speak about it, and we have more credibility. In some circumstances, um, Right, so private sector statements make U.S. government statements easier. It could also replace the need for U.S. government statements. At the same time, private sector statements, uh, when the government doesn't want to speak publicly, could uh, disrupt diplomacy. Right? Have, they don't have the insight into the broader geopolitical context. Why isn't the U.S. just speaking publicly? Um, in that sense, there's, I think, still uncertainty about what effect the private sector has. But I know we can't deny that they are a very active space. Uh, actor in this space. Uh, to Luis's question about um, who can do public attribution, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, a lot of times, uh, especially you know, with the unofficial statements, public attribution is a way for the U.S. to shape the media discourse around a cyber incident, and it really does leverage its um, you know, power over the media, the, the, the dominance of the English language, and I think lends to some inequality um, in that uh, kind of international conversation. Uh, to Reluca's point on the efficacy of public attribution cyber norm building, uh, I think the jury's still out on that, and also because the normative environment is so um, you know, uncertain and still being developed, uh, it's hard to tell, is there any hard evidence that uh, public attribution is contributing to norms? Uh, we have yet to see. Something I did note that was interesting is that over time, the U.S. has become more willing to speak out about incidents of espionage, right? So um, one of the, the in, people I interviewed who was in government uh, early in Obama, he mentioned that, you know, the criteria for whether or not we're going to publicly attribute is, does this look like espionage, right? So if it did, then we're not going to speak on it, right? Because we also also engage in that, but you know, increasingly we've been speaking out more and more on that, whether you know, solar winds or you know, like Microsoft Exchange, um, and perhaps we'll see some trend in norms in that sense as well. Uh, and to John's question on the maturation of the four channels, uh, I think um, what I've seen is that public attribution through each of these channels has become more and more frequent over time, right? So the U.S. has become more comfortable speaking publicly about it. There is increasing trust that public attribution is possible, perhaps not from China and Russia, but from the international community more and more so. Uh, and we've really capitalized on that, and perhaps the private sector may have contributed to this trend. Um, I think those were all my questions. Uh, thank you very much, June. And um, just because June's presentation and Oleg's presentation were back to back, I will give the floor to Oleg. And I already want to ask, we start later. Can we extend the panel for five minutes, or is everybody going to kill me? <laughs> Great. <laughs> because we still have a couple of answers. Right. So, Oleg, you're the next, and then we'll go to Misha. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So, first of all, to the question whether Russian, 
Russian approach is a reaction to the yes approach. Uh, I think uh, it, it very much contributed to, to how Russians see it. So definitely all, all Russian criticism of uh, American approach to, to attribution wouldn't be possible if the United States uh, haven't started doing it more actively. Um, I, I'm not... I'm not sure where, where it is going because there is no, unlike in the United States, there is virtually no public discussion about uh, attribution. So it's all our speculations. Um, but it would be interesting to see whether uh, this, will, this will become a new norm. So, for example, uh, with this report that I keep coming back to, the Rostericom uh, uh, third report, uh, it might become a more kind of... Uh, less of an aberration, but more of a norm that uh, Russian uh, government, with the help of this government-affiliated private sector, will um, pr publish uh, more detailed reports about uh, particular attacks. Uh, so the, about the credibility and the unevenness of reporting, I totally agree. So again, <laughs> again about this report, uh, the report came out in like May 12th, and then it was noticed by uh, foreign media in several days, uh, because thanks to, I think, thanks to some niche uh, industry publication, uh, and and it's it's Russia. So with Russia, everything is good because people are paying attention to what's happening in Russia. So with uh, uh, Venezuela, I think it's uh, like few few things get noticed, uh, and also there is a lot of skepticism if if uh, Venezuelan government issues some kind of uh, report. Uh, there is a tendency among particular kind of groups to to dismiss it, and because we we've seen we, we've heard previously statements that were kind of uh, uh, too too rash and uh, were not substantiated. Uh, also, interesting point uh, which was raised about private. Uh, it was not pointed to me, but about uh, private uh, private sector and industry attribution. So actually, we have like several Russian companies that are quite active in. Uh, in this business, and uh, they do uh, they do some sort of attribution. So so far, this had no impact on this official uh, line, and also it will be interesting to see. So right now we see that Ross Telecom is, is is becoming this kind of more active player. Maybe they will uh, help drive uh, other companies or the government to to uh, more seriously consider uh, private sector assessments. But another part of this. Is uh, is this so in the United States? If you if you are a private company and if you do some kind of uh, attribution of an attack uh, to Russia, you 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 there are zero kind of costs to you. Nothing will happen to you. You might lose your business in Russia, but uh, this is hardly uh, the the primary so, uh, source of income for most companies. So for for Russian and for other foreign companies. Uh, there might be more risks involved in, in participating in these kinds of uh, um, attribution politics. So it's also something uh, that should be considered as we move forward. So uh, whether this unevenness will even uh, exacerbate. Thank you very much, Oleg. And Misha, now over to you. Yeah, thanks again for, for really great questions. Um, start with questions uh, raised by Monica. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, interesting question. I mean, um, how do these narratives take a life of their own? Um, and you said th there might be a possibility <clears throat> this is a lack of knowledge about you know, the technological um, dimension. Um, maybe, I mean, maybe in the past there was uh, a time where governments underestimated the capacities of private actors. So I remember a case where, but it's a long time ago, where um, the US uh, accused, uh, I think, North Korea of being responsible for attack. And then there was, uh, I guess, the University of T Toronto, SecDef, coming up and saying, well, there's no clear evidence pointing to North Korea. So this might be an instance where there was an underestimation of private sector capacities and research institutes' capacities, and therefore there was, an, there was a non-anticipation of this sort of counter-narrative, so not really a, a narrative. Um, nowadays, I think, um, or maybe, I think it's more important to anticipate like political dynamics or, you know, value judgments or expectations of different audiences. To me, it's more a political um, dynamic, 
And <clears throat> sometimes it, doesn't also, it also doesn't help to anticipate. So sometimes you can anticipate, but you can still not control the narrative. I think the, the example of you know, the uh, communicated red lines um, by the Biden administration might be such a case. I mean, um, there, was this, you know, there was this promise of a, you know, a tougher US-Russia policy, then there was the cyber incident. So what alternative was there? There was no choice, right? Um, it was clear that everybody would expect now to have a, a strong reaction. And, and then th this whole dynamic unfolded. Um, so, yeah, good questions. Um, what are the, the, the mechanisms behind this? Um, then, then the question about ontological security. Um, yeah, that's, of course, this is a possibility. So this is, uh, I mean, this is points right uh, at this question of is this intended or not? Is it strategic or not? Uh, it's a real possibility. There could be, uh, there, there could, narratives could serve as um, a source of ontological security. I mean, full disclosure, I'm, 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 I use the concept myself to, to um, publish a paper on German-Israeli relationship. Um, and how this is affected by ontological security. But if ontological security would be the main driver, I guess then we, would see, we, we, we should see uh, no real difference between like, messages targeting domestic audiences and messages targeting international audience, right? Because it, was, it would be something intrinsically motivated, not something strategically compilated to, to influence somebody, some third party. Um, and if I might, one comment to, to Alex. Uh, yes, a very quick a one, very quick because one. I have a very, very last question for June from oh, online participant. Okay. So you can make your comment, then I ask the question, and then I will close. Okay, I keep it brief. Um, great paper, great presentation. I just want to mention, um, there might be one additional factor that might explain why Russia does this quasi attributions and not public attributions because I look at this from the perspective of narrative building and I think Russia doesn't need public attributions because there's so many other material out there, you know, like the Snowden leaks and NATO communiques and there's just a asymmetric transparency because you won't find the same level of transparency on the Russian case. So the US does need to produce its own material, so to speak, to build narratives, whereas Russia can use the material which is open um, and uh, released by NATO and other Western countries. But this might just be an additional factor. It's not the main, main driver, I think. I absolutely love how this discussion is going, like <coughs> quasi-attribution. Yes, but Russia doesn't <laughs> need attribution. I think that you are talking to each other pretty well in your narratives here. So just because I want to honor the online format of this conference, we have a very last question to June from uh, Takashi Seto from National Institute for Defense Studies Japan. So I, I, I think it's evening in Japan. Good evening, uh, Takashi. So the question is, and I'm trying to curate it a bit, does the choice of channel for attribution correlate in any way with the subject, subject of the attribution? For example, in attributing intelligence gathering operation, the US might choose a channel so as not to constrain uh, its own operational freedom. So did you observe any correlation there? That's very interesting, and I think one of the methodological challenges of being in cyber that you know we can't observe what thinking is going on in government you know what the coordination looks like um, my sense from the interviews is that this assessment often takes place uh, each agency on its own, right? So within the NSC, there's an interagency process. There will be some communication, you know, is public attribution in our interest or not? But at the end of the day, um, you know, if an indictment is going to come out with the public attribution, that is a decision the DOJ makes, right? If uh, there's going to be a technical alert, um, you know, that might be a little bit more coordinated with government, but you know, whether or not technical alert com comes out or not, that's a DHS decision. Um, so I think, whether or not the U.S. takes a, you know, up, up to now, you know, maybe change on a Biden administration, but whether or not, and uh, up to now, it's taken a step back and thought, you know, the unofficial channel is the best one out of all of our options. I think it's hard for me to say that. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And I am supposed not only to close this panel and give the big applause to our panelists online and on site. 
But I'm also fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Um, great narratives and great analysis of narratives. Um, I also, I'm also supposed to close this day of the conference, at least here. So thanks to everybody who is joining us online. We cannot see you, but we are cheering at you. Uh, thanks to everybody who came here on site. Uh, thanks to Monica, who helped me to curate the online questions. Thanks to the Hague Cyber Norms team, team uh, program team who are working tirelessly on this conference. Great efforts and we really appreciate. And I also want to give a bit of applause to technical team for running all these smooth things. <laughs> And, and making our microphones and our video streams and our screens working. Uh, with this, I would like to close, unless any, any of my colleagues want to say goodbye from here. Um, if not, uh, we will see you at, at dinner. To, uh, yes. <coughs> dinner at 7. <laughs> dinner at 7 at Milou. Um, uh, the ambassador at large uh, for cyber will be there at uh, 7.30, so it would be nice to, uh, to talk to her. Um, so uh, be there. And Thank you very much, Dennis. So here it is from day one to great evening and day two and day three. Thank you. <laughs>